little bit. Video. Are you introducing the president or anything? Uh, we can. You can. I welcome you to the Mississippi Band Book Festival. Let us not repeat our tragic history. Thank you for joining us, first of all. I'm glad that it's not a rainy day, uh, but I am Rena Evers Everett. I'm actually her daughter, <laughs> Merle and Medgar Evers' daughter, uh, and the executive director of the Mississippi Book, I'm sorry, Mississippi, the Miss, uh, Medgar Merle Evers yes, uh, Fest. See, I am so tired, I am so sorry. I am with the Medgar Merle Evers Institute. Welcome. Jerry? Yeah, and I'm Jerry Mitchell. I'm uh, author of Race Against Time and uh, the founder of the Mississippi Center for Investigative Reporting, which is now also with Mississippi Today. So great to be with you. And, uh, and I think it's only appropriate when we get started to kind of thank our sponsors. I think we've got a slide on this. I, I won't necessarily, I guess I will read them. There they are. Okay, great. And, uh, and then the, uh, Basically, uh, Millsaps College, we want to thank Millsaps College for hosting this. It's just, uh, and thank you, President Peregrine. We appreciate, thank you. We appreciate you. <laughs> Are you sure we can't bribe you into staying or something, you know? Anyway, but uh, thank you so much for your support. And uh, of course, the Megra Murley Evers Institute, uh, Mississippi Center for Investigative Reporting. Um, Mississippi ACLU, the Mississippi Humanities Council, visitjackson.com, and uh, Bill Sapp's Truth, Racial Healing, and Transformation Campus Center. So anyway, we want to thank all our sponsors for that. Um, if you didn't get, right up front here, there is a schedule, if you did not, you had to show them. Uh, if you did not get one of these, uh, you need to grab one. And on the back side, it actually has a survey, which is going to help us do a, a better job next time. And that's, that's why we wanted it. It's uh, something actually some of our sponsors desire as well. But just to have some feedback from you on how, how the, events, how the fan, event is. Um, also, I know some of you, if you didn't, have this yet. I know some of you may come in the back way instead of the front way. We have tickets. If you didn't get a ticket, um, let us know and we will get you a ticket. Uh, and the reason for the ticket is we are actually going to give door prizes away. So it's pretty exciting. So you want to have a ticket. Otherwise you miss out. So anyway, uh, but it's at the front, the front that we have these tickets. But uh, let us know if you don't have one, and we will have someone come around and uh, give, give you the ticket. Um, and uh, I think that's, I think I said, any other housekeeping matters we need to mention or whatever? Anybody else have any other housekeeping matters we need to mention? But I've got to tell you, I know of no better way to kick off uh, this festival than to start with uh, Marshall Ramsey. Uh, with Mississippi Today. Let's give Marshall a hand. Absolutely. Yeah. And please, please do the next slide. The next slide. Next slide. Those of you who have missed it, this is his cartoon. And if you have not seen it, it's a terrific cartoon, which is right in keeping with the festival here. And uh, of course, Marshall, who's a star in, in and of himself, is going to interview uh, Rick Bragg. Yeah. Uh, and uh, We'll let you take it away from there, Marshall. Thank you, Jerry. I appreciate it. You know, I feel like I'm literally just following an opening act that was like the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. So anyway, thank you. Uh, no pressure there. And now I get to uh, interview Rick Brack. Oh, boy. Um, I'm nervous now. I tell you what, um, thank you. And it's nothing more terrifying than seeing your artwork blown up that large. And then you realize, I really should have put a little bit more effort into it. But at least I got the tiny wheels right. 
Um, I've had the, the, the blessing and the pleasure of being an editorial cartoonist in Mississippi now for almost 27 years. Um, this place is the Hotel California. I thought I'd be here for two. Uh, you can check out anytime you like, but obviously I'm still here. Uh, but it's been a blessing. People always ask me, where do you get your ideas from? And I have a crack team of comedy writers that work down at the state capitol that give me lots and lots of good information and, and, and jokes. I don't really have to work. It's, it's really pretty easy. A few years ago, and I think it was during the Fordyce administration, which um, was right about the time of Herbert Hoover being president, I think. Uh, the kids, whenever you show a Fordyce cartoon, they look at you like, uh, who's, who's that? And I was like, well, no, I think, never mind. Anyway, he put up a sign that said, only positive Mississippi spoken here. Now, that, I always, every time I'd pass that sign, I'd think, I'm going to get that in a cartoon one day. I'm going to get that in a cartoon one day. And then he threatened to whip Burt Case's rear end on television, and so I had him replacing that with, I'll whip your ass. So that was the, the, the cartoon, and I thought, well, this is great. But the thing about only positive Mississippi here, and I'm all about praising Mississippi. I, I love this state. I'm here because of choice, not because I have to be. Um, but the problem about only positive Mississippi here and that, that slogan was it didn't tell the whole story. And today's panel is about erasing stories and why, uh, and I couldn't think of a better person to kind of set up the whole day than Rick Bragg because Rick Bragg tells stories and he tells stories in a beautiful and very vivid way. You know, I, I never really learned how to write in school and if you ever read my writing, you can kind of tell. But I've learned an awful lot by reading Rick's writing and, and how to paint pictures with words, and I think he does a beautiful job. So I think having Rick Bragg with us today is a perfect way to kick off the panel. And if you don't know Rick, um, he is, of course, the author of 12 books, including the best-selling Avis Man and All Over But the Shoutin', which is my personal favorite. He writes a monthly column for Southern Living, teaches writing at the University of Alabama. I think they used to play football, I'm not sure. And also a regular cont contributor to Garden and Gun magazine. He lives in Alabama. He's here with us today via the magic of Zoom. Rick, hey, it's good to talk to you this morning, man. Thank you for being with us. Hey, it's my pleasure, my pleasure. See, you're, you're pretty lucky. You can just kind of roll out of bed. You know, you, you just kind of good, you know. You didn't have to get too fancy. But um, thank you for being with us. No, I look like this all the time. <laughs> Rick, I tell you, I, I sent you a big long list of que questions, and then I promptly tore them up. So I'm um, really looking forward to this conversation a little bit. And I just, you know, I was thinking about all over but the shouting, and, and that was, of course, your very, very personal memoir, but it wasn't just your life, it was your mom's life, it was your family's life, and it was a story that I think so many people attach their own lives to, and it helped them process and get through their trauma. And when I was thinking about the overall arc of today, I was thinking how important stories like that are so that people can relate and can relate their own story and can work through it. And so you're really honestly a perfect person to be talking to us today. Well, y'all are way, way too nice to. Um, oh, I'm, 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 I'm done with it now. No more niceness, I promise. <laughs> well, it, it boils down to this, I guess. Uh, I'm honored to, to do it, even though I don't have any professional moral or ethical currency to, to buy into this discussion. The one thing, uh, as a reader, has always just made my heart just freeze up, and that was when a, a book I had read as a child winds up on a chopping block somewhere, um, and uh, you know that book you know helped shape my life. Kill a Mockingbird, or um, Huckleberry Finn, and. Uh, so as a reader, uh, it's a pleasure, really a pleasure to be here. Plus, I think if Jerry Mitchell invited me to a, to a hog killing or a, or a bug stomping or, or, or anything else, uh, I am such a big fan of, of his courage and his talent. Uh, uh, he's not around, so we can say this in the community. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, if I thought he were in the room, I would say something else. But 
But no, it's a pleasure to be called with you. Thank you, Rick. I appreciate it. You know, kind of looking, talk about your growing up time, and you you mentioned the books mm -hmm. that you were favorite, like To Kill a Mockingbird. What were some other books that you that you remember reading as a child? You know, obviously, when you grew up, you probably weren't surrounded by a ton of books, but when did you really start experiencing reading, and what books helped shape you into who you are? Well, I'm, I'm 63, and, and of course, feel like I'm 103, but but when I was a child, the only the only books I remember in the house were uh, the New Testament and the Spring Seed Catalog. And I'm not the first person to say that among you know rural Southerners. I've heard that from other people. And you know, getting a library card was, you know, the most important thing uh, that I guess that ever happened to me. And uh, you know, I'd beg a ride into Jacksonville and, and I, I was selfish. Uh, I read books that took me places. Uh, probably the, the first book I ever read that, that, um, opened up the world to me was a, a dog book, you know, a Savage Sound. Old Yeller was, was awfully depressing, but Savage Sound was this epic adventure. And um, uh, it was bloody and gritty and powerful, and it was supposed to be a young adult book, I think, but it was, it was, it was awfully bloody. Um, but it hooked me as a reader forever. Now, I've often wondered what would have happened if, if, a, if a governing body of some kind had said, no, we just can't have that book in our library because it's just, you know, it, it's too harsh. Um, uh, but, but, but I remember um, the, the You Were There books you know, you were there on the Biscayne, on the Bismarck. You were there at the Alamo. Um, I read every Hardy Boys book ever made. Um, and I remember, I remember a, a series of books called The Boxcar Children uh, about a series of kids, you know, in the Deep South running around, uh, I think they were orphans running around, getting in trouble, having adventures. And, uh, and that led me to the books that, uh, that fit so beautifully into the subject matter of today. And, you know, I was a, a teenager. At, at, I can't remember if I was at Roy Webb Junior High School. Um, or had made it all the way to high school at Jacksonville when I when I read *To Kill a Mockingbird*, and I remember it holding it in my hands, and it it, it looked like it had lain in the back window of a of a you know '57 Pontiac. It was so uh, bleached out and faded and crinkled and dog-eared. The cover was almost not there at all. And it had been marked a hundred times, obviously, by students who were required to remember something. But I never forgot a line of it because it was a sermon. You know, uh, if someone had said, read this morality play, well, I never would have done it. But it was a great story. And in that story was a sermon. And... Uh, you know, so we didn't really have books in our house, but over time we did. Over time we did. You know, I learned about Asia by reading uh, James Clavell. I learned about the American West by reading, at first when I was a kid, you know, Zane Gray. Um, and and then uh, I you know I found Larry McMurtry. And Lonesome Dove, and uh, 
and um, those books transported me from a place hemmed in by cotton fields and pulpwood roads to a wider world and uh, man it was precious precious to have that might be the most serious thing i've ever said at 9 20 in the morning <laughs> nothing good you know. as we said nothing nothing good happens in the morning you know uh, uh, i mean if you get a phone call early in the morning it's bad news you know nothing good happens before lunchtime so it is a testament of how much i hold jerry mitchell in in regard that i would actually wake up and see the morning uh so uh, anyway moving right along well, rick the problem is jerry's actually in the room and we're gonna have to like take the door off to get him get his head out of the room now after it's kind of puffed up a little bit over there but well you know it, it's uh when, when one of the first things that jerry ever said to me he said you know you know my, my real name is boo you know, and that is uh, true. so uh, since then, he has not been Jerry Mitchell, uh, you know, highly regarded author and courageous reporter and, and all that. Since then, he has been every time it's that redheaded Boo Mitchell. Who are you talking to? It's that redheaded Boo Mitchell. So anyway, yeah, you should be able to puncture that a little bit later on. In some circles all over, but the shouting has been banned, and that blows my, my mind. I, I'm trying to think <laughs> what part of the book would even be something where somebody would not. I mean, there's obviously a lot of lessons in there that are hard, but as an author, how does that make you feel when you hear that something that you created, something that's personal, something that's from your heart, is being banned by somebody who may either disagree with or just a small part of it? I mean, it doesn't even have to be the whole book, just a small part of it. As, I mean, how does that make you feel when you when you find out news like that? Well, this follows under the heading of uh, this follows uh, saying that all over about the shouting was was banned. It, was, it is you have to go back a long way, and it was just I can't even remember the circumstance. Yeah, but I remember I remember hearing it and thinking to myself. Uh, what did I say in that? You know that <laughs> you know it, it was it was a love story to my mom, yeah, who really did raise us by herself. You know who really did. You know clean other people's houses and cook other people's meals and raise other people's babies. Uh, and. <clears throat> and gave me a, a chance to kind of climb up her backbone to a better life. Well, what's a better story than that? You know, what's a more loving, courageous, powerful story than that? And, uh, but, but you can pretty much make everybody mad. Uh, and and uh, uh, usually when I... Uh, and met with disapproval it is because i have have um, pricked someone's um, sense of importance mm. I, I i'll never forget doing a talk and i think and I, I might be wrong about this but i think it was in mobile and um and uh, someone asked me they asked me that that question i think we were going to talk a little bit about it uh, you know, what is it about the South that that provides such fodder for great writing? And and someone asked me that in the crowd, and I said, well, you know, part of it is just the fact of the pathos we live in. The, the, um, and that's a $40 word for this early in the day on a Saturday, but, you know, the pathos, the violence, the pain and the suffering and the grief and um the killing and the dying and i said you know uh, southerners have have fought in 
and I'm talking more about white Southerners, have fought into great losing causes. You know, I call it uh, their doomed ideal. And, uh, you know, there was, there was the Civil War, obviously, which everybody goes back to the Civil War. Civil War is blamed for everything. But the, there was the Civil War, and then there was the Civil Rights Movement, another doomed ideal that so many Southerners held to. And, and, a, and a, a gentleman, an older gentleman, got up and walked out. Just, you know, kind of, not he didn't stomp out or storm out. He just turned his back and walked out. And when it was over with, I, I told the organizers of the event, I'm so sorry that bringing up the Civil Rights Movement after all these years uh, would cause someone uh, such discomfort. And they said, oh, no, that wasn't it. He's still mad about the war. And uh, uh, so um, you never know what you're going to say that's going to make someone uh, uncomfortable or unhappy. And it's strange because, again, I'm not exactly the kind of guy that when people fall in to hear him talk, they say, oh, I hope he doesn't touch off some controversy. You know, uh, no one has ever slapped me out of my chair because I wrote a, a really incendiary story about banana pudding. <laughs> you, <laughs> you did one uh, at one time about the chicken, though, in St. Petersburg, about the chicken uh, looking death in the face, but it was it had whiskers and it being a cat. That's still one of my yeah. favorite stories. Uh, about a story that you wrote that uh, was basically to tick off your editors and then they ended up running it anyway. It, it made my career. Yeah. I, <laughs> I, uh, my, my whole writing career goes back to a, to a chicken that had been attacked by a, uh, a bobcat in Dunedin, Florida. And, uh, and uh, I had, I had had a, a bad run of luck. I was broke. Uh, I hadn't even got my first paycheck at the St. Pete Times. I was living on, and maybe some of the folks in this room uh, can can uh, relate to this. I was living out of the change in the bottom of a giant pickle jar. And uh, I uh, was living on uh, white bread, mayonnaise, and banana sandwiches, and water. And... Uh, I did not manage my finances well when I was in my twenties, <laughs> and uh, and then when I got down to Florida, you know, I'd been a kind of a big shot in Alabama. You know, uh, got to write important stories about um, the child welfare system, uh, which I wrote with a great reporter named Mike Oliver and. Got to write about the death of Alabama's coal mines, you know, going down a mile underground to, to see these people try to gouge out a, a precious living from that vanishing way of life. And, and I, I was a serious guy. And then I get down to Florida and they don't know that I'm a serious guy. And I'm writing terrible things, boring things. And then they sent me to write about a chicken mauling in a retirement community and uh i can still see the editor's face when he came running up to the desk he was all excited he was almost levitating and he said rick there's there's been a bobcat sighting in dunedin and i said well you know i'm sure this has something to do with me but i'm not real sure what that is and uh he said yeah there's you don't understand the, 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 the bobcats are sneaking in from the Florida scrub and attacking the chickens of the retirees. And this time there has been a survivor. <laughs> and uh, they sent me to interview that chicken. <laughs> uh, so I pulled up in the yard and, and the uh, city ordinance allowed the retirees to have so many chickens. You could have like two chickens. And uh, 
And I, I you know, pulled up in the yard and I looked, and sure enough, there's this chicken doing figure eights, running figure eights in the yard out of its mind, obviously, from the trauma. Uh, and the, the, the chicken's uh, parents wanted me to, you know, wanted me to, to, to see up close the horrible damage that the, that the bobcat had inflicted. And, uh, but the chicken wouldn't stand still. So they're chasing the chicken. Again, this is all happening in figure eights. For some reason, that was the only uh, route the chicken could run, was figure eights. And, and, and so they are chasing the chicken, and I am chasing them with my notebook out. But to the cars passing on the highway, it looked like I was trying to interview the chicken. And, and you know, I'd hear a horn blowing, and, and I'd look over, and there'd be people laughing at me. So... Finally, they catch the chicken, and I interview them, and and sure enough, that I mean, it was an awful thing. The, the 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 bobcat had got close enough to rake all the feathers off the chickens behind, but it had not done any other damage. So, I drove back to the newsroom. Just yeah, I'm a serious guy. I'm a serious journalism. Uh, I'm, I'm a serious journalist. I can't pronounce journalist, but I'm a serious journalist. And I, I didn't want to do that. You know, I, I had written about civil rights. I had written about uh, poverty. And I just gave up. And as I sat there at my desk, I thought, you know, I can go out two ways. I was going to clean my desk off and go home. And I can go out two ways. I can either, you know, do my job and write a, you know, a good, straight, solid story about a, a button all chicken, or I could write the most purple, florid, gothic, Flannery O'Connor-esque story about a button all chicken that had ever been done in history. And I did, I turned it in and fully intended the next day to eat my banana sandwich, clean off my desk and go home. And uh, got in the next day and there was a stack of messages on my desk, you know, four inches high. Love that chicken story. You made me feel that chicken's pain. <laughs> the editor, and this is a serious newspaper. This is one of the best newspapers on earth. Drove an hour in grinding Florida traffic to shake my hand. And I got a raise not long after that. <laughs> And I got a promotion, you know, and it was all in the writing. The, the, you know, I asked myself as I sat down to write, I thought, you know, wh what was the last thing that chicken saw before it was so horribly attacked? And, you know, I could just see it turning its head as it ran, you know, high stepping is it turned and he saw that that visage that 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 snarling countenance of that of that bobcat you know you know, you know teeth you know fangs you know, what you know, what's the last thing it saw so the lead was oh by the way the chicken's name was mopsy um mopsy has looked into the face of death comma, and it is whiskered, period. <laughs> and, and my career just took off. <laughs> took off like a rocket. Rick, if I were giving out Pulitzers, I'd have given you one for that. <laughs> that was fantastic. Yeah. You, you, you said know, something. What's that? I didn't win a thing for that. Didn't, you know, <laughs> I, I, uh, 
uh, years later, a good friend of mine down there uh, wrote her own uh, uh, chicken opus. Uh, and, and, and it sparked a great debate among serious journalists as to whose chicken story was actually better. You know, and uh, it rages on. That would be a chicken or an egg kind of question there, I suppose. You know, you, you said something all in the writing. And, and and I've heard you say this in past interviews. Um, you know, when you write, number one, you're an amazing writer. But also, two, you tell stories of people that need their to stories told. And you tell them in, in very vivid and, and sometimes graphic ways. I mean, the Oklahoma City bombing, um, you know, what went on in Haiti. I'm just thinking about some of the past stories that you've written very definitely. And, and that's really kind of the point of writing books and telling stories is, you know, and like I mentioned earlier about Positive Mississippi Spoken Here, which is a great thing. I like, you know, it's good to talk about the good things, but it's also very important to tell stories for people who don't get their stories told as well. Well, I was really fortunate that um, that I came of of age as 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 a writer in newsrooms. You know, in newsrooms, um, writing about things that 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 truly mattered. You know. Uh, I remember doing a story so long ago about uh, being old, growing old in the country, you know, way out in the country where social services were were strained at best, and 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 forty years ago wasn't like it is now. A lot of older people just fell through the cracks, and um, I remember being so proud of. Not so much the story, but the photo of an old woman in obviously in obvious poverty, you know, sitting on a on a on a porch. It's kind of lost, and um, and I always thought that was the most important thing I could do: cruelty, uh, backward behavior. I wrote about the, the killing of an older gentleman in Texas who was dragged to death behind a pickup truck. Um, so, you know, if, if you write about the, and I hate to, again, I hate to use words like human condition. If you write about people living with grit and power, and sympathy, you know, um, then you're gonna make some people, and I say it out loud, it always amazes me that they'd say it out loud, or even vote on it. No, we don't want those stories, we don't want those books, we don't want those, um, that's not positive. And, 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 it just flew in the face of everything that I've ever, ever um, been taught to believe. Um, I uh, sometimes you write about the downtrodden, uh, and uh, and it becomes a, a sweeping issue. But sometimes the issues are smaller. I remember going up, I think it was to North Carolina, to write about a, a, a local government that had banned couches on the front porch. They, they, they were embarrassed and ashamed, you know, uh, by their citizens having a couch on their front porch. Well, every Southerner knows, Southerners of all stripes, every Southerner knows that couches have two lives. You know, they have a first life in the house, you know. Uh, and then when they, they pass on from that life, they are reincarnated uh, on the front porch. So they have two lives. And um, 
one of the things I'm most proud of is I used my powers of observation and my writing talent to shame that local government for <laughs> banishing the, 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 the ratty, uh, frayed, uh, spring sticking out front porches. Uh, they didn't change the law, but at least we held them up to a certain amount of embarrassment. We live no, in a time. I, I, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I I think that point was sufficiently made there. I, think. <laughs> I feel better about my couch on my front porch now. Thank you, Rick. I appreciate. It. You know, we live in a time right now, and I don't think anybody that isn't on social media or doesn't watch too much news or listen too much radio or whatever knows people are angry. They're they're afraid. There's just been, a, and obviously we're coming out of a pandemic. There was a lot of change during that. But people just honestly are, um, well, like I said, I can look at my Twitter feed right now, and it's pretty angry. Sometimes that obviously um, causes some issues uh, for authors and for storytellers and so forth. What advice would you give to an author or a writer uh, when they might, because for me, the worst censor in the world isn't my editor, it's me. You know, it's me yeah. thinking through things, wait, I might not need to do that, or this may cause a problem. I'm seeing things three times, three steps ahead. What advice would you give to a writer right now during this time to have the courage to be able to tell their stories openly and honestly? Well, and this is horrifying to think about, but, but you know, uh, writers um, are assaulted from many directions. You know, it, it's not just uh, the people who might want to, to turn back time. You know, the people who really want to turn back time, who want a 1950s mentality toward class and race. And a lot of people, uh, when you say that, I know are sitting in their chairs thinking, well, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with turning back time? made sense before life made sense before well obviously you, you can't but then the writer is assaulted by i don't want to say the other direction but by those who do not want to meet be made uncomfortable by uh, writing realistically about class and race and uh you know, they just don't, they want a nice, neat, absolutely, uh, not sterile, but uh, they want a, a comfortable and happy uh, storytelling. So, and, 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 I, and I would be lying if I didn't say that those things come up. They come up when you talk about a book idea. And I, I have the best publishing house on earth. I've had the same literary agent for uh, three decades. Um, uh, and they have shown uh, uh, courage and thoughtfulness. But never has, has the world been so the writing world had so many minefields, again, from all directions. So, and this may be easier to say when you're 63, uh, because you, you get to a point in your writing life when you're 63 you, where you really do say, well, the hell with it, you know? So if they don't like it, maybe they will balance that dislike and distrust and dismay by um, a track record of good books that came before or magazine pieces or you know of course that doesn't happen people get mad like a tick on a hot rock you know they you know their anger just sends them running off in a direction as fast as they can but it's 63. I'm not really going to write anything I don't want to write. I write an awful lot of soft stuff. 
I write about why Southerners led the charge in recycling by, by burning old car tires on the creek bank to run off mosquitoes. You know, they, they repurposing, I guess it's called. You know, we made planners for Rose of Sharon out of old unirolls. Uh, I write about why putting your 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 box freezer on your front porch is not a sign of either wealth or poverty. It's just a sign that you ran out of room in your Jim Walter home. And um, but when an issue comes up that requires tea, the the BP oil spill. You know, when BP drilled a well too deep for the technology to allow. And you know, too, too deep, too complicated, and almost turned the Gulf of Mexico into a poison lake. Uh, when a man drove his car into a crowd of protesters in Charlottesville, you know, Southern Living ran a story. Southern Living, which writes about food and architecture and, and gardens and, and just lifestyle. Uh, let me write a story about the wrongness of that. So, um, um, of course, those are obvious things that we need to address, that we need to write about. But um, I would say to, to a younger writer, uh, grow a really, really thick skin as fast as you can. Pick your battles. And that sounds like a not very courageous thing to do, but pick your battles. Because shouting about the world around us in a closet, shouting in a closet, sh going out in the backyard and shouting to the pines does no good. You, need, you do need to survive as a writer. But pick your battles and you know, gain a platform. And and be patient because that platform may take a while to build. And um, and I've noticed something about young people. They, they tend not to have the most patience. And they should. Young people should be very patient. Old people should be impatient. Old people should be walking around mad. As my mama used to say, with their mouth stuck out. You know, old people, we have earned the right to be impatient and angry. And, 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 and when people ask me how I'm doing, you know, wonderful, gentle Southern people say, how are you doing? And I reply, I'm old and I'm tired and I'm grouchy. And it has become a mantra. So I'm just going to get me a shirt, you know, or a hat, you know, that says I'm old, I'm tired and I'm grouchy. And, um, but hopefully I will never be tired of, of telling a good story, even if it does hurt someone's feelings a little bit. Yeah, it's, it's, it's weird, Rick. I mean, I've been a cartoonist here for a quarter of a century, drawing 8,000 cartoons. I'll think a cartoon's going to make everybody mad under the planet. Crickets. But then I do something yeah. that, that's, that's, you know, pretty tame in my mind and then I get besieged you know it's just so it's like I quit a long time ago trying to figure out what makes people mad and I just try to make my you know just get the cartoon done and get done and have fun well with it. it's funny that you would say that because yeah it, it um, the things that people will stick to of course nowadays all you have to do is 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 mention Trump and and you know that is true one you know, you're either going to be fawned upon or hit in the head with a tire iron. You know, one of those things is going to happen. Um, and I, I never thought I would see uh, 
I never thought I would see our country um, so happy to see their democracy threatened. You know, uh, the January 6th incident. I never thought I would see men and women of, you know, great um, legal experience ignore uh, conscience. And I never thought I'd see that. So yeah, but, 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 but when I did my books on a much lighter note, uh, uh, I was so afraid that writing about uh, my daddy's um, um, cruelties uh, and my mother stepped between us and those cruelties. She absorbed them. You know, I thought that that would make people uncomfortable or uneasy. You know. And instead, the only thing that my mother was disappointed in in my book was I mentioned that she uh, would not wear her dentures. <laughs> and that she had gone to get her dentures at the Denture Emporium in Pell City, Alabama, where dentures were you know, a, a fraction of the cost of anywhere else. And unfortunately, on the ride home from Pell City, uh, the dentures, she discovered that the dentures did not fit well. And this is no indictment on the, I'm sure, fine denture making qualities of Pell City, Alabama. But, uh, but she spit them out in the weeds. Had my Aunt Edna pull over to the side of the road and spit them out in the weeds. And she's refused to wear dentures ever since then. And it has been 40 years, <laughs> 45 years. And, um, I mentioned that in the book, and she has never forgiven me. <laughs> hey, Rick, I, I think that the audience um, can probably ask you some better questions than I have, so I'd really like to invite you all to be able to come up, and you can use this microphone. I will pull it out so that you don't have to get close to me. Oh, there are – what's that? Oh, there's hanging down mics. That's even better. Thank you. Um, great. So if you would like to ask Rick a question, uh, you're, feel free to jump up and ask a question. Right, you come on. <laughs> and if you did, it'd be cool. Oh, yes. What is, uh, Rick, what is the book that you are the, the most proud of? Oh, I'm sure the English one is Rick. <laughs> well, well, no, no. Uh, you know, it's funny. It, it, it's kind of like, you know, I've heard this before. It's like asking someone who is their favorite child. You know, uh, but to me, uh, the first book, a book that allowed me to honor my mother. Um, and also, you know, uh, there are millions of books written about honoring your mother. But the story often does not have the grit, does not have the cruelty to power it. And I hate, I hate that, that our lives had that cruelty. I would have traded that book and everything that came from it in my writing life if my mother had had an easy life. If she had had a, you know, a three bedroom brick rancher. You know, I'd have traded everything for that. Um, so what I did in that story was just try to just try to, to to show what she gave up to to take care of us. And uh, other books were um, easier on the the heart. Uh, and then I, you know, uh, I did a book called Avis Man, which, where I basically built me a grandfather, you know, uh, a man who 
you know, fought bloody battles with rival whiskey makers and and moved his family, I think, 20 times in the Great Depression because, you know, they'd wait till the rent was due and then they'd load up the truck and flee. Um, um, but the book about my mom and then later the book about my father, a book called The Prince of Frogtown, where I tried to give him his say, where I tried out of guilt to give him his say for why he did the things he did and why he was who he was. And also to find people to say something good about it. Um, those two, I think, are the most important. But Ava's man was more fun. Ava's man was, 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 was more fun. The Jerry Lee Lewis book was the greatest challenge because uh, you know, Jerry Lee people told me, they said, well, you know, he's got a 357 pistol under his pillow. And, uh, you know, look, I've had, you know, guns pointed in my general direction before, you know, that didn't petrify me. But Jerry Lee, one of the first things he did was he showed it to me, you know, took it out from under the pillow and pointed it in my general direction. And it wobbled a lot because, you know, he was in his eighties and, and, uh, I remember thinking as I walked out that day that, you know, if he had if he had shot me, he wouldn't have meant to. And then I thought as I turned the key, would that have made me any less dead? Uh, and I wondered if that was the same 357 that he used to shoot his bass player. So um, yeah, that 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 book had its challenges, and. Um, you know the, the the death of a book on 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 Southern people is to be dull, you know, and 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 and, and God or fate or chance put me in a life where dull never did figure into it. So um, you know that took me a long time to answer. I'm sorry, but. But uh, yeah, that's 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 that can't be answered too quick. Yes. Hey, uh, I was wondering. You mentioned uh, like three very specific things: the uh, couch protest, uh, the icebox being outside, uh, and, and, and this showing of that gun. And I, I just think about your your timeline. You said you've been writing like over thirty years, right? Um, what has been the most fun and intriguing thing about navigating the Southern consciousness and what has been the most difficult? Now that's now a that's very good question. That, that, that's a very good, we could have a whole, we could have spent our morning just on that, I think. But uh, um, the most intriguing thing about writing about Southern is uh, you can never assume that reason is going to figure into it. <laughs> you know, I, uh, you know, I love my people. My, my people are uh, often uh, on the wrong side of things. But I worked with, you know, I've been writing since I was uh, 17. I'm 63. Um, my people were pulpwooders and coal miners and farmers and cotton mill workers. And, uh, you know, they hung mill owners in effigy. Uh, they knocked other men off the East Gadsden Bridge into the Coosa River and strikes and uh, disagreements and they fought for fun you know they, they they fought for fun they my grandfather and this is the least politically thing politically correct thing that would be said today my grandfather uh got into an argument with a rivaling family of whiskey makers um that was poor grammar too come to think of it but a rival family 
and uh, and they tried to to kill him in the yard in the dead of night with a hog killing knife. And he used a Belgian shotgun to club one man in the head and turned and fired in a reflexive action into the other assailant who was trying to cut him and shot a big woman through both bosoms with a 12-gauge shotgun. And I asked my Aunt Juanita, I said, my God, Aunt Nader, did it, did it kill her? And my Aunt Juanita took both hands and circled them above her head and said, oh, Lord, no, hon, they were this big. And uh, uh, I'm sure a good censor, if they'd been really looking out for me, would have taken that out. Uh, but uh, you just never know what Southerners are going to react hotly to. And um, I went to a, uh, to do a reading in my hometown where you would think I would be met with universal love. And, uh, and on my way there, I get a call from my cousin, Carly Slack. And you can't make that name up. It is the most Southern of Southern names. And it was actually Carlos. Uh, and he was named for uh, a label on a crate of Mexican apples that his daddy saw in uh, 1934. And, um, and Carlos said, Rick, you can't come do your book reading tonight. And they sold something like 700 tickets. You can't do your book reading. Uh, your cousin, and I won't use his name because there's probably a statute of limitation. Your cousin has said, if you show up in town, he's going to cut you. And uh, I thought, I wonder if a, if a writer has ever... You know, a writer in, in, in our great nation had ever been told that if he took the stage, his third cousin was going to cut him. And uh, probably so. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I asked Carlos, I said, well, is he, is he angry about something I wrote? And Carlos said, as far as I know, he can't read. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, so you there, there's not one one thing I mean obviously uh, the the great issue uh, that of civil rights had been written about with courage and and power and and lived more than that it had been lived by people who gave up great sacrifice. Um, and when I began to write about civil rights, it was more historical, more archival almost. And I thought that, I thought that. And then you wind up getting on a plane for, for Jasper, Texas, you know, to write about a modern day lynching. So, um, uh, the one thing about the South is you are never, ever, ever going to run out of stories. Amen. Rick, this has been a great discussion. You know, what's that? Yeah, one more question and then we'll, we'll wrap her up. I've been a fan girl since my years at the Washington Post. And one of my favorite stories was about Osceola McCarty the washerwoman from Mississippi who saved all of her money, all $150,000 of it and donated it to the <clears throat> Southern Miss. I always wondered all these years how you found her and how you found her story. Well, well I, I would love to say that, that I am just an intuitive reporter and instinctive and just sniff out a story no matter where it is. I'm pretty sure somebody else did it first and then somebody else did it, and then somebody else did it. And about the fourth or fifth time, uh, I remember thinking, 
Huh. I wonder what there is left to tell. Because the, I think the one mistake that we make is uh, that I can speak to as a craft, because uh, I make so many mistakes in every way in my life, my writing life and my life. But the one thing that I've always thought I did pretty well was uh, put a human face on things. I thought I was pretty good at putting a human face on things. And and I knew that, that, that what I had read about her had been kind of one-dimensional. And um, so I just spent a little time with her. And she didn't want me to. She... She didn't want attention. She was one of the least uh, uh, responsive. You know, you couldn't trick her. Not that trick sounds bad, but you couldn't ask that 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 good leading question. You know, because she had so little ego, so little ego that she was uh, unimpressed with herself. And so, because the quotes were not real good, I had to fall back on what I saw. And what I saw was a hot little house in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, because she only turned the air conditioner on if she had company. Uh, I saw a Bible that was held together with scotch tape. And I... I you know, I, I wrote it. Yeah, I could have said her Bible was held together with scotch tape. But if you want to make somebody feel something, then use words that elicit some kind of feeling. And with Southerners, if you write about the Bible, why not mention a part of it? Why not mention Jonah and the whale or, you know, uh, Genesis or... And so um, I wrote that... She bound her ragged Bible up with scotch tape to keep Corinthians from falling out. And, and um, people ask me, well, why did you single out Corinthians? And I told them, because I can't spell Deuteronomy. <laughs> uh, uh, but it was, you know, describing describing her shoes that she had cut the toes out of when you know when her those those remember those little cloth dime store tennis shoes that everybody in the world used to wear and uh and eventually the toe end would wear out and people would and people meaning my people would cut the toe out and create a pair of of sandals and so these little things show the sacrifice as effectively as the word one hundred and fifty thousand dollars and um so that that remains one of my favorite stories uh to write but part of being a writer is is being able to equate your own life and your own past is to be able to draw from that. And I knew some of these things about sacrifice because my own mother had a Bible like that because my own mother cut the toes out of her shoes uh, to create a pair of sandals. So um, I guess as I wrote that story, I did not see uh, an 86 year old woman I saw a, a, a 19 year old mother, you know, lugging me around on her hip. So, you know, I, I, I thank you for, for mentioning that. It's, it's one of the few stories I've ever written where there aren't any rough places. You know, there are no burrs that you snag your memory on. And uh, I, I wish they were all like that. Uh, but they're not. Rick, thank you so much. Thank you for today. Everybody give Rick a big round of applause.
Any parting no, thoughts? No, you're good. He's good. All right, thank you. Hey, thank you very much. I hope we got this first session kicked off great. We're going to take a quick break, and then we will be back. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Quick announcement. There you go. Hi, I'm Susan Womack, and I work here at Millsaps, and I work with the Millsaps Truth, Racial Healing, and Transformation Campus Center here. And I just want to invite you during the breaks um, to uh, see an exhibit in our chapel in partnership with the Margaret Walker Center at Jackson State University. We have a chronological display of civil rights along the Lynch Street corridor um, from the founding of the college, of the university up to about the 1970s when the tragic murders happened on uh, JSU's campus. Um, and a very quick story, since we are where we are today, uh, a lot of people don't know that Jackson State University, Jackson College at the time, was originally founded on the very site where Millsaps College now exists. Um, and as wealthy people began moving out of downtown Jackson into the suburbs, um, this area of the city became very uncomfortable for um, Jackson College, its professors and its students. And so over a period of time, they were encouraged to move to a site in West Jackson and where they now um, reside. And so we, we are very privileged to um, begin to uncover that history and tell that story and work with our Jackson State um, partners to um, bring exhibits like this to both campuses. So we do a lot of work back and forth. So I invite you um, during the breaks to uh, see the exhibit. It's very good. Thank you. It's in the chap Yates Chapel, which is just behind us here. Thank you. Thank you.
All right, we're going to get started here. A couple of house, more housekeeping things. If you do not have a copy of this program, raise your hand and we will get one to you. And the, um, the reason you should have it is it's got a backside which has a survey and we'd love for you to fill that out. Those of you who are in the first session, you can, you can tell what you thought and um, you know, begin to answer these things. Uh, if you'd like. Uh, the second thing is, uh, I know some of you may have come in by the back way and missed out on getting a ticket. If you did not get a ticket, Rena is holding up these lovely tickets. If you did not get a ticket, we need for you to have a ticket because these tickets are for door prizes. And one of the door prizes, the first one we'll give away in a little bit, is uh, for, uh, remember the Marshall Ramsey cartoon? He's gonna, he's, he has graciously agreed to give away a signed copy of that, uh, of that cartoon. Pretty cool, huh? So all Marshall needs is, is gonna need is your name and address. So after, when we give away the first one, we just need your name and address. Okay. And I guess we'll keep going. We've still got people. Anybody else who needs a ticket or needs a program? Got someone over here? Okay. We'll make our way slowly around here. Um, oh, so, so I, I thought I would share this. Uh, Rick mentioned this, Rick Bragg mentioned this, but I thought I'd read it just because it's such terrific writing. Uh, you know, Rick is such a writer, he makes all the rest of us look like imposters, you know what I mean? But uh, it's the example of what Rick was talking about in terms of detail. I'm just going to read the first three paragraphs of the story. Osceola McCarty spent a lifetime making other people look nice. Day after day, for most of her 87 years, she took in bundles of dirty clothes and made them clean and neat for parties she never intended, weddings to which she was never invited, graduations she never saw. She had quit school in the sixth grade to go to work, never married, never had children, and never learned to drive because there was never any place in particular she wanted to go. All she ever had was the work, which she saw as a blessing. Too many other black people in rural Mississippi did not even have that. She spent almost nothing living in her old family home, cutting the toes out of shoes if they did not fit right, and binding her ragged Bible with scotch tape to keep Corinthians from falling out. Over the decades, her pay, mostly dollar bills and change, grew to more than $150,000. More than I can ever use, Miss McCarty said the other day without a trace of self-pity, so she is giving her money away to finance scholarships for black students at the University of Southern Mississippi here in her hometown, where tuition is $2,400 a year. So how about that? Pretty cool, huh? Um, so, uh, Dean, uh, Dean Beckett, who's a longtime executive editor uh, for the uh, New York Times, uh, he's called investigative reporting the height of profession of journalism because it involves the aggressive pursuit of truth against the odds in an attempt to hold the powerful to account. And uh, I have to make note, too, of what happened in Las Vegas not too, too long ago. Uh, a guy, uh, an investigative reporter by the name of Jeff German was killed just because a, a politician didn't like the story he wrote. So this is, unfortunately, there are politicians out there who are elevating, they're, they're, they're putting targets on us <laughs> as investigative reporters and reporters because they, you know, they don't like what we're doing and therefore they, they start using this dehumanizing language you might call, uh, calling us monsters or, or whatever. Um, but anyway, but today's panel is called Erasing Truth because as Dean mentioned, you know, when reporters pursue that truth, there are often people in power fighting to erase uh, that truth. And so to talk about investigative reporting, I, you know, this is 
obviously near and dear to my heart, uh, we have some of the best investigative reporters in the country here. I mean, this is a, this is a all-star gathering right here. I hope you realize that. Uh, but, but yeah, absolutely. And, I, and I'm going to turn this over to Cheryl uh, W. Thompson. She's the senior editor. If you don't know Cheryl, you should. She's the senior, senior editor over investigations at NPR. And she's a former, something near and dear to my heart, she's a former chairman and pres, uh, former president and chairman of the board at IRE, the Investigative Reporters and Editors, which is a terrific organization. And if there are any young people who are looking to investigative reporting, you, one of the best things you can do is go to, to an IRE convention, which is in June, by the way, if you want to go. It's in Orlando. So, um, but Cheryl, uh, you know, worked for the Post for over two decades, the Washington Post, and she did a story about tracing guns used to kill more than 500 police officers. Uh, what award have you not won, Cheryl? I mean, you've won an Emmy, a national headliner, just, uh, you know, she was involved in the Pulitzer Project. I mean, she's just done everything. And, but my favorite story, Cheryl was telling me the other day, is the one about the politician you wrote about that finally got indicted. So you mind telling that story, Cheryl, to start off? Well, since he's not here, yes, I can tell him. Um, <laughs> he is out of prison. He went to prison for six years. But um, he was a guy who ran, he was sort of like a mayor of Prince George's County, Maryland, which was uh, the wealthiest black county in the country at the time. And he just, you know, got... Um, you know, you'd think a reporter would know how to turn on a mic, particularly a radio reporter. You're doing but fine. I didn't want to touch anything for fear. Um, so now you guys can hear me. Um, and he just got greedy. Um, and um, I, the reason I started investigating him was because I would see him on television every day because he was a former prosecutor and he was always trying to uh, get a police officer arrested. And so needless to say, the police weren't fond of him. And I just, you know, it was just instinctual as, as the panelists, I think we'll talk about how a lot of this is instinct and we trust our instincts and just started writing about him piece, you know, story by story by story. And, and in the end, you know, he was indicted for um, embezzlement and fraud and a lot of other things and um, ended up serving one of the longest prison sentences in Maryland history. And he doesn't speak to me and I just can't imagine why I can't get that interview with him post prison. But, um, but he's out and you know, very quiet. So I'm just waiting to see if he has his next chapter. I'll be waiting. So anyway, thank you, Jerry, for that. And so I want to thank you guys for coming and welcome to Erasing Truth. Um, as investigative journalists, our job is to uncover things that people don't want revealed. All of us on this panel have encountered powerful people who don't want us to do the kinds of stories that we're going to discuss today, welfare scandals involving uh, lawmakers and nonprofits and others and widespread sexual abuse and murders and injustice. In fact, these powerful folks often will go to great lengths to hide the truth from us. So I'm thrilled to introduce three investigative journalists who are truth seekers, journalists who are committed to digging deep to do so, persistent, undeterred reporters who don't understand the word no, journalists who totally get the importance of what we do and the responsibility that comes with it. So first, uh, to my far left uh, is Anna Wolf, who investigates poverty and economic justice for Mississippi Today. Prior to joining Mississippi Today in 2018, she reported for the Clarion Ledger, the Center for Public Integrity, which is an investigative nonprofit based in DC, and the Jackson Free Press, the capital city's alternative weekly, news weekly, right, news weekly. And Anna's most recent investigation, like unless you've been living under a rock, uncovered a $77 million welfare scandal involving your former governor, Phil Bryant, and Brett Favre, former Green Bay Packers quarterback, and Southern Miss alum, and I say Green Bay, Green Bay Packers with a smile because I'm a Chicago girl, and you know, that's our rival, so nothing gives me pleasure um, more than talking about him today. 
And those stories won Anna this year's Goldsmith Prize for investigative reporting. And yes, Jerry, you asked if there was an award. I haven't won. The Goldsmith is one of them, along with, along with others, but that's one of them. So I'm really excited for her, and congratulations for that. And now she can add it to her growing list of other national and state awards. Next to Anna is Julie K. Brown, one of my heroes in this business. She's a member of the Miami Herald's investigative reporting team, and she really is one of my journalism idols. She is particularly known for her criminal justice reporting, including her amazing series that examined how a rich and powerful sex trafficker suspected of sexually abusing more than 100 underage girls and young women arranged a secret plea deal and escaped life in prison. That series earned Julie the prestigious George Polk Award, another which I have not won, in 2018. And like Anna, Julie has continued to pursue the story. Her perseverance led to the resignation of then President Donald Trump's labor secretary. And um, it was, uh, if I didn't mention his name, it was Jeffrey Epstein and his arrest on new federal charges uh, in New York. Her dogged reporting also prompted reforms in the way prosecutors treat sex crime victims. And finally, but not least, Gilbert King is the author of three books. One wasn't enough? No. No, okay. Um, including one that won the 2013 Pulitzer Prize for general nonfiction. He's also written about race, civil rights, and the death penalty for the Washington Post, the New York Times, and the Atlantic. King was also a 2019-2020 fellow at the Dorothy and Lewis B. Coleman Center for Writers and Scholars at the New York Public Library. And if you're looking for an intriguing podcast, his latest, Bone Valley, is worth a listen. The nine-episode podcast is a story of a man convicted of killing his wife in the mid-1980s in Central Florida. I think it was Lakeland, Florida, Polk Lakeland, County? Florida, yeah, Polk County. But there's one problem. The man sent to prison who remains there 35 years later, didn't do it according to King. Please welcome our panelists. So Gilbert, I'm gonna start with you. Tell us about the story of Leo Schofield. Tell us, tell us what happened. Yeah, I'll just tell you briefly how, how, how the story came about. I was doing a, a judicial conference for some for 200 judges in Florida. And at the end of, a, of the conference, a judge came up to me and wrote on his business card and it said, Leo Schofield, not just wrongfully convicted, he's an innocent man. And I remember thinking, like, judges aren't supposed to do this. He's a sitting judge. You, you know, there's, there's ethics involved. You're not supposed to comment on current cases. But he was absolutely convinced that Leo Schofield had been framed. He said, I know exactly how they do it, and I'm going to tell you. And that was really the story of Leo Schofield. I went back into the 1980s in Lakeland, Florida, and just reinvestigated this case. And basically, it was a false narrative, like a lot of these stories are, put forth by you know, local prosecutors and sometimes vaguely complicit local reporting in some of these towns. Um, and so the official narrative that gets told is not the real narrative, the, the real truth. And so that's what I spent the last four years doing, just investigating this case, ultimately finding that someone else was responsible for this. And I won't ruin it for you, but we end up talking to him in the last episode. So it's, it's hard to get judges to even say good morning to a reporter, right? So the fact that he would slip you a business card, like, what was that all? What did you think? Was he like, was it, what did you think? You know, it's Florida. I just think, here's another crazy person, <laughs> you know? I mean, you, Yeah, I didn't want to say that. I wanted you yeah. to go ahead and say you know, that. Okay. Right, you've heard of Florida, man. This is, this is another one, I thought. Yeah. Uh, and then I, as I started talking to him, I could tell he was really intense about it. And he said, you know, 15 years ago, I represented this client before I got named a judge. And he's wrongfully convicted. I could never solve it in the appellate courts. But this guy's innocent, and it's still bothering me today. In fact, just a few, just earlier this month, he resigned his seat on the bench to go back to representing this young man that he believes is innocent. Um, so he was really committed to it. So it was pretty obvious that I should at least take a look at it. And obviously, the things I found only supported everything he was telling me. This guy's innocent. So was the judge the original defense lawyer, or had this had Schofield gotten into some trouble before the? He, he'd never been in any wife. trouble at all. He was uh, not the original defense lawyer either. There was another man who just was really incompetent. Public defender? Uh, no, private. Oh. That was. The, if, Leo would have been fine if he would have stayed with the public defender's office. They had some really quality attorneys in that division. They would have saved him. Um, but he went with the flashy kind of better call Saul guy, you know, at the billboards. And this guy didn't do any preparation, couldn't get the names right. He just completely botched the case. 
Um, but once you're convicted in court, it's no longer about you know, innocent until proven guilty. Once you're convicted, it's guilty until proven innocent. Yeah. And it's really stacked against you. And that's what he's been up against. And this judge came in sometime during the appellate conference to try to represent him, but failed. Anna, Anna, I love this about you because so many reporters, you know, oftentimes reporters overlook things, but a good investigative reporter will pick up on things. And you saw statistics a statistics in a, a 2017 report in Mississippi that found the state, the poorest in the country, was approving less than 2% of the families applying for welfare. 2%, I think it was 1.5%. Is that what prompted you to, to start digging into the welfare system? Yeah, that's right. I was actually covering City Hall at the time when that story came out, and it always, it like piqued my interest, and then shortly after that, I took over the health beat and I was like, I'm gonna use this health beat to, as an excuse to look into this issue because this is an insane, insane statistic that in the poorest state in the country, um, out of all the people applying for welfare cash assistance, only 2% are being approved. We get that money anyway. It's not like we're only drawing it down to give to uh, people through cash assistance. So where is the rest of the money going? So in 2017, I started putting in public records requests trying to get information about how this money was being spent. I love seeing Jarvis Dorch in, Dorch in the room because he was one of the main people who um, kind of was raising the red flag about the welfare system. Wait, where is he? Jarvis Dorch. Oh, don't be shy. I know, I wish he were, like, he should be up here speaking about it, but um, he, you know, he and others were kind of raising the red flag about what the Department of Human Services was doing with this program, you know, mostly from the perspective of we see people in poverty and we see people trying to access these programs and they're not, they're, they're hitting roadblocks, they're not being helped. The department isn't being responsive to any questions. Um, the department isn't um, being accountable in any way. There aren't reports that they send to the federal government that explains what they're doing with this program, you know, how this program is um, alleviating poverty in the state. And so I just started putting in records requests and kind of met roadblock after roadblock, um, you know, they were actually kind of sophisticated in like how good they were at giving me exactly what I did not ask for. Um, and the then government? I just had to go, I'm shocked. <laughs> giving you records you didn't ask for? <laughs> and things that just didn't make sense, you know, documents with numbers that didn't add up, didn't match up over time. And um, I, I ended up submitting over 80 public records requests during the course of this reporting. So. So when you do a story like this, I'm sort of curious, like for people who may want to look into things, and, and certainly your tips are over here, like what kind of records do you ask for? That's and where do you start searching? So knowing where, what is reported to the federal government was, was the first thing. And even just familiarizing myself with what is available federally was kind of the first task and kind of complicated in itself, you know, like now I can pull any stat you want that exists there, you know, off like the tip of my fingers, but, um, but just knowing what is reported. And that was the problem was that the federal government in this particular program, which is a block grant, which means that the money comes directly to the state and the state has basically free reign to spend the money however they want. Um, the federal government wasn't requiring the state to show what it was doing with the money, how, like where the money was actually going the outcomes of the programs that they were funding. Um, and so essentially, you know, within that stat that said that just, you know, less than 2% were being approved for welfare, about five to 10% in any given year is what was being spent on cash welfare assistance. Five to 10% of $90 million a year was actually going to people in poverty. So what I started doing was requesting records to show where the rest of the money was going, and that's where I learned that it wasn't being recorded. And of course, you know, when we start stories, we never know where they're gonna end up, but, but, but we do start a story going, oh, I think this is gonna be good. So d what were your thoughts when you, when you started this, like, oh my God, ding, 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 or? Yeah, well, so when they, like, demoted the public records officer that I was working with. <laughs> oh, ding, ding, ding. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I actually filed a complaint against the department and that was kind of near the end of my time at the Clarion Ledger. I sort of um, brought all this baggage with me to Mississippi today with this like pending complaint with the Ethics Commission over records and um, finally learned that just a huge chunk of this money was going to just two nonprofits to run this very like nebulous 
sort of vague anti-poverty program that had a lot of like splashy, there was a lot of splashy ads and you know, commercials about the program and they would be, there'd be like a booth for this program at sporting events or the state fair. And so it looked really attractive. It looked like they were doing something to help families in poverty and that's certainly what they said they were doing. Um, but if you went to their center, which I did early on in 2018, um, it's kind of like a computer lab sitting empty and you know, maybe a couple people getting help filling out a resume but, uh, you know, when you're talking about $20 million a year going through these two centers, it didn't add up. And um, so just kind of pulling that thread, trying to get records from them, doing interviews with them, um, and then eventually um, went to the center one day downtown. It was a new center that had just opened and really stark, like, Everything was empty. There was a, you know, a toy closet just sitting empty in, an, in a computer lab and like a mock farmer's market where they were supposed to be kind of like teaching people how to grocery shop and there was supposed to be like fresh foods and vegetables. And um, it was just sitting empty. There was no food in any of the bins. And then I go back to the office that day and in my inbox comes the press release from the auditor's office that they've arrested six people in the largest public embezzlement scheme in state history. Wow. Okay, Julie, from, from embezzlement to uh, sex abuse, um, we have, this is what we do for a living, right? Um, you actually wanted to do a story on sex trafficking, but every time you Googled sex trafficking in Florida, Jeffrey Epstein's name popped up. That's, that's right. I, I had been covering uh, Florida prisons um, and the criminal justice system in Florida for four years, had been doing a lot of stories about the suspicious deaths of inmates in Florida prisons, and I was sort of tiring of covering, covering that, so I picked another cheery topic to write about, which was sex trafficking, uh, because I had interviewed a number of uh, women in the women's prison in Florida, and I knew that sex trafficking was a huge problem, and not a whole lot had been written about it, so I thought, well, maybe I can dig into this. Um, and like, I, like you said, I, I just kept, his name kept coming up, Jeffrey Epstein, and this deal, and I just kept reading, every time it popped up, I just kept reading it and reading it and thinking, how does this happen, that this man did this, and he's, you know, out, and he's got his island and he's got a, you know, a beautiful penthouse in Paris and he's got all these friends in high places and he just basically is living his jet setting life after allegedly abusing all these young girls. So I started sort of picking away at the story and right around when I was looking at it, Donald Trump nominated Alex Acosta to be his labor secretary. And I knew that Alex Acosta had been the prosecutor in Florida who had given Jeffrey Epstein this sweetheart deal. And in my mind, I thought, well, before they confirm him, you know, they're going to grill him about this deal because it had this, you know, Jeffrey Epstein story had been written about quite um, frequently by the media. Uh, so I thought for sure they're going to grill him over why he did this. And to my amazement, uh, the senators really didn't ask him many questions. And the few questions that they did ask him showed that they didn't really understand the gravity of what he had done and or the gravity of the crimes that Jeffrey Epstein had committed. Uh, so at that point, I thought maybe it's time that I look at this case uh, a different way. I was very, um, you know, I could relate to what um, Rick Bragg had said about the story that had been written about the, wa the washerwoman. It had been written three, four times before, and but it had never been written from a human side before. And that was very true, I think, with Jeffrey Epstein's story because it had, you know, tons of journalists had been writing stories about the sweetheart deal, deal but no one had really went to these girls who are now, of course, now we're in their late 20s and asked them what happened and how, what this, how it affected their lives. And the more that I looked, the more victims I found and the more that I realized that this was a huge miscarriage of justice that had never been adequately examined. 
And initially, your editors had little interest in you pursuing the story just because of that. Well, it's been written about what's new. They thought it was old news. And you, being Julie Brown, said, mm, not so fast. Yeah, I found that there had been a lot of civil litigation surrounding Jeffrey Epstein in the years since uh, the deal was struck and he served this tiny sentence. You can't even call it a jail term because he was allowed to go to his fancy office in West Palm Beach every day and had visitors coming in. He never really spent time in a jail cell. He mostly just slept there and then went to his office every day, all day, and then, you know, had parties and had, you know, fancy caterers come and deliver food for him. And um, so I just thought, you know, this, I don't think anybody really knew the real story about what happened. And I knew that there were certain people that, besides the victims who had never been interviewed, uh, the police chief and the lead detective who handled the case from the beginning had never spoken publicly about it. So I thought maybe it's time that we start from scratch. I sort of looked at it at, like a cold case detective looks at it and I thought I'm just gonna, I actually didn't really read a lot of what had been written. I wanted to just look at it organically myself from the very beginning and started the same process of requesting records. And um, I was really relating to your one podcast episode where you went to the police station to get the records and there was like this tiny little file that came out and you're all mad and I'm thinking, oh man, that always makes me mad when there, and there, there's three public records people looking over your shoulder saying, well, what do you, what do you really want this for? Why, why are you asking for this file? And that, really does happen what they they destroy the records sometimes we still haven't gotten all the records uh with the jeffrey epstein case uh the miami herald is still suing uh for a number of records that have been sealed in the case so um you know getting back to the theme of this particular panel erasing the truth th that's what happens when people do bad things sometimes they they essentially try to erase Ever, any evidence that it really happened, whether it's by losing records or keeping them sealed. Uh, the judiciary is just as guilty, I think, as prosecutors and police sometimes at agreeing to seal documents that, sh that don't have to be sealed. Even if there's victims' names in them, they can redact names. They can still make those records public, and it's very important. Uh, that we pay attention to what kind of laws are being passed because legislatures all over the country, including in Florida now, are now trying to find ways uh, to not allow the public. I mean, sometimes they say the media, but when they prevent the media from getting records, they are essentially preventing you from getting the records because we get only what you're entitled to. So everything we get, you can get. It's not some certain thing where the media gets this stuff. This is public. This is documents you can go into a courthouse and you should be able to get. And Gilbert, talk about, I want to, for people who may not know about Bone Valley and the Leo um, Schofield case, tell us a little bit about what he and his wife, they were young, they were like 18 when they got married. Yeah. Uh, and tell us what happened before I ask you about the new evidence. Yeah, sure. It's just a, a young kid who's a heavy metal guitarist. He gets married to a 17-year-old girl. They're living in a trailer in this part of Lakeland, Florida. And one day she just doesn't come home from work. And so Leo is frantically searching for a couple days and they finally find her car two days later and then her body in a, in a ditch in Lakeland. Um, and it's just, I, just, I hate to say this, but it's a routine wrongful conviction. You can read the transcripts and just see the state did not have the evidence, but they had a very good attorney who just kind of bull rushed everything through in the closing argument and he won his conviction. And it's not uncommon. I mean, that's the one thing I think you have to realize is that wrongful convictions are not that uncommon. I really might not even be interested in this case from that point of view right there because it's not really a great story. They happen so frequently. What made this one really interesting was that there were some unidentified fingerprints found in Michelle's car from that night that were never identified. Um, it went 17 years and they finally came back to this guy who lived a mile away from Leo and Michelle who's killed four people. Um, and he's forensically linked to the car and then he confesses multiple times. So at that point, I'm looking at the post-conviction process, the appellate courts. What's going on? Why is Leo Schofield still in prison if you have a man who's forensically linked to the crime scene who's confessing? And everything he says makes sense. 
And that just shows you the difficulty, the mountains you have to move in order to overturn a wrongful conviction. Because a lot of times what you have in these small rural communities are all the judges are coming out of the prosecution's office. They work with the prosecutors. And there's just this home court advantage and this finality that we reach for. Like, oh, you can't disturb a jury's verdict, you know, unless, of course, you don't think the jury got it right, then you can smear anybody and say, we got the wrong guy, we got the right guy, but you know, the jury didn't think that way. They constantly use that to smear defendants who are acquitted. But you know, God forbid you, you question a wrongful conviction. And so that was just really what the story's about, is just going back and seeing how difficult it is with all this evidence to get a wrongfully convicted person addressed and released from prison. This, this story has a lot of twists and turns, right? Because there was the father, the father-in-law who had visions and all kinds of things. Um, yeah, there's a lot of these kind of red herrings that I guess you would call them. I don't mind them as a storyteller because they play into the story and they actually, they really did happen. So one of the problems is they couldn't get the police to search for an 18 year old girl right away because they're like, she's out screwing around, don't worry, it'll be all right. And so the police never really get involved. And so the families have to do the searching for the initial days. And so they're splitting up and trying to trace back from where the car was found to go back to where she was last seen. It's a pretty logical way of searching once you find a car. Um, but the problem was Leo's father found Michelle's body in a ditch. And afterwards, he made these statements saying God had led, her, God had led him to her body. And, you know, law enforcement was like, he must have known where the body was. Or no, knew God. Yeah, I mean, or knew God, right? They, they couldn't call God as a witness, so you had to go on this statement. And, you know, the truth of the matter is he, did, he never had this premonition. The state likes to say, oh, he had a premonition, he woke up in the middle of the night, led police right to the body. That's the spin they put on. That's the narrative that they want. The truth of the matter is he never said anything about a premonition until after he found the body. And then he said, you know, God led me there. And... To me, I, I sort of equate that with, like, if you ever listen to interviews about people who, you know, there's a tragic plane crash and there's the one person who, like, got the ticket but missed the connection, and they always ascribe some kind of divine intervention to this, like, God, it must not have been my time, God was sending me a message, like, and, and that's sort of the way he reacted. He just was trying to sort of please people, he even made up some weird stories, like she was smiling as if she was happy and pleased and everything's peaceful, and he was trying to bring relief to people in a really weird way, and that probably cost Leo, his son, his freedom. Weird something, statements like that. And then there was also, Jeremy was the young man who confessed, um, but he also then recanted. Yeah, and that, the recanting is another line that the sort of media and the, and the state likes to push through. The, I mean, he, he does make some really difficult statements. Lee, I, I've interviewed him, and he's not, he's not the easiest person to talk to. He's got, you know, brain damage, emotional abuse from a child. He's, he's a very severely abused child. Um, but, you know, like, his recantations are like, they have a letter from him when he confessed, and the investigators go in. And he's like, I never confessed. I mean, his lies are very easy to see. He's written a, a, a letter about this. And then when he gets him on the stand, he's confronted by one of the attorneys who shows an autopsy picture of, of Michelle's wounds when she was pulled from the ditch. And she was stabbed. She was stabbed 26 times. And he shows her that, and she, he freaks out. He's like, I, I've seen this before. I don't want to look at it again. Um, and she says, look at it. And he says, I didn't do that. That was his exact phrase, no, I didn't do that. And when I interviewed him later, he just doesn't have the mental capability to understand that a woman floating in water for three days, those stab wounds look a lot different than what they might have looked like initially. And this particular photograph was kind of grotesque. It was exposed to the elements. It looked like almost like a gunshot wound. And he just knows he used a knife. And so he says, no, I didn't do that. And later on, when I talked to him, he said, I just didn't think a knife could do that much damage. That was what he was describing. So he never really recanted. Mm -hmm. And I want to come back to you. You talked about the public records that you saw and you got and the stonewalling and the you know, things that happened to you. You also got text messages, right? Um, in fact, wasn't it text messages that connected go former Governor Bryant to Brett Favre? Talk about that. Right, so pretty early on after the arrests, we were able to make the connection between some of the projects that got this welfare money improperly and Brett Favre. Um, 
But what we didn't know is how the governor, the former governor, um, had fit into what had happened. How, you know, he is, he has unilateral control over the Department of Human Services as an agency under the governor's office. So how did he, you know, um, direct those people to spend that money in that way and, you know, what was his involvement? And so for about two years, there really wasn't any information to, to speak of on that. Um, the state auditor who originally investigated, investigated the case had said um, from the outset that the former governor was the whistleblower in the case, so painting him as the person who had come forward with the information as opposed to someone who was involved in it. Um, fast forward, you know, those two years, I was able to get some text messages not through public records. Um, in fact, they were records that were housed at the auditor's office, but the auditor denied my public records request for these text messages. Was able to get my hands on them, and they showed that um, Governor Bryant and Brett Favre communicated, you know, through text message, sort of through these back channels about getting money to these projects exactly around the time that welfare money started flowing to these projects. Um, one was a pharmaceutical company that Brett Favre was sort of lobbying for and investing in, and the other was a volleyball stadium at University of Southern Mississippi. Um, so we published those uh, text messages and that story um, like middle of last year, and then sort of the, um, the series of events after that um, were pretty interesting in also kind of showing how officials were trying to obscure the truth of what happened. So I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask this question when I, when I read your stuff about the text messaging. When will government officials learn not to send text messages? That's a good question. It didn't work out for Detroit's mayor mm -hmm. when he was having an affair, I guess it's common knowledge, I, I should say allegedly having an affair with his chief of staff via city pagers, right? It didn't work out well for him. He ended up going to prison for that and some other things. Um, when will they learn? Because you said you, that the auditor denied your request, but was it a taxpayer funded phone? Um, on which the text messages were sent, or was it his personal phone and you just happened to be really well sourced? Well, I am well sourced, I will say that. No, um, that's a good question. I think that um, any time a public official is talking about government business, particularly like, you know, supporting a business through public channels, then that's a public record, no matter if the phone is a personal phone or um, um, a state phone. But, um, but yeah, no, the, uh, the point stands that these, these messages were in the possession of the state auditor and he has, to this day, refused to turn them over. Yeah. So now you have them. And uh, so I imagine, like me, uh, the governor's not too fond of you? Correct. Okay. <laughs> and, 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 and how much do you care? <laughs> how much do you care about that? I'm more interested in how Brett Barb thinks of her. <laughs> well, he's... Green Bay, we don't care about it. You know, the, the governor did sit down for a three hour interview for this story, which is pretty unprecedented. And I wanna to get to that because that was like, huh? Right, well it's like- It was smart on his part or, or no? I think that's up for the reader to decide. Um, we did publish the transcript of the interview essentially in full um, because we felt like being transparent in that way was the, you know, the best thing for readers, um, you know. How do you explain that? How do you explain receiving a text message from Brett Favre that says we're so happy about the, mon the money that we're getting from the state of Mississippi and the governor you know, responding with a thumbs up? Um, he said he didn't read his text messages carefully enough. That was his ex explanation. So I, I didn't know what he was gonna say when I went in there to sit down with him and um, was very curious how he would respond and that was what he came up with. Interestingly, it, it seemed to me that he didn't realize how many texts I had um, because he had kind of told a story about how he ended that relationship with the company that received the welfare money before the arrests um, because that happened after he had left office, about two weeks after he had left office. I had those text messages, so I could see that after he left office, he did not, in fact, end that relationship until the day of the arrests, which was very convenient timing because he had agreed by text message to accept stock in the company in exchange for all his help after he left office, um, but that didn't take place when the arrests occurred. That kind of derailed the arrangement. 
I ask that question because a lot of times when we do investigative stories like the officials um, we're writing about often won't sit down and explain to us what's going on. Um, like Jack Johnson, the guy in Maryland, like he would sit down with me for the first two or three stories and then he realized this was not going to go well for him. Right. And so then he stopped talking to me and would say, put your questions in writing, which I hate to do, but, right. but at least you cover yourself. And then when I put them in writing, he would say, well, no, I'm not going to talk to you. But then he knew what the story was about. But then, you know, we always stay one step ahead anyway as reporters. Um, so the fact that the former governor said, because my guess is Jeffrey Epstein didn't sit down with you, Julie. No, but he was designing something along those lines uh, before he died. He um, had contacted a PR person and a lawyer, and he was sort of trying to um, create some kind of a, a, a a way for that to happen where he would be able to address this. He was sort of at the point where I guess he was desperate and he thought, well, I've got to speak about this somehow. And and my name came up about maybe calling me and uh, of course that didn't happen. We now know that, you know, other things have gotten away. <laughs> and we want to talk about like death by suicide or other means. We'll talk about, we'll talk about that af after the commercial break. Um, <laughs> uh, Gil, the evidence, your evidence, was the fingerprints. Was there more? Was there more evidence? Or was, was that what you're basing this on, that the fingerprints belong to this alleged serial killer? Yeah, I mean, this is the, before the day that they had DNA. DNA wasn't showing up in the courts in 1987. So they really didn't have much to go on. And, and we talked to the present day sheriff who was in the, on the force back in the day. And he, you know, he told us, like, back then, you know, the, Polk County, the, the, the population was exploding. There was so much violent crime. They were understaffed. They weren't really well trained. At the time, they had a white supremacist um, sheriff who basically got thrown out of office by the governor. Um, and so that caused a major disruption, and the, 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 the whole division got overturned. And this was right at the time of the murder. So they were just overwhelmed, and they didn't have anything. And this case went cold for two years. They had no evidence connecting Leo to this crime. And then this aggressive prosecutor came in and started looking at it again. And, and, and that's when you notice the police reports and the timeline start to shift in the favor of the prosecution. Like the initial witnesses say they see something between 2.30 a.m. and 3 a.m., but when it gets to trial, it's more like 1 a.m. Everything gets massaged, and you can sort of see how this narrative is getting built by a very clever prosecutor. And, you know, I've come across this a lot in Florida, sadly. <laughs> Um, back in the 40s and 50s, it was much worse, as you can imagine. I mean, back in the day, prosecutorial misconduct, they didn't even object to it. You know, I, I'll, I'll give you a, a good example of, of the kind of evidence. At one point in the Groveland story, the, the devil in the grove, there was four young men who were falsely accused of sexually assaulting a white woman back in 1949. Just for people who may not know, that Th Thurgood Marshall was right. involved in that case. Right, Thurgood Marshall came down to Florida and took this case. And he's going up against this very aggressive prosecutor again. Um, and the prosecutor knows he's up against Mr. Civil Rights. This is Thurgood Marshall. You know, he's on the cover of Time magazine that same year. So now this local prosecutor is a little bit worried about it. And at the very end, when he's doing his closing summation, he basically leans on the jury rail and says, gentlemen of the jury, all 12 white men, um, I hate to have to tell you this, but I've been stricken with a fatal disease. This is probably going to be my last trial. Um, I certainly would like to go out with a win. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, and Marshall's lawyer he like, did. Can't even, can't even object he, to that. And he did. He did. Of course he did, yeah. Did he die? Uh, he did die a couple of years later, but he had a, I have to say, he had a really crazy change of heart and uh, turned on the sheriff in that story and ended up working against him in his last years. I've never seen like a real white supremacist have this kind of come to Jesus moment. Um, you know, you see it with, I'm sure Jerry, you've seen it with Klansmen, but you don't really see it with elected state officials just saying, I did everything wrong. These guys were innocent and I'm gonna try and do something in my last year of life to fix it. I'm sitting here thinking, what the hell's going on in this country that we talk about, this, these, these are like the topics of conversation. It's just, it's a little, Crazy um, to me. And so, Julie, I want to come back to you. The Labor Secretary, Trump's former Labor Secretary, um, his job was to combat 
sex trafficking, ironically. That was his job. And he was the one who had approved Epstein's lenient sentence, the one that he did earlier for prostitution of a girl under the age of 18. Um, and that was when he was the U.S. attorney for the Southern District of Florida. Right. right? right. And so then after that, um, now there was interest by your editors, right, about Epstein. Well, actually what happened was I wanted to do a story when they nominated him and he said, well, we got to cover the paper, had a, a federal courts reporter, he was the prosecutor, so he knew the federal courts reporter had that beat, knew uh, Alex Acosta very well, and so they, the paper did a story, and they didn't mention the Epstein case at all in the profile that they did of him. And I went back to my editor and I said, you know, this is crazy. We can't do a profile. This guy is going to become uh, the next labor secretary, which, by the way, the Labor Department has the responsibility over human trafficking and child labor laws. This is a, a huge, important position. So I guess he went back and they decided, OK, we're going to do another bigger profile. And they did. And they mentioned it, but only sort of toward the end, the bottom of the story. So. I just kept pressing, we've got to do something. And, and I originally pitched it as, let's try to find these women and see what they think about the fact that this guy who had let their abuser off the hook is now going to head this agency that has um, all this oversight on human trafficking. So I started out with that premise and the story just, the more I learned, the more it changed into such a, a bigger story about how this miscarriage of justice had happened and how the prosecutors in the case had allowed Jeffrey Epstein's very high-powered lawyers, Kenneth Starr, Alan Dershowitz, um, and a whole bunch of other people he paid huge amounts of money to, really manipulated the uh, federal prosecutors and allowed, essentially, Jeffrey Epstein's lawyers wrote the deal that allowed him to have this you know, this non-punishment really it was. And the way that they wrote the charges, they also gave immunity to unnamed people, you know, that they didn't even have to name. We still don't even know who those people are. I mean, it was, it was a deal that is like unlike any other deal that had been given to anybody before. And I don't, I, pieces of the story had been told, but nobody had ever, number one, put it all together in that way by, again, reading emails and letters and, and things like that that we were able to get, but also through the eyes of the victims who had were really speaking for the first time. In fact, um, several of them spoke on camera, and it was really gut-wrenching, um, and I kind of get choked up when I think about it still to this day. It was gut-wrenching to watch um, them talk about what had happened because the prosecutors had essentially made them feel like that they were whores and that it was their fault that it had happened. And they had lived with this for, you know, you know 10, 15 years. And it had changed the course of a lot of their lives. Some of them never really uh, recovered. Some of them went into drug abuse, um, had domestic um, violence in their past, um, relationships with men that they probably should have never been with. Um, so. I saw a bigger pattern emerging, and as I was uncovering that, the Me Too movement erupted with um, Harvey Weinstein, and the New York Times was writing a story about that, and then the Olympic gymnasts um, were testifying about their abuser, Larry Nasser, and all this was happening as I was doing this, so then my editor said to me, Man, you got a really great story here. <laughs> so, don't you love editors who like it was all? It was like idea. all the time I'm fighting him and saying, "There's a story here. Look what I found. Look what I found. Look what I found." And then all of a sudden, you know, the Me Too movement was in front of us, and he's like, "Wow, we got to get this story. When can you have it?" <laughs> <laughs> but, but. But also, you know, the Epstein story had been done, right? A lot of reporters had done that story and had come up empty for whatever reason. Why did you stick with it? What was it about it that you, as an investigative reporter, your instincts, whatever, made well, you stick with it? Well, I knew it was the women. And nobody had really talked to them before. And when, uh, I, I should mention, I had a reporting partner in this project, Emily Michaud, who was my videographer and photographer who, who went with me. We, our first interview was a woman in, out, who was now living outside of Nashville in a little small town. And when we went to interview her and she told us our story, we were just speechless. We couldn't talk. We, you know, we were just riding back to the airport 
not talking, because we couldn't believe what these girls had been through and what they had been told by prosecutors and how they were not just abused by Jeffrey Epstein, they were abused by their own lawyers took advantage of them because they wanted Jeffrey a, a big settlement out of, some of them got settlements because, so their lawyers didn't care about justice either, they just wanted a cut of the money that they could get from Jeffrey Epstein. So they were um, mistreated by, you know, the criminal justice system, they were mistreated by Jeffrey Epstein. In some cases, they were mistreated by their own families who also wanted a cut of the money, you know, and then when they got the money, they, some of them got into drugs and they were mistreated by their partners. I mean, the mistreatment just kept following them the rest of their lives, and I thought, if nothing else, that was a story that definitely had not been told. You also, before I, I want to um, move back to, to Anna and Gil, but you also had some setbacks with this, right? And I think the biggest one for you was trying to figure out the names of these victims, right? Because police files, as we know, sometimes just say Jane Doe, number one, Jane Doe, number two. How did you keep going and how did you find out the names? Well, it took me six months to get, to get names because it was, they were all buried. And, uh, but... I just had been doing this for so long. I, what I tell young journalists is that um, you don't just come out of the gate doing a story like this. This was like my career, my 30 year career prepared me to do this story because there were a lot of things you learn over the years on how to look for things. And one of the things that happens when you get public documents, if you get enough of them, they black out the names of people they don't want you to know about, but they always miss a name here or there, or they miss the birth date, or they have the mother's name in there. And I wasn't out to, you know, to out these women. I was never going to use their names without their permission, but I still couldn't talk to them unless I found out who they were. So I just had this giant board and I just started putting, this is this date of birth, this is this girl's first name, this is a parent. And one of the really horrible things about Jeffrey Epstein is he had sort of this type of girl that he liked who was usually petite, blonde hair, blue eyed. So once I found one or two or three, it was a little bit easier to find the rest of them because they kind of were all around the same age. I could get a yearbook from the high school and I could more easily get you know, names. And then once I started interviewing the girls, they would tell me who other girls were. So it was sort of this process that I went through. And I talk about some of the findings that um, you got Bryant to admit to during that interview. Um, yeah, so, I mean, he at one point said, you know, I realize it doesn't look good. He never, um, I mean, he took responsibility in some way in that interview, which I felt like it was a win when we talk about holding officials accountable. What does that look like? Are they ever going to get charged? Are they going to be charged civilly, criminally? Like, is there something that can happen to them? But I just think that having him say that he could have done more to catch these things, if that's the narrative that you want to believe, was a win for us that he admitted that things were done wrong under his administration and that it, it could have you know, gone differently and, and he could have been a better steward of taxpayer dollars and of um, anti-poverty programs in the poorest state in the country. He could have had a, uh, a bigger emphasis on helping people in poverty instead of um, letting the money go to his, you know, political allies. And one of the things we do, I mean, when we do investigative stories, our hope is that it will have some impact. It will lead to some kind of, you know, action, right? And in your case, Anna, it led to state lawmakers had hearings, um, on how Mississippi can better spend its welfare money. Um, several lawmakers, I think, filed bills earlier this year to sort of reform the welfare system, state's welfare system, and on and on and on. Um, how gratifying is that as an investigative journalist to well, have impact? Because that is what we that is what we do. We hope it's not to enough. Do. It's like way not enough. So I can't say that I feel like good about it. Um, because there's a lot more work to be done and there's more to expose too. So um, there is a um, uh, Ways and Means House Committee hearing next week in Congress. That's where like real accountability I think needs to take place. This is a federal program and it's uh, the lack of federal oversight is one of the reasons that this was allowed to perpetuate for so long. But 
It's also just the, the philosophy, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> the philosophy of state leaders that people in poverty are not deserving of, the, of the, this funding and not deserving of opportunity that this funding could provide that has, um, has also caused you know, the situation that we're in. And I, don't, I just, I don't know that I see that changing as much as it needs to. So. People in poverty or, or people of color? <clears throat> In Mississippi, mm -hmm. those overlap. And I think that racism is a huge underlying cause for the system that we have in place that um, strips people of opportunity. Um, and you know, this money, the, like, the cool thing about this program is that the money is so flexible that it can, it can be used in all kinds of creative ways to help people lift themselves out of poverty, and yet, we don't see that being done. Today, there's over $100 million of these funds sitting there not being used um, because the state would rather just not use them than find creative ways to solve poverty. So that's kind of where we're at right now. Do you see it changing? Do you see it? Uh, this is, the, you know, this is the Deep South and there have been problems um, for many years in terms of the haves versus the have-nots and the blacks versus the whites and, and what, um, how we are left behind so often in education and now the welfare system. Do you see that changing? So, so now we're getting off kind of off of reporting, but I will say No, that because it is your reporting that brought this to the forefront. So I, I think indeed we are still talking about reporting. I hope that I have impact through my reporting, right? Um, but I do think that Mississippi is a harbinger for the rest of the country. What happens in Mississippi is, is reflective of what's happening in the country. It's not just like this special, unique place. And so, you know, we see that there's a lot of stories like that in, in Jackson and in Mississippi. So like you've got the water crisis in Jackson. That's a like longstanding city infrastructure issue that's happening all across the country, but we just have a spotlight right now. And you've got, you know, the attack on reproductive uh, rights, um, with the overturning of Roe v. Wade being led by the state of Mississippi and our attorney general. Um, but when Roe was overturned, there was this promise from state lawmakers to do things that they never would have done before, because they were saying that philosophically, like if abortion is not available to women, then we have to support them in other ways. And we did get uh, postpartum. Um, Medicaid extension passed this past session um, so that women are not losing their Medicaid coverage after 60 days, but it extends to a full year. And that was done, um, you know, sort of in line with the philosophy that um, in the, this post row world that we're in, that we need to do this for women. So you do see like incremental little changes. Um, in fact, the Department of Human Services right now is changing a policy that. Um, it's kind of a wonky thing, but like uh, people have been working on it for a long time, so it is a win in terms of changes uh, for advocates who work in this space, but they removed a requirement that requires mothers to um, uh, basically sick the state on their children's fathers by giving them information so that they can sue their child's father um, in order to qualify for childcare assistance. So now women are not having to face that very significant roadblock. And so, you know, these are all kind of like little policy movements, but they do add up to, you know, big impacts for the people that are accessing these programs. And because of your reporting, there are hearings, there are laws being changed, there's a congressional hearing, so it all is very relevant. And um, Gil, I think I want to end with you before I ask the audience if there are questions. Uh, well, Julie, I got I to gotta give Julie the final word. Julie's going to have the final word whether I give it to her or not. Um, <laughs> Early this month, there were two former elected officials, right, um, in Polk County, who went before the county commission to lobby on behalf of Leo Schofield, and the county commission declined, saying that it wasn't their place. So what's the latest on the case? Uh, the latest on the case is that um, Leo Schofield has a parole hearing. It'll be his fourth parole hearing. Uh, after you serve 25 years, which is the minimum, and he's got no, you know, disciplinary infractions, he's a model inmate at this prison, he's a leader, um, but every time he shows up for parole, the state, former state attorney shows up and basically says, this guy has never apologized, he's never shown remorse for killing his wife, 
And that's something Leo Schofield cannot do. He's turned down pleas all along. He could have been out of jail, you know, three decades ago, basically, if you had taken these pleas. He won't do it. Um, he said, I'll do anything I can. I want to get out of prison, but I'm not going to admit to a lie. And because he doesn't show remorse and, and apologize for his crime, um, he's denied parole. And so he's coming up for his fourth parole hearing, um, probably late April, early May. Um, you know, we think that there's been enough people in Florida that have responded to the story and are sort of reaching out behind the channels to people. We're getting indications all the time. Um, and so I'm kind of hopeful that something similar happens here that happened with the Groveland case, where it became a political thing. And people on both sides of the aisle decided this is a right that needs to be, you know, or a wrong that needs to be righted. Um, and so I think by staying out of the political side of it, um, we've been able to have some inroads to the people who can make a difference in this. And I'm, I'm pretty hopeful that he is actually going to get paroled this time. Will there be more episodes? Yeah, there's definitely going to be some more episodes. Because I'll tell you one thing. In, our, in the course of our investigation, we found this cold case murder of a taxi cab driver that happened around the same time Michelle was killed, not too far from where Michelle was killed. And we always suspected it was Jeremy. We started investigating, talking to some friends. He had some ties to this town. And I was going to hopefully get into the prison and ask him about it, like maybe at the last minute. Maybe that's when he gets mad and throws me out or something. But he ended up writing me a letter saying, you know, it's just like that cab driver I killed. And then he started going into detail. So this is a cold case that's never basically been solved. Um, and because, Lee, because Jeremy confessed, I kind of figured that was the end of it. We'd done enough research. Maybe he should be charged now. I brought it to the sheriff's office. They didn't want anything to do with it. Um, so now I'm going to go back into that case, talk to the family members, and just do another um, investigation because I want to just seal that deal. Because the, the um, Florida sheriff responsible for this case has basically said that um, they believe they tried the, wrong, the right guy who got acquitted, and he got acquitted on a technicality. That's what they said in their statement. You know what the technicality was? Their star witness got up on the stand in trial and said, everything I've told you is a lie. Uh, they're making me say this. The, de the detective, the lead detective in this case, had threatened to take away my children. And the, the, the entire trial collapsed and he was acquitted. And that's what the sheriff's office is calling a technicality. So I'm, I've got, yeah, I'm a little bit, um, up in arms about it, so I'm going back into it. <laughs> well, we're going to stay tuned, for, yeah, stay tuned for that. And Julie, your series, Perversion of Justice, was turned into a book, right, on Jeffrey Epstein, turned into a book by the same name. And in 2019, as we know, um, Epstein was found dead in a cell. Um, it's never been determined whether, even though the medical examiner ruled it was suicide, there are people who think, eh, not so fast. Yeah. Maybe not. Um, but, and then his longtime ex-girlfriend, Jelaine Maxwell, was sentenced, was it last year, to 20 years or so um, in, in prison for helping him abuse young girls. And I know it's hard for some journalists, at least, to toot their own home, but but, Julie, um, your determination to stay on this story was crucial, no? Mm, yes. <laughs> I will say... Go ahead, toot that horn. I will say that after my story um, sort of exploded, um, a lot of other, the New York Times being one, um, really jumped on the story, and there were more reporters on the story that I could even keep up with. I mean, reporters all over the world were covering this story, so uh, I was actually happy that more people were finally paying attention to it because I'm only one person, and I thought, you know, the, the goal is really to hold people accountable. The goal is to find some sense of justice, and, and in my mind, whoever can help do that, you know, the better, more people on there. But, um, but the question that I always get asked is, do I think that he committed suicide? And what I say is no, I don't think that he committed suicide. And I just don't think he would have been capable. And, you know, first of all, he had been, uh, he had been above the law for so long. He had worked the system. He considered himself a master at being able to manipulate people. I tell this story about how when these um, 
uh, civil lawyers were suing him. There were like 10 of them suing him on behalf of these victims. He got to know each one of those lawyers personally and he would meet with them and play head games with them. One lawyer he found out loved this certain kind of cookies that you could only get in New York. And he found out that he had a weakness for these cookies cookies. So when the lawyer went in to meet with Jeffrey Epstein, there was a spread as big as this table full of the cookies from New York. So he was not the kind of guy that was going to just say, especially so quick, I mean, he wasn't in jail that long when this happened. So I just don't think that it, it's possible. There were also a lot of holes in the scene where they found him. They removed his body before uh, authorities could see how it was found, which is a no-no. When you find someone dead, you're supposed to leave their body there. There was just so many things that didn't make sense. You had not only one guard allegedly not be paying attention and falling asleep, but two guards. The, the, the cameras weren't working. Uh, they moved, he was supposed to have a cellmate. They moved the cellmate out the night before. There was just too many questions. And the best thing that uh, New York authorities could do would be to really release all the evidence that they have because they decided it was a suicide. So it should be made public, all the information that they had. And to this date, it's never been made public. Thank you. So I think we have time for a few questions. I'm sure the panel would love to take your questions, so don't be shy. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. You said that this is for M. Wolf. The investigation is ongoing. Are you looking at the role that the former lieutenant governor, who's now governor, played in all of this? Absolutely. So the federal investigation is ongoing, the criminal investigation. Um, and actually, most recently, a, a, a new defendant pled guilty last week. Um, and so I think that we'll see that what kind of information that they can provide to federal prosecutors is what will, you know, uh, determine what goes on from here. So definitely following the developments of that. Um, as far as Tate Reeves' involvement, definitely um, you had mentioned uh, whether people <laughs> were getting better about not putting things in writing. I think that Tate Reeves was a little bit more careful about his text messages. Um, he was communicating with Brett Favre at the sort of near the beginning of his term uh, in 2020 about the volleyball project, and um, we're going to you know continue those those following those trails. And we've got some we've got some records requests out. I'll say that. Have you come across anything to indicate that the current governor is involved in this? I just go so, straight to the point. Yeah. It was, so we wrote a story back in the summer of last year um, regarding some text messages that we found where John Davis, the former director of the Department of Human Services, who was responsible for do doling out this money, um, had indicated that a particular project where money went to a, um, a personal trainer, a fitness trainer, who was putting on fitness courses for lawmakers and other people. Um, was the lieutenant governor's fitness issue, so indicating that that was his project that he was supporting. Um, he is friends with that person who was putting on those courses, and that person endorsed him for governor that year. Um, so, and we, we did write that story. I think there have been some calls within the civil suit that DHS is bringing to add Tate Reeves to that lawsuit. Um, and so a lot of that, I think, will be fleshed out, you know, through those court filings in the civil case. Thanks. There was a question down. Yes. Um, is that, and then, My question is for all of the panelists. Can you guys hear me? Yes. It's actually a twofold question, but the, the, the first... Can you speak me, up Jerry, a little bit? Excuse me? It's Can right. you speak up a little bit? So the yes. Yeah. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. So what is, you know, for all the panelists, what's some advice that you guys have for young investigative reporters who may be starting out in their careers? And the second part is, what is something that you guys wish you were told or wish you knew that you could possibly pass on to the younger generation of, of investigative reporters now? Oh, sure. I'm sorry, because you weren't paying attention to me. So. These investigative reporters, because I'm not actually a trained journalist. Um, and so I've, just listening to the, their process is just sure. stunning to me. Yeah, right. Um, but I, I'll say the, the, the best advice I can give to somebody young is 
something I learned when I was working on one of my books. Um, I was trying to get the records at the NAACP's Legal Defense Fund, and nobody had gotten them. No writers ever get in there. And I was begging them, just like writing them letters, just saying, I don't want a wide scope. I just want this one case. I know it's at the Library of Congress. I have it cataloged there. It's there. It's just behind this wall. If I could just get that folder. I was, and I did this for two years, writing to the director. And ultimately, they called me up and said, basically, okay, we'll give it to you. And which set off a firestorm because all these real historians and real investigative journalists were like, you gave it to that guy? Why, why don't I have it? You know, like what, we tried doing these requests. And the director said, you know what? You just had this way of being politely persistent that I really liked. Mm -hmm. And I just felt this guy is serious about it and he wants this and he seems like he's working hard. His letters are sincere. And, and, and that's, I think, why I got it. And so I've, I've just carried that with me using that technique instead of just saying, I, I, I have a right to these, these are mine, you know, and just putting, just be respectful about it, but be persistent and don't stop. And that was, I think, the most important lesson, because I've used that many times since to just sort of break people down with politeness. I think in a newsroom, I think my advice would be to listen, learn everything you can, don't come in the door acting like you know everything, because I gotta tell you, this is a different generation. And I deal with, you know, I'm a, a professor too, and I deal with younger people, and I'm like, they're gonna argue with me over something. I'm like, you've been doing this five minutes. Like, I know a little something, so that would be my advice. And in terms of, I think I have to agree with Gil, and, and I suspect Julie's gonna agree too. It's like, you gotta be persistent. Like, do not take no for an answer, because it is the job of public officials to keep information and things from us, but but also don't go in with an attitude. You know, there are times when you need to be in somebody's face, and there are times when you need to just, you know, remember um, that you they have something you want. That doesn't mean you should, you know, like they tell you no and you walk away. Absolutely not. I remember once I, when I was working on the Jack Johnson story, I went in with the beat reporter who was sort of the opposite of me. Um, she was really nice and lovely and, you know, polite. And we had requested these financial disclosure forms and we went and they were supposed to be ready and we went there and the woman said to her, she said, I'm sorry, they're not ready. And she was like, okay. I said, no, no, it's not okay. You said these would be ready. We're not leaving here without them. And we got them. So there are times, you know, when you have to be, but, but always professional. I don't swear at people. I don't yell at people, you know, I'm like Gil, it's like you, you get more if you're totally professional and polite, but also persistent and docket. Julie? Um, I would agree, uh, obviously, with that, but also I think that um, it's also good sometimes when you find another way to get the information they won't want to give you, because then when you point out to them, I've got, I'm getting this anyway, you might as well show me what the real facts are. Um, I think that, that that also makes a difference. I, th I think as a young journalist, I was a lot more hard, you know, a lot more, you know, you learn, you learn in time that it, a kinder, gentler approach works, but inevitably when you start out, you, you kind of want to prove yourself. So, you, you know, when you asked about what would you do differently, I probably would have been a little bit more patient with myself. You know, there, you have the pressures also of competitiveness, I would probably say don't worry about the competition. I think when you first start, you're always worried you're gonna get beat on a story. It's more important to get the story right and to tell the story well than it is to worry about getting it first. And it's also important to do whatever is asked of you. I can't tell you how many stories I did not want to do for whatever reason, I thought they were boring or you know whatever, but it's like it's really important for editors to see that, I mean, I had a reputation I like to think, and my friend Lisa Page is in the audience who worked with me for many years at the Post, and, and they would ask me to do so. I was happy to do it. It's like, okay, okay, and then I'd go home and go, crap, that was, you know, like, ugh. But you do it because the reputation I think I developed in that newsroom was, since Cheryl, she'll go. She's dogged. She's, she's like the most persistent people. Uh, person we know, like, she'll do it. She won't, you know, I never gave them an argument over it. Because the bottom line at the end of the day was, I learned a lot from it. I had a byline on the front page, and, you know, it got me here for better or for worse. Anna? 
So sort of in line with not worrying about the competition, I think it's really cool when reporters kind of pick a lane to some degree and become sort of a unique authority on a topic. Something that you're interested in, like follow what you're interested in, figure out what you care about, and do a story that no one is doing. Fi figure out what no one is reporting on and do that story and like, obviously persistence makes up for a lot, so just like, don't stop. Yeah, we were talking last night over dinner, Gil wasn't in yet, and we were talking about that, um, that persistence and how it just, and also that not everybody is cut out to be an investigative journalist, right? I mean, don't, people like to say, I'm an investigative journalist, really? Um, so don't feel like you can't do good journalism just because you don't have the title investigative behind it. So there was a question, yes, and then yes. Doo -doo. Perseverance really is amazing, and I'm just curious about if there's time, I have two questions, if there's times when the powerful are so good at erasing the truth and keeping you from telling the truth that it's just overwhelming, and these stories that you're talking about today are still continuing, so with the first question and with these stories, how do you ever let go? Mm -hmm. <laughs> He let go. You let go when he died. Impossible. You had to let go when he died. No, because then you had um, Gitlin Maxwell, you had Prince Andrew, you have, now you have um, uh, the Jess Staley, who was head of um, the bank, in, who Jeffrey did all his business with. Oh, They're the going Deutsche after bank. him, Deutsche Bank. Uh, I mean, the Jeffrey Epstein story is never going to go away. It's just mm -hmm. never. There's too much tentacles to the story, it just never does. You, the answer is, in my mind, you try to find other stories that'll make an impact because you know that that's what you want to do. And now that so many other journalists are on the Jeffrey Epstein story, I feel like I can kind of let them do it. And now I can try to find another story uh, that has impact like that. I think there have been times over the years when you're dealing with officials and they're trying to keep it from you. There might be a time when you do sort of question yourself and go, am I barking up the wrong? And you go, no, 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 they want me to think like that. You know, and you just have to remain steadfast and know that what you've got is solid. But the, yeah, they will, and they're good at it. They are good at it. Anna? Yeah, I think that um, gaslighting is a word that yeah. <laughs> um, describes that situation. I've just like leaned into um, like not caring about feeling foolish. So if I'm, you know, you said barking up the wrong, like I feel like that all the time. And I'm just like, I'm just going to do that. I'm just going to see, you know, and not really worry about it too much. Um, that was like one of the biggest challenges with DHS was them, them like convincing me basically that I didn't know what I was talking about, that I wasn't asking the right questions and that like I was being unreasonable. And I just stopped caring about feeling unreasonable. <laughs> they love to make you feel like you're asking stupid questions. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. But I always tell them, look, just explain this to me like, I guess it was in a movie or something, explain this to me like I'm your mother or something because I really don't understand what you're right. telling me. And if I don't, under, I always, I say this a lot too, mm -hmm. if I don't understand what you're talking about, then, you know, Mrs. Smith, who is, you know, paying her taxes, isn't going to understand what you're doing with this money. So it usually does kind of, yeah, the readers, it usually does kind of get them a little bit off their high horse when you kind of explain it to them like that. Mm -hmm. Did you want to add anything? Not really. I thought you guys said, said it very well. I mean, the, the one thing I'll just add to this is that these stories generally don't end for you. You know, like I got involved with the Groveland case and you know, the families were trying for exonerations for years, so you become involved in that. Um, and they're always gonna be a part of your life. I still hear from them today. Um, and so I think a lot of the stories I'm sure that you carry, the people that you meet, become part of your life. And I think that's part of your responsibility. You, you really need to accept the fact that, you know, this is not just one and done. This is a, you've, you've sort of been given the, the grace to tell this story. Um, but you better follow it all the way through and be there the whole way. You just can't just say, all right, that, that was great, now I'll move on to something else, not take their texts anymore. You, you're really involved, and um, I, I accept that. That's part of it. These are people that have greatly enriched my life with their experiences, and I, f I feel it's an honor to be attached still. Yeah, I mean, when Jack Johnson went to prison, I wrote the story when he was coming out, right? And then I wrote another story about what people thought about it. You know, you right. just do stay on it. There was a question, yes. Wondering, like, just a little bit more about um, 
Schofield, is that his name? Yes, he is um, Have you ever, like, met with him in person? Yeah, I've, I've interviewed him eight times, I think, in prison, and he's only supposed to get an hour, but because he's so well-regarded, they usually give us three hours with him, and I have multiple phone conversations with him. You know, one of the things I'll just say that I, th I was always impressed with, aside from the fact that he's never denied, you know, or he's never admitted that he was involved, and he's always claimed his innocence, you know, at, at, towards the end of the podcast, it's been four years that I've been working on this with him and, you know, the people around and, you know, he, at the end, before it was about to come out, he said, you know, Gilbert, I'm, I'm in prison. I, there's nothing I can give you. I can't thank you enough for spending this much time on my story and, and putting it out there. It may be my last hope because he knew that all his legal avenues have, have just expired. He's got nothing else. Um, he said, the only gift I can give you is that you will never have to worry about this story coming back and biting you. Um, that you got it wrong, that you were misled. I, I can give you that one gift. You never have to worry, you got the truth. And it's, when you see somebody look in your eyes and tell you that, you know, you'd have to be a, a sociopath to a level that I can't even understand to be able to say that to somebody. And, you know, those are the kind of things that just sort of make you feel like, all right, I think I got this right. Mm -hmm. It was, oh. Without the um, parole or whatever, when, does he, like, when is he said to be able to get out of prison? Well, that's an interesting thing about the Florida parole system. You may never get out of prison. Yeah. I mean, it's, they can just keep denying you yeah. um, for any reason. They can just say he's not showing remorse. They can make up, there's no rules about this. The, the, the parole is considered a grace from the state. It's not a right. Um, so he's got 25 to life. Um, he served 25 10 years ago. Um, they can keep him in for life. I mean, they could literally do that, and you know, they've tried it a few times, and hopefully something's different because of this story, that we're hoping. So he needs a sympathetic uh, member of the parole board. Right, and I'll just tell you, he does have one so far. Um, we, we had some meetings, so it's just about getting another one. Mm -hmm. Okay, there was a question over here. Thank you for that. There's a question, yes, sir. Yes, I'd like to uh, get back to the uh, part of the racing truth that you mentioned um, everybody here on the panel is uh, using a lot of technology, let's say. In other words, uh, when you would previously go to research or source anything, you would go to the archives. You'd go to the courthouse. Now you're talking about email, texts, things like that. Now, the other thing is your, your stories, because of the technology, have gotten out quicker. You have a podcast. You're talking about reporters from around the world came to see it, as well as the tennis scam. Well, let me ask you this. Does it ever, you know, do you think about the technology as you're writing these stories, or is that just a, like a typewriter? Also, is the ease of gaining access to some of these sources over the internet, does it ever contribute to any thinking of yourself and saying, boy, since it's so easy to get to, it would be real easy to ban it. Easy to play. I'm sorry. Hey, right now and simply erase. Well, you'd have to also ban people's memories of everything, too. I mean, I, I, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie All the President's Men, which was about Watergate. You know, every now and then when I'm switching the channel, it comes on and I'll stop and watch it, even though I've seen it a million times. And really, when you really watch that movie, if you're a reporter, you could relate to all the techniques that they used. And they were running to pay phones. They didn't have cell phones. You know, they're taking notes. They're not recording anything. But the same kind of tried and true techniques in getting information from people, getting documents from people. Yeah, sure, there's a different you know, ease now with certain things that, for example, governments now publish on their websites that, you know, we don't have to go in and, and you know, get the 
physical documents. But I still think that there's going to still be a way. It might get harder as more things are banned and more things are erased from um, you know, some of these government websites. You know, I'm in Florida and uh, Governor DeSantis is now really trying to erase a lot of history in Florida and a lot of documents. And every time we have, everybody always explains, Florida has the best public records law in the country. Well, that, that's not gonna be for long because the way that he does it now is, by law we can get the records, but he still denies them, and we, or he'll either charge us $25,000 for a file, which we can't afford as newspapers these days, or really, really very few media can afford that kind of money, or he says no, and then we have to take them to court, so we have to hire lawyers, and that costs us more money. So there's this chilling effect that is going on anyway with this information. So. You know, I guess I'm an optimist. I think we're still going to find the truth always comes out. I always say that even in the Jeffrey Epstein case. We might know, not know exactly what happened to him now, um, but I think eventually the truth will come out. I really do believe in the truth. Yes, ma'am. We have one more um, question. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, one, one question. Sir. Well, she had the final, she'll have the final question. On this question, Bill um, 2346, Senate Bill 2346 is actually trying to ban online resources right now, and they're working on it. Um, they are defunding, attempting to defund, and they've got a list of words that you won't be able to find in databases in the state. The Magnolia is the resource for the state of Mississippi. And so sex trafficking could easily become something you couldn't find for school children, for people in the public libraries. I'm the a library dean at MUW, so I'm following this actively, but it's happening. How long, um, they're they're trying to how long do you think the Sovereignty Commission files will remain online? Yeah. What was the name? Number? Yeah. 2346. Well, and 2346. Where does people are reading newspapers anymore? and where we used to report on those things and people used to actually read newspapers, they would know about them before it happened so that, that there could be a stop put to it. So now there's all these things like that that you just mentioned are happening that people don't even know is happening. And then when they go in their own lives to try to get information, then they're surprised that they can't get it. Well, I wanna thank the panelists for joining us this morning and I wanna thank all of you for coming to spend part of your Saturday with us. Thank you guys. Um, thank you, Cheryl. I think we're... Yeah, a couple other things before we, before we wrap up. Um, we're gonna, Rena's gonna draw for tickets here and uh, for the door prizes. I do wanna let you know Lemuria has books for sale and they're here with everybody's book. And then there are also food trucks outside. Um, trying to think anything else? Anything else? Or is John around? Anything else I need to say? The food truck is in front of the building. It's in front of the building. Also open. And if you haven't gotten a survey, we'll, we'll give that to you as well. You ready to draw? Has everyone gotten a ticket? Got a few people that are coming down to get them. Ralph is even getting one. You better get your ticket.
McKenna Randy Gray, and uh, she's the the next panel is, is really about you know erasing LGBTQ books and um, and and talk about the damage of that and, and and the harm from that, and we appreciate you guys doing this, and so this is fantastic, and so please welcome uh, McKenna and uh, and her panel. Thank you. Yeah, come on. Hello, as Jerry said, I'm McKenna Rainey Gray. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm with the ACLU of Mississippi. I don't know if any of you thought you were coming to trivia, but I have some trivia questions if you would like to play. I have two books to give away. Uh, do you mind going to the next slide? Also, what's your name? Mike, thank you. Please go to the next slide. Right, so first we've got trivia. I've got free books. Be excited. Then we've got two people that are gonna join me for the panel discussion, and we're gonna talk for probably 15 minutes about some of the questions that I've gotten ready. Then we're opening it up to questions from y'all, and on the last slide, I've got some resources and ways that you can take some of the information that we're sharing with you and put it into action. Mike, next slide. All right, so. Since you didn't know you were at Trivia, I figured I had to tell you what we're doing. We've got a few questions, and like I said, there's Gender Queer by Maya Kebab with E-M Air pronouns, so I'd like to thank M for air contribution of this book, and All Boys Aren't Blue by George M. Johnson, so I'd like to thank them for their contribution of this book. And on the next slide is the questions, so go to that. Would you prefer to read in silence? That is my preference. I'll give you all a few minutes to look at these. Does anybody need more time? Okay, let's go to the next slide. That was to make sure that I did not accidentally reveal the answers yet, so we can go to the next one after that. All right. So the first one was C, second one is B, third one is B, fourth one is A, fifth one is D. Um, did anybody get all five right? Well, that was easy. We have two winners, and one of them is a panelist. Which one do you want, Dana? Hey. 
All right, well, I do have some more information about the, those. Um, okay, I'll just read it to you. So, to actually go one more slide, because I think I have the pictures. There we go. So, Two Boys Kissing won a 2014 Lambda Literary Award and was a 2014 Stonewall Honor Book. It was challenged due to its cover image of Two Boys Kissing and for inclusion of sexually explicit LGBT content and for condoning public displays of affection. So that one's in the bottom left. The second one I'm gonna skip till the next slide. Third one was I Am Jazz by Jazz Jennings. It was, it's a picture book. <laughs> oh, go back again. Yeah, it's a picture book. And uh, just for reference, all of the books that were listed are also stories about trans teens. So if I was your girl, I am Jazz and I am Jay. And the I am Jazz is in the top left. So the postmaster of the city of Los Angeles ordered federal postal authorities to seize one, the homosexual magazine, which is in the top middle, informing the publisher that he considered it obscene, lewd, lascivious, and filthy, and non-mailable under federal law. It was called, the lawsuit that went to the Supreme Court was called One Inc. v. Olson from 1958. And the other two answers were a lesbian paperback novel, Women's Barracks. I just want to point out that is a real book. There was a uh, genre of lesbian paperback novels in the 1950s. And the third answer was a comic book. But the Comics Code Authority um, had an in, they, they had informal rules that they followed for private publishing, and they prohibited gay characters for a really long time. So there wouldn't have been any gay comic books to seize in the 50s. And then the uh, fifth question was asking which books were banned, and it was A Day in the Life of Marlon Bundo, which is a gay romance parody of former Vice, Vice President Mike Pence's Rabbit, which I just think, think is hilarious. And then Sex is a Funny Word, which is a, which is a sex education comic book. And a picture book called Prince and Knight, which is a sweeping epic romantic adventure that features two men as the leads when a prince and a knight fall in love. So that, I just really like the visual representation of the things that people are saying are so horrible that kids can't read them. All right, and on the next slide, a 2022 report from PEN America found that more than 1,600 books were banned and 41% of those were targeted due to LGBTQ content. If you're confused about why those numbers don't add up to 100, it's because many of the books had multiple categories. And for the 2022 data, it was 40%, but in 2019, eight of the top 10 banned books featured LGBTQ characters. So that's just a little level, level setting about where we're at. The next slide has a, um, we do not need a tiebreaker, which delights me because if, if this had gone on, it was gonna be rock, paper, scissors. Um, but the, oh, go back to the tiebreaker question. I just think people will be interested. It was um, what Mississippi author wrote a book that is frequently challenged due to depictions of racial tension and homosexuality. So that's the color purple. We can claim her as a Mississippi artist. All right, now for the panel part. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear you? Maybe. <laughs> Probably. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. So now it is the panel portion. Congratulations, you made it to round two. I am McKenna Rainey Gray, and we're gonna do name, pronouns, organization, and position. So I'm McKenna Rainey Gray, pro pronouns are she, her. I'm with the ACLU of Mississippi, and I am the LGBTQ staff attorney. Dana, would, no, Tanya is next on the slide. Tanya, would you go? I am Tanya Johnson, my pronouns are she and her, and I'm the director for the Madison County Library System. Dana? My name is Dana Bolden, my pronouns are they, she, he, and I'm a Jack Jackson Public School um, student at Jim Hill High School. What grade are you in? I'm 11th grade. Cool, and then I also wrote optional is relevant identities, so I'm bisexual. Tanya, how do you fit into this? Uh, I am an ally of the LGBTQ community. You have allowed me to say that you are the token ally of the panel, just because that makes yes. me giggle. And Dana, do you have any relevant identities that you want to share? I'm pansexual and I am gender fluid. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so now you know who we are, so that you can um, value our opinions accordingly once we start talking. So the first question, since this is called um, why it happens and how it hurts for erasing LGBTQ identities, is why are LGBTQ books banned 
Tanya, I think I'm going to start with you and see if you have any thoughts from a librarian perspective. So, as a librarian, it's my job to make sure that I serve everyone in my community. And it's my job to provide the tools, the resources, the information that they need to be their best selves. And because my community is diverse and we're not all the same, we all look different, we all have different stories, um, that means that what we need is, is different. So um, it's important to me that I provide you know, a diverse and inclusive collection. I think what we see from the challenges and for me, I think it grows a lot out of fear. People are um, afraid of, of what's different, what doesn't align with how they, their worldview. And especially when it comes to our children, um, they're afraid of having conversations with, with their children. And they don't know how to maybe answer questions or, or they're afraid of, of having to discuss ideas that are, are different from their own. But um, I think that these stories, these books that are being challenged are actually a way to have those conversations. They are a pathway to us to, to have a conversation. Just because something makes us feel uncomfortable and it might be hard to have a conversation, especially with young people, um, it doesn't mean that we don't need to have those conversations. Acting like it does, some, uh, an issue doesn't exist doesn't make it go away. And we really need to use these stories as a tool to have those conversations and, and to really help us to understand and and to see that we're all part of a of a community that we're that we all belong to that that's and I think it's I really think a lot of it is built out out of fear I think the first part of your answer sounded like LGBTQ books are banned because they exist in the libraries you were talking about the reasons that you have them in the libraries in the first place and I think it's just important to point out that in a lot of libraries you still do have access to these kind of books in the first place Yes, absolutely. So um, I think that this is something that we, we're seeing challenges across the country for sure, but we also are seeing librarians and students and um, community members stand up and, and say, no, we need to have these, sto these stories. These people are, you know, everyone is part of our community and everyone's story deserves to be told. And we all need access to um, this information because starting, you know, targeting one particular group and saying those stories don't deserve to be told leads us to targeting other groups. We have to, that's, that's something that we have to keep in mind that it doesn't end with just this one particular group. It leads us to, well, you know, what other groups or ideas or thoughts, you know, do I find offensive or do I find, you know, contrary to my own, and, and that's, that's a dangerous, slippery slope that we end up on. And Dana, as a student, do you have thoughts, especially being in a public school environment? Mm, from my point of view, I think books are banned because, like she said, fear, and also because of, we're seen as aliens in this country. We're just like everybody else. We don't look any, any different or sound any different. We're still human, but because I want to hold hands with a girl, I'm seen as some strange, obscure thing instead of a human, instead of a person. And a lot of our humanity is stripped away when people find out that we are um, identified as queer or trans. And since we're from Mississippi, which we all know is the Bible Belt, I know from my point of view as a black gay person that my intersectionality is always there. Even though I walk into a room, the first thing you see is my skin's over. But in my community, the first thing they see is, oh, she like girls. Mm, I don't know how I feel about that. God said, God said. But I believe that if we're all made in God's image and God created us all, why, how he made me, why is the way he made me an issue? Like, that's how I feel. And I really think the fear of learning and letting go of old ways is really a reason why people, like, try to ban all these books because as we know, we have a lot of older people in our lives and they're very stuck and stern on the ways and how they think. 
and they don't like to think that they're wrong or like they don't like when changes are made because change is scary but at the same time they'll see that it's affecting somebody close to them and it really doesn't even like budge any type of thought process in them. Do you think that that's a generational change that as people get older and we have younger people coming into power, do you think that that's gonna be less of an impulse towards censoring these kinds of books? Do you think that just generational change is gonna improve? Oh, for sure. Like as younger people are getting into office and standing up and as I'm sitting here today, like as a young person, we are making changes that people before us, like even gay people been been existing. But we, we live in a society where it has not always been easy or we're not able to talk about it. Mm -hmm. But now that as time's going on, it's changing, we have more people that are able to stand up and say, like, this is not right. This is why we should have this. I deserve this health care. I deserve this, that, and third, because I'm still human. And I think as generations go on, we just need more and more younger people to step out and stand up because that's who are going to make the change. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to use a moderator privilege and talk about this as a little bit. So I'm the LGBTQ staff attorney, so a lot of what I do is uh, legal work, legal aid clinic for LGBTQ people, impact litigation, advocacy, work in the session, educational things. But from, from a legal perspective, the idea that you can, as a school board, as a policymaking body, you can decide what is in what is in the libraries is not exactly how it's meant to work. And we have sent a letter to all of the schools in Mississippi, like yesterday, saying this is what your legal obligations are for keeping library books available. And it's a seven page letter letting people know what it is that they have to do, what it is that they can and can't do, and just giving them advice, particularly since a lot of these school districts have not, it's not like they have an attorney on retainer that they can ask to write a 50 page memo, but what their legal obligations are for this. So we're just trying to give a lot of the, all of the school districts, particularly some of the ones that have fewer resources, information from the get go, so that if they do start having people bring challenges to the library, they can already know what it is that they can and can't do. Um, and we've also made a Parents Against Censorship Advocacy Toolkit that we've put online, and that is another way that we can organize people because a lot of the people on the, the right, so I guess I should also talk about why are LGBTQ books banned. It's not usually because uh, one person in each city independently reads a book, creates their own opinions of it, and then decides this is not something I want any child in this school district to read. It is usually a concerted, right-wing effort telling people, we have read these books so you don't have to, and on page 57 and 32 and 719 are these offensive parts. So you should go, go forth into all of your school districts and try and get these books removed. So we're trying to assist with people who value these books and think that they should be available. They, they don't think that one parent should be able to dictate what all of the other parents in the school district can, can have their kids access. So the Parents Against Censorship Advocacy Toolkit is trying to give parents uh, some resources so that they can learn how to attend school board meetings. Um, I've been to some school board meetings where people say just really horrible things about um, queer kids and trans kids and, and what it is that they think should happen and maybe we should go back to um, when like homosexuality being outlawed and just all sorts of really really backwards to me things. Like that's not the direction that I was hoping our country was going in. So if we can have other people that have been trained a little bit on how to take the mic and attend school board meetings, share and organize their, their opinions, then I think we have a better shot of making sure that these books don't get challenged just because the only voices that the school boards are hearing are people who are very vocally against it. All right, we can go to the second question. What is the harm when LGBTQ books are banned and to Either of you, who wants to go first? Um, as a queer kid growing up, I didn't know that being a gay was a thing. Like I knew that, ooh, she was pretty, I like her, I wanna hold her hand, but I didn't know that, oh, there's an actual name for it or an actual identity for it. And I didn't think it was a bad thing, I thought it was normal, I thought every girl liked the other girl. I have the exact same experience. I, I was at a certain age when I realized not everybody think that, thinks that women are beautiful. Like, oh, yeah. this is not a normal, like, it's not a normal thing, what is normal. But I was, I can remember back to fourth grade and there was a girl in my class, I was like, she's pretty. I like her. I wanna write her a book. <laughs> I wanna draw and color a picture. And you know, when people look at 
the LGBT kids, they think, oh, sexualize this, sexualize that. Nothing about it is sexualized until you bring in that sexualized expert. All I'm thinking is she's pretty. I want to hold her hand. I like her earrings. And from that, what is sexual inherently about it? Nothing. So when these books are banned, it takes away the right to understand and to decipher our identities. Like I, for the longest time, I was like, what am I? Like, I like this, I like that. How do I tell people, how do I navigate that? And a lot of, a lot of ways that I was able to pinpoint my identity, I was able to read. I was able to look into other kids who were like me, other adults who were like me, older generations that were like, I didn't get this opportunity, so here are some resources I found along the way. Here. And when these books are banned, we don't have that opportunity. We, and a lot of people don't realize that when LGBT kids are not able to access the things they need, mental health is a very, very, thing, very large thing that plays a part of it. Trans kids or kids who don't realize they're gay, or are, they do realize that they're gay, but don't have support, it really takes a toll on mental health. And I know that from a firsthand experience. Because for the longest time, I felt trapped, and I didn't know I could talk about or think about these things because I thought it was wrong. And I, felt, I realized that and I learned that it's, nothing's wrong with me. Nothing's wrong with me because I have these books to read. So there is no reason that these books should be banned. Thank you. I think that really well summarizes the, I'm not going to say you represent the whole student perspective, but for, for your, your perspective, I think that that is exactly the like type of um, that, that's why we're trying to protect this, is so that people can come to terms with their own um, experiences and reality and identity in a way that is safest through a book. So I, I appreciate you sharing that. It's something that we talk about all the time in the, in the library world, that it's important to have representation, that it's important that um, you be able to walk into the library, open up a book, and see yourself. Um, and, and I think Dana said it perfectly why she needs that representation. But I also, from the perspective of someone who's not a member of the LGBTQ community, those books are also for, for us as well. Because I need books that look like me, that have similar stories, that tell me the same things that, that what Dana sees in those books. But I also need books that show me someone else, that show me people like Dana, or you know, that open up other worlds and other people's stories to me. Because that's where we find common ground. That's where we realize that you know, we have our differences, but really, we're all very much the same. And I think she said it really well that you know, she was created by God the way that she was created. It's the same for all of us. And when we read those stories about people whose, whose stories are different or whose lives are different, we also find that we also have a lot in common. We all want our families you know, to, to do well and, and to be happy and to be loved and to have kindness. And, and it's in those, those things that we share that are most important. It's not those differences that, that we need to focus on, but it's on those things that, that we have in common. That's what makes us a community. That's what makes us, um, that's, our, that's where our humanity lies. And you know, to me, that's what's important um, about having a diverse and inclusive collection because I want people to know that you know we're all in this together. You know, we're not all the same, but ultimately we're all in this together, and we share so much more than than you know than our differences, and and that's what's important to me. I I think both of those answers make a lot of sense, and also to to pull back, we've got the we've got the really concrete examples of like students in schools that want to be able to experience um, characters and grapple with things in a way that it can often be easier from a third party perspective to read somebody else going through something and figure, figure out how it affects you. Um, but we also, pulling back, have a really um, amorphous dignitary harm that's happening whenever we have people that are discussing the humanity of queer people or trans people in school board meetings or board of aldermen meetings and you just have a, an issue with the 
it's just in the air where people feel like it's okay to say things that are really cruel and dehumanizing about other people. So you've got the like specific harm of people being limited in their access to read and learn and experience new things. And then you've also just got a normalizing of publicly discrimination, discriminating against people for who they are and saying, I don't even want my child to know that you exist. I don't want them to accidentally stumble upon the idea that you could be real. And I certainly don't want my kid to realize they are that. Well, and when you, you throw around words like pornography and pedophile or groomer to describe someone's story just because it's different from yours, um, you're saying that about that person. To me, th these stories, these books, they represent people. They represent somebody's lived experience. And to try to erase that or to try to dehumanize that, you're, you're doing that to that person. And it's, it's, I don't think it's something that I would, that they would say directly to a person if they had a chance to sit down and talk to them and realize just, you know, who they are and, and, and how much they have in common. But they can do that with a story. And it, but what you're really saying is your story doesn't, shouldn't be told. You sh you're not welcome here. And, and that's wrong. That's not, that's not how we're supposed to, to treat each other. And it's not how we're supposed to, to live our lives by, by going and, and trying to erase somebody's story. I mean, it's how, it's who they are. It's how, it's what they've lived. I don't understand how people can deny that. And if we go to the next slide, it should be just the Q&A portion now. So we've talked about our two things. Um, the banned book bookmarks should be in everybody. Yeah, you've got yours out. They should be in everybody's uh, goodie bags. And we were supposed to have the two stickers on the left-hand side, and they did not. They were delayed in shipping. So I'm so sorry you don't also have those two stickers. Um, there is a Trans Day of Visibility that's on April 1st, so a week from today in Jackson. So I'll have them there. Come see me at a table, and we'll, we'll give you those. But if anybody has any questions now, you've got an attorney, a librarian, and a student, and we can answer some of your LGBTQ book-related questions if you've got them. Yeah. I'm going to repeat your question. Why would they ban books if it makes kids want to read them more? Yeah. That's an interesting perspective. So your argument is that it makes kids want to read books because they have been isolated as something that is forbidden. Um, I like that. I'll, I'll take that and I'll put it in my pocket as a silver lining for sure. Um, anybody else have any thoughts on that? It's like telling a child not to touch a hot stove and they go and do it anyway. That's right. You're, that's making, you're prompting me to want to do it even more. Yeah. Why are you Forbidden to, fruit. Why are you trying to stop me from doing this? <laughs> so now, I'm going to do it anyway. There's a, a part of a legal opinion in Counts v. Cedarville, which we have talked about before, and it says that you should not, stigma, the stigmatizing effect of having a book removed and put in like a restricted section or parental consent only, um, and that that stigmatizing effect is something that you should consider when you're deciding whether or not this is a constitutional um, uh, like restriction on someone's right to read and learn and access materials. So I, I think that that's a counterweight to it's stigmatizing to have books that are set aside as different, but also it just makes you want to read them more and figure out what it is that's so bad. I do think that, I mean, that's true though, especially for like the, the people that those books represent, the idea that if I want to read a story that looks like me, I have to have special permission or I have to go about that in a different way than someone else. That, that is a stigma and it's, it's, it's putting that, you know, there's something wrong with you kind of label on there. But, um, but at the same time, you know, when someone says, oh, this is a little too spicy or a you know, little too whatever for you, you know, th this is too grown up for you. It's like a challenge that, well, I'm going to, I'll show you, I'm going to read that. So it, it works both ways. Yes, you. Um, so I want to hear your thoughts on, um, so a lot of people are talking about um, the trend of um, more queer people coming out, young people in particular. And having uh, grown up, I grew up in Mississippi, with Mississippi, graduated from Mississippi Public Schools. Um, and when I was growing up, like nobody was out, not even like cis, you know, white men were out. You know, it's like nobody was. Um, and and so, 
But from, from my perspective, like as a, I would say a beneficiary of the younger generation, really being insistent on this, and me having a lot of um, benefited from self-understanding that I didn't have as a kid. Like I just didn't, like we didn't have um, stories that reflected anything other than a very strict gender binary, and then, you know, you know. And so I guess I, I would just love to hear you talk a bit about that uh, dynamic of. Of, of, of I think what um, you know what we're benefiting from from previous civil rights generations and and then the backlash that we're seeing not that, that narrative of, of you know the trend that um, you know, that young people are like confused or something and they don't know themselves when actually I think that they're way more aware than we were. I'm going to repeat it as best I can just for, for into the microphone. So you were discussing you being a beneficiary of younger folks coming out more. And also when you and I were in school, even if it was at different times, I also didn't have any queer people that were like out um, in high school. So there's some trends that you're pointing out where um, it is more common for people to be out and there are more stories that are told that we can reference to. Does that kind of... Got it. So you're also talking about that contagion theory, where there, some people are saying that you're only coming out as bi or queer or trans because you've been exposed to it. Okay, right. I think I've... You've uh, been indoctrinated. Is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I wish I'd known all that. And I, I just, to, I will turn it over in just a second, but just to start the scene that people have done research into the contagion theory to figure out, are there like hot pockets where people are just popping up and identifying this, that, and the other, and it's, it, there's no like evidence for it. It's, it's just the societal acceptance has heightened over time, even if we are in a really damaging time of um, LGBTQ attacks, the societal acceptance has uh, really come a long way, which is in one, some of the ways, the reasons that we're getting attacked. So because people are more able to be freely themselves, they're just saying, you know, you're right, I am in this category. So I'll turn it think, over. Well, I think she, the answer is actually in her question. Their question. That she know said, their pronouns. you know, she said that um, insane, insane, there weren't very many people who were out at the time. Well, exactly. They were still queer. They just weren't out. Yeah. They. It, it's not that there's a um, a huge surge or influx or whatever indoctrination of people um, to suddenly question it. It's that freedom to be who they really are, and I think that's that's the answer. The answer is in the question. And I am also a beneficiary of all of the young people. So as a young person, what are your thoughts? Well, I can bring a different perspective from two different communities, since I'm very much black and I'm very much queer. And those things don't, one doesn't stop because the other one is taken front. They exist at the same time. And since I'm from a very Southern family, a very Christian family, and in a very black family, <laughs> the older generation will look at you and like, why? Is it because little Johnny, is it because, uh -huh. like, no, I just, I've been this way. I just never felt comfortable because of the way that you talk about other people in front of me to ever express myself. And so I learned to like brush off their opinions like in sixth grade. I was like, forget it. Bro, you, like nothing's gonna change. I'm still gonna be fruity. Then nothing's <laughs> still gonna be fruity is what, she, what they said. <laughs> it's nothing gonna change. And so I think the problem is stemming back from like in our community, stemming back from like generations of like bringing in slavery and racial inequality and whatnot, we are. They think they how they, I feel like they see it as we already have such a difficult time as a black community thriving in this country. They don't want you to add another layer of oppression on top, so they try to push it down or pretend like it doesn't exist because you are already fighting to just be black in America, mm -hmm. exist in an equal society. But it's like even even with that. My identity is still here. Mm -hmm. They exist within each other. 
you cannot be, it's very inclusive. Like, mm -hmm. there's nothing like, oh, I'm black here, so my queerness is down there. Oh, I'm queer today, so I'm, I'm just my blackness to the side. You have to identify and acknowledge that both identities exist within each other in order to, like, grow. And the um, contagion theory is a very, very big thing in the community. I have a cousin, we're, me and my cousin, we're around the same age, she's 15, I'm 17, and we both, well, she didn't have to come out because they always assumed that she was a little, because of how she dressed, she was a little tomboy. But when I came out, it was like, <laughs> you didn't see that coming? I was like, it was very obvious, bro. When I was looking at the girls, I was looking at the girls too. Like, what? Are you? <laughs> Just because I dress femininely or I dress, I look like a first lady sitting up here. Just because I dress <laughs> like this, does it deter the fact that who I'm attracted to is who I'm attracted to? Who you, whatever you dress like, I could dress like Superman. That don't mean I'm not still fruity. Mm -hmm. Like, and they'll be like, well, why are y'all, what made you become gay? I didn't, nothing made me become gay. I was born like this. But because was, you were both tuck coming out around yeah, the same time. I was, it was, you know, when I first came out, you know, October 25th, 2005, and God sprinkled a little fruity on me. Yeah, I was already <laughs> that, just, just sprinkled a little bit. So it doesn't, there's nothing contagious about it. We just find a community and like, okay, I feel safe enough to talk about this. In middle school, I had a best friend. It was me and her, and nobody like when I, nobody was coming, like nobody came out anything. We were the first two to come out, and once everybody else started getting comfortable with the identity, and there was like a domino effect. Everybody was like, so all of a sudden, everybody just gay. <laughs> no, they're just finally comfortable enough to share the identity because we decided, well, bump it. I don't care what you think. I like girls. Mm. And everybody else just decided to follow suit. Yeah. It's not indoctrination. It's creating a safe space for yeah. you to feel like you can be yourself. So, I mean, if it was indoctrination, you, you wouldn't have ever come out in the first place. It would have changed you to not be who you are. Right? At this point, if it's indoctrination, I might as well start a cult. <laughs> if I can choose to be, I think about it as, why would I choose more oppression? Yeah. I'm discontent in this state. We are in other history. Why do I, why would I choose to add a little more, a little zest on top? That's not, that wasn't in my game plan. Mm -hmm. I didn't decide to be black, just like I decided to be gay. I was born like that. That's how it is. And I love who I am. I, love, I like that I'm chocolate skinned. And I like that I like women. <laughs> so there's nothing that, nobody can make me feel bad about that. I learned that from middle school, and I'm sitting here at junior high school getting ready to go to college. And I think all day, on, all day, every day on Instagram, I'm just posting about, that's a bull, that's a bull. Well, I'm still gay. I don't care what they think. They passing this bill. That doesn't change the fact that I'm gender fluid. Mm. I, that's because y'all conservative ways and the stuck-in-a-box thinking is I, it, it's just not sitting right with my spirit. I feel like we're in, a, we're in 2023. I feel like it's time for a change. Like even in Mississippi, we are a state that have a very diverse community. I'm from Jackson where we have an 85% black population, the second blackest city in the country. And I feel like we're still not as accepting or as, uh, as harrowing to other communities. Like don't, they, I don't see that Within my black community, I don't see that we have a lot of support from within because I feel like we're already pushed down as a community. Why push us down even more? And that's why it is beneficial for individual people to have access to books and yes, get some very much. Resources. Well, I think we should go to the next slide just so I can point you to some resources. You've had your hand up a long time. If it is a quick question, we can ask it. Otherwise, like, meet me at the. All right, what's your question? Just what do you think about the future of this? Like, where do you see this going? Do you see this continuing to spread? Do you see opportunities to make change in terms of the issues you're talking about about banning books? Perfect. We'll get slide. <laughs> I got this. So um, I do think that this is probably something that's going to continue as a hot spot and an issue, at least through the next presidential election, just in terms of where the focus is and how many anti-LGBTQ bills have been proposed, which was on a slide a while back. We actually had an ACLU tracker for bills, and um, it's, it's definitely a big issue. It's definitely something that we're going to be fighting for a while. But if you want to go to the ACLU's website, if you follow the QR code that's on the bookmark, 
that gets you to the Right to Read and Learn campaign where you can sign a pledge. We've got the Your Guide to Combating Classroom Censorship, which is kind of aimed at students. We've got the Parents Against School Censorship Advocacy Toolkit, which is directed at parents and guardians. And then also on our website, but not at the QR code, we have an LGBTQ reporting guide. And uh, on I think on the agenda, you can shout out your librarian. Um, we didn't talk about House Bill 1315 and 2346, but there are some bills that would make it hard for librarians to be able, libraries to be able to have um, access to databases. So we've put the Lieutenant Governor's email address up there. If you want to take a picture of the slide and send in what you think about libraries, please do that. And I just put our ACLU social stuff. So I think that wraps us up. Did everyone have a good meal? You did? Tummy's full? Eyes still open? Ears open? Do we need to get up and do some jumping jacks so we can get some energy going on here? <laughs> Too soon? <laughs> 
We're not swimming, Stuart. <laughs> well, we are so happy that you're here. So happy that you were here during the first sessions, that you're here now. These are exciting, exciting times and wonderful information and wonderful action items. But we're gonna do a little bit of housekeeping real quick. Most of you that I see have been here already and you're familiar with our schedule, but also on the back is the survey. Is there anyone currently in the, in, in the office? I am still jet lagged. Is there anyone currently here that does not have one? Okay, we have two, because we really would love your input. So on the back, actually there's two, three more. Uh, we need your input about all the sessions. So please, when you fill it out and you're ready to leave, not too soon. You put it right at this desk, right in front here, okay? The other thing, please join us. We do door prizes. So if you were here earlier, you would have seen Marshall Ramsey's wonderful cartoon art that he does for our Mississippi Band Books Festival. We had one drawing, we're getting ready to have two. So is there anyone that does not have a ticket yet? One, two, three, four, five. Do we have some over here? So you just tear off the one that says keep this coupon, hand it back the other part to us, So we're going to go ahead and pull one door prize now. So Mr. Jerry Mitchell, Mr. Jerry Mitchell, if we can get your assistance, please. Okay, shake it all up. Oh no, I did the last time. Go ahead. Oh, you want me to do it? Yes. Okay. All right. I'm pulling out. All right. Here you go. I have to put my glasses on. All right. 825614. 825614. Did someone? 8256614. 8256614. Uh, going, going once, twice. Okay, we'll pick another one. Yeah, eight two five six one four. If y'all have one of those. All right. Eight two five six four two. Kind of like bingo, isn't it? <laughs> Anybody else? Six four two. All right, going once, twice, all right, one more time. Uh, eight, two, five, six, zero, six. Bingo! Bingo! 
We have a winner from West Point. <laughs> 606. So we just had our bingo session, and we're going to move right into our wonderful afternoon session of the Mississippi Band Books Festival. We are thrilled. We're thrilled for the whole session today, but we are doubly thrilled for this session because I get to be with a lot of people I know, a lot of you out there but with one very special lady who I call a friend. But we also call her the First Lady of Jackson. And we also call her Dr. Ebony Lamumba. Please welcome Dr. Ebony Lamumba. She is going to be with us. She is going to be having a conversation with one of her friends and one of our favorite authors, and that's Angie, the Angie Thomas. So without further ado, because our time, I've gotten too much into the time, I'm going to let Dr. Lumumba start because you know Angie Thomas, from The Hate You Give, is one of the authors that books have been banned like crazy. So, without further ado, thank you for starting this session. Thank you, Rena, my homegirl, my neighbor, my queen. Good afternoon. I hope to feel some more good energy in this room. It's my privilege to introduce to you another homegirl of mine. And if you all are not familiar with that terminology, those are people that are from where we are from, right? That we are proud to be associated with. They're kinfolk, as we call them. But none other than the incomparable Angie Thomas, who was born right here in Mississippi. She is a native Jacksonian, so I love her just a little bit more. No shade to other places in Mississippi, because you're in my heart, too. She's a former teen rapper. I don't know if you all knew that. And I always bring it up because I think it's dope. And I think it's just a lovely accolade to have on your resume that I wish I had. She has a Bachelor of Fine Arts from right here at Bellhaven, right across town, uh, right across the street, really. Uh, so she is a daughter of Jackson in more ways than one. She uh, grew up in the Georgetown neighborhood where uh, my, half of my family is from. So she's truly a homegirl. And she has an unofficial degree in hip hop. Again, just another dope accolade for our girl. Her debut novel, The Hate You Give, which I hope that you have read, and if not, after today, that you will purchase and read, started as her senior project in college, which I think speaks volumes about the potential of the work that those of us who are educators, our students are doing, and how it can chart their futures and change the world. It debuted as a number one, as number one on the New York Times bestseller list. So not only did I hope, I think she got an A on that project. <laughs> at Bellhaven, but uh, it's, a, it's a phenomenal text. You Give was also adapted into a film by Fox 2000 in 2018, and it starred Amanda Stenberg and was directed by George Tillman. Her second novel, On the Come Up, uh, another stellar uh, text, was also number one on the New York Times bestseller list. That's not an easy feat to accomplish, and it was also adapted into a film by Paramount Pictures, and you can access that on Paramount Plus. That's just a shameless plug that I get nothing for. Uh, in 2020, she released Find Your Voice, which is a guided journal to writing your truth, specifically for uh, aspiring writers. In 2021, uh, she took us back to Garden Heights with her writing for Concrete Rose, for my man Maverick, 
We got to see the foundation of this father and this community member, this husband in Concrete Rose, uh, which is the prequel to The Hate You Give. So if you haven't read that, please do. And it focuses on Maverick at the age of 17, the same age that his daughter, Star, is in The Hate You Give. So she's giving us uh, the fullness of those communities. And guess what? Concrete Rose was also number one on the New York Times bestseller list. Our girl is always putting out her best work and representing us uh, in a stellar fashion. So please join me in welcoming someone who I respect and love and honor with everything that I have, Angie Thomas. Hey! Hi. Oh my goodness. Goodness. You're trying to make me emotional before we get started. Um, I am trying to make you emotional. Facts. Yeah, yeah, no, no. But you didn't, you didn't, I, I need to update my bio. It's not your fault. It's on me. But my next book comes out after four. I'm going to go, y'all. Like the the Manifest of Prophecy. And this is the first book I've written that takes place in Jackson. So I'm super excited about this. Like, I got to explore Jackson in a magical way. I got to show Ferris Street, um, a little bit of fun, and I got to show the museum and some other places. But also, I got, I, I got a chance to give a magical explanation for the potholes. So y'all check this out. <laughs> Listen, we appreciate a little bit of magic. I'm so excited about that book. I left it out, but April, it, it drops in April, so put it on your reading list. And you're gonna be here to uh, promote that book, right? Yep, so we're gonna be there with yes. you uh, yes. promoting as well. So excited, but listen, as quiet as it's kept, Garden Heights is in Jackson, so I don't care what people say. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's, that's my hometown. Angie, it's so good to see you, even in the virtual space, and we have gotten the chance to have lots of conversations. And it's typically been around celebrating your writing and the worlds that you create in your books, the characters that you weave into our hearts uh, with your words. And I'm always thrilled to do that. Uh, but today's conversation is a little bit different as we're talking about uh, folks that don't have the capacity to appreciate everything that you create in your work, so much so that they push for other folks to not have access to it in public spaces. We're talking about book banning. Uh, and so I wanna dive right in because I know I wanna keep up with time and then open the questions for the audience, but uh, the hate you give, I, I've mentioned all of these times that you've been number one on the New York Times best seller list, uh, but the hate you give has another uh, sort of accolade that's infamous. It is the third mo most banned book, I think in the nation right now. Mm -hmm. Did y'all know that? Yeah. Uh, which is fascinating, fascinating. So it was published in 2017 and uh, that year Texas decided to ban it. And uh, the reasons that were given for the banning of this book who is dedica that's dedicated to your grandmother who showed you that there's light in darkness. Uh, the explanation that we're given is that there's profanity, there's violence and anti-police messaging. Uh, your own state, our home, moved to ban it through the Mississippi Library Commission in 2022. And I, I bring this point up because uh, we are sisters in so many ways because of where we're from, because of how we've been reared, because we are library nerds and book dragons, right? We just read and absorb everything. But we got banned together, Angie, because I did annotations for the Mississippi Library Commission of your book so that every young person that checked it out would be able to engage in a conversation about your characters, about Garden Heights, about the relationships, about the development. And so I brought my copy here with me today. I don't know what you can see on the screen, but the folks here in the room can see hundreds of post-it notes. And these are detailed yes. annotations of everything that's happening in this book so that a young person wouldn't have to read it alone even if they were reading it alone. So my annotations got banned too. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for the applause because it was an honor, right? <laughs> to, to be banned yeah. alongside my sister. But talk to me a little bit about uh, what your initial reaction was to knowing that your book was being pulled from library shelves specifically. Mm -hmm. 
Well, the first time I caught wind of it was when it happened in a school district called Katy, which is right outside of Houston, Texas, um, back in 2017. And I was upset. I was angry because um, from what I understood was people picked and chose certain things in the book, certain lines here or there, and that was their entire and the entire book. And I was angry, I was frustrated, I was hurt, but then my anger shifted in a new way. I was angry as the creative, but then it shifted in a new way when I started hearing from young people in that same school district, specifically young black girls who look like me and you, who told me that they love the hate you give, that that book meant so much to them. It it made them feel heard, it made them feel good. And it upset them that something that connected with them was being seen as bad. That mm. something that meant something to them was being pulled from the shelves. And as somebody who grew up, you and I both, hip hop generation. I think everybody even in this room, unless you're you super young, there was a time when the rap artists they were being targeted by politicians. I can specifically remember seeing news of a bunch of politicians and preachers um, stomping on Tupac scenes because they didn't like the message. And y'all know I'm a huge Tupac fan. And one thing that Pac once said was, he says, these people, I'm paraphrasing, he said, these people are mad at me, but I didn't create thug life, I diagnosed it. Mm. I didn't create police brutality. I'm showing you, I didn't even diagnose it. I'm showing you the symptoms. And you're upset about that. I didn't create racism. I didn't even diagnose racism. I'm showing you what it looks like and how it manifests amongst us. And you're mm. mad. The, the messaging, though, that really peeves me is that it says to young people who see themselves in these books, what matters to you doesn't matter to us. If it scares us, if it makes us uncomfortable, nobody needs to know about it. And what that essentially tells them is, you make me uncomfortable. Mm. Nobody needs to know what you're going through. You need to be silent. You need to be invisible. And that's where I take issues. That's where my biggest anger is about it because of the message it sends to those young people who do these books. And let's go beyond my book. Let's look at these LGBTQ books, QIA books that, get, that are being targeted and the message is sending to those young people who identify with them is be silent, be invisible. That's my issue. So, yeah, I was angry. I was hurt. But I was also hopeful because those same kids in Houston that told me they love the book, they fought for it. In fact, a 13 year old girl went before the school board with a petition and got the book placed back on the shelf. And so young people give me hope. Um, but it angers me that the message that's being sent to them is be silent, be invisible. That's mm. what we need to be concerned about because these are the very kids who have been silenced and who have been made to feel invisible for so long. And the last thing we need is any messaging telling them that. Mm. I think what you're describing to me, this sort of uh, projection of your issues do not matter, we don't wanna see them, this is too ugly for me to engage, sounds violent to me. And so it's, it, it occurs to me that banning books is an epistemic violence, especially uh, books that center black life and black intimacy and black families and black communities, right? The, the, the name of this panel is Erasing Black Lives. And so for folks who uh, have, are laser focused in on the first few moments of the book, which that's the violent moment and the violence isn't perpetuated by anyone from that community in Garden Heights. It, you know, in the reverse, it is projected against them. And so there is, there is a lack of consideration for this community that you build in Garden mm -hmm. Heights, for the family that we, we get to see there, for the father-daughter and the father-son and the adoptive father-son relationships for grandma and all of these things. And so there are all of these elements of black life that are on display for the majority of this novel mm -hmm. that are being ripped away from folks who may not access black life in any other way. You've given them a snapshot of the beauty 
of communities that don't have everything, that don't have the resources, that don't have uh, the sort of uh, stories that venerate them. You've given a glimpse into that with, with Garden Heights. So I think there's some irony there. You talk about the 13-year-old girl who became a star, right? Pun intended mm -hmm. for the main character's yeah. name because of the epistemic violence against this, this book. So th that kudos goes to you, I think, as well. Tell me about the feeling of knowing that the book was banned here in Mississippi, mm. <laughs> being pulled from <laughs> library shelves here in your home state. Listen, um, my, when my mom found out, <laughs> Oh my! My mom was like, "It took this long." <laughs> <laughs> they hadn't read it um, yet. You know what? No, no. But you know what? I wasn't surprised, and I hate that I wasn't surprised. Mm. You know, um, it it it's hurtful. It's frustrating. You know, um, and it's it's telling of the things we're still dealing with in Mississippi. Um, but I, it's just. It's a different kind of it's a different kind of sting, you know. Texas, I'm like, Psh, forget Texas, then I ain't gotta go to Texas. But when we're talking about my my home, the place that grew me, the place that gave me the tools so that I could write a story like this, um, you know, first off, can I just mm. thank the Evers family for having this festival and for having me? Yeah, you all do not know the impact you've had on my life personally. Um, I grew up hearing the stories about Megger Evers. In fact, my mom remembers girl and her and her best friend would walk with her best friend's cousin to see him speak, to see Mr. Ever speak. And she still would talk about that. And we lived not far from their home. And my mom heard the gunshots that killed Mr. Evers. And I grew up hearing about that. I grew up hearing about Mississippi and what it was like to be a black person at that time. And I grew up seeing the black person in Mississippi even now. And knowing that the reason I could write a book like The Hate You Give is because of the things that Mr. Mega Evers went through. It's because of the things that, you know, the Alice Walkers went through. It's because of these people, both in civil rights and in literature, who made me who I am. And then to have that very state say, oh, we know we grew you. We know, you know, we and we may help make you who you are, but we don't want people to know about what you're doing. It's a different kind of sting. Um, but also, it's what's despite the stain there's so much hope i've had so many mississippians reach out to me and say that this is excuse my language bs <laughs> i've had so many mississippians reach out to support and i tell people all the time you want to know which events that i have that are the most diverse is always my events in mississippi always my events in mississippi the lines are always long i have people from all walks of life i've had 12 year old black kids come up to my signings. I've had 80 year old white ladies hobble up to my signing and tell me, thank you for this book. So despite what authority figures may wanna say, Mississippians want change. Mississippians are empathetic. Mississippians have compassion. Mississippians wanna call these things out. So the sting doesn't hurt so much because the bomb is the love I've received from the folks in my state. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I My dog's trying to get in here, y'all. I'm sorry. Let him in. <laughs> we want to see the baby. I, I appreciate just right, this litany that you've given of what Mississippians are because I often describe it, and this is a literary nerd in me, as the picture of Dorian Gray. That's who we are in the state of Mississippi. And so we have everything unsavory projected onto our state. Of course that's happening in Mississippi or that's what we would expect from Mississippi. But what we know for those of us who are students and lovers of history is that the resistance was so strong, which is why the opposition uh, rose up so strongly against it. So I love that you are a part of that narrative, continuing that resilient uh, resistance to ensure that our names are in folks mouths and they have to have these conversations. You talked about diagnosing the problem. Right. And I think it's interesting because the title of the book itself, not only do you diagnose this, but then diagnose it, but you give the cure, you give the the prescription. Hi. Hey. <laughs> I, I think the applause his applause was like more than yours, Angie. <laughs> hey, sweetheart. Got, I had a, That's my um, special he friend. He would groomed. usually be right here. Yeah, he just got groomed, so um, a mobile groomer came, parked in the driveway. You so look very pretty.
in a bath. Ooh, and a bow tie. Look at you. He dressed yeah. for the occasion. <laughs> And now I feel underdressed, oh. right? No, you're good. You're good. All right, baby. Can I put you down? Okay. Exactly. All right. Go with my mama. Go, go. He likes that. She said he did. So you want to say a family hi to affair. too, mama? Yes, mom. <laughs> my mom said, We were hey, waiting everybody. on you. <laughs> hey, mama. Ebony said they were waiting on you. Yeah, come. Ebony, look yes. Come in. She's she like, Yo, mom. <laughs> yeah. You're in a whole room of people right now, so. Hey, Girl. mama. Hey. There's a lot of other people watching, too. Okay. Oh, I miss you. I miss you more, mm -hmm. so she said April, she right? You more. Yeah, April. Everybody will see you in April. Let's get back to the conversation. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. <laughs> we we showed up time. Because I know my mama, she'll sit up here and have a whole conversation. And I would be right into it, right? We would just deviate from the whole scheduled program. We love that. Thank you for All sharing right. your family with us. So of I want to, the title of the book, because you mentioned Tupac, who is a, a special to me and my family as well, but the hate yeah. you give, right? Like that's the prescription. It's the hate you're giving is causing these systemic issues that lead to some of the things that are critiqued about the book. It's the hatred that causes uh, mm -hmm. the officer to not see Khalil as a human being, a young boy who has yeah. these issues in his family, who is loving, who has a best friend, who has a crush on his best friend, right? That is this normal young boy that we can, we can relate to with sons and nephews and, and, and brothers, but it's the hatred that puts that lens, that shield from seeing Khalil as a whole human being. And I think you spend the rest of this book helping us to love Khalil so much, right? That we have this visceral reaction to his death. We become his friend. We understand Star's sadness and, and, and fight. And then I can't tell you, I don't know if you remember this, Angie, Devante, mm -hmm. how yeah. much <laughs> everybody loves that that's this sweet, tender black boy who yeah. needs the support, who gets this adopted family, the yeah. argument over mac and cheese, right? We get these elements that are just so heartwarming. It's devastating to know that, uh, that's, that there's an effort to take that away. But this diagnosis, it's the hate that you give that is causing the issues that you don't want to expose your young people to. And certainly Absolutely. we don't want our young people exposed to violence that's going to harm them. But we certainly do want right. them to be aware of the root of that. And you give us that in this, in this narrative. And so I wonder about specifically taking books off library shelves, because I mentioned both of us, mm -hmm. I mean, we grew up going to public libraries. I grew up Absolutely. spending summers at the Eudora Welty Library. You grew up going to the Mega Evers Library. Both of these yes. buildings are still there. When we pass them, we feel something because that's what opened our curiosity. Both of our careers are tied to being able to pull books off those shelves when our parents couldn't afford to purchase books. That wasn't a, a thing for stu children growing up in the 80s and the 90s to have your own library. You went to the public, public library, and it's also a social event, right? Like, I kind of dated my husband at a library. Uh, <laughs> in my preteen years, but do you? What does it do to take you specifically, you Angie, someone who was grown through this library system, right? Who had your curiosity peak, that had your encouragement, had that encouragement from reading these books, and now we could tell young people. We could, at a point, tell young people this girl that grew up right down the street over there, and then went to school right over there, wrote this project at that school. She's on this shelf now and you can read her the encouragement that that has the potential of giving our young people, but to pull it from the shelves, what does it do to disenfranchise these up and coming creators and writers and, and change makers in our very own community? How is that kind of taking us out at the knees? Oh, it, it's absolutely taking us out at the knees. Um, and I don't think people recognize the power of representation mm. enough. Um, for so long, people like us weren't the stars of young adult novels. You know, Never. we didn't even have that. And all that scratching you, you hear is my dog going crazy on my couch. Lord Jesus, um, <laughs> my new couch, Kobe's That's couch. what children do, new... so. Oh Lord, um, he's mad about the book being banned. But um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's representation is so important and and we cannot act as if these are not things kids 
dealing with. I remember having a conversation with a white woman who had read and loved The Hate You Give, but she said, I'm not sure my 14-year-old daughter is ready to have a conversation about the things like that happened in this book, specifically police brutality. I said, I understand your concern as a parent, but could you also please take the time to consider what this what this means to the parent of the 10 year old black boy who has to have a conversation about, mm. well, this is what you do if you're a by a cop, mm. you know, because a lot of times black parents are being forced to have these conversations. And this is what is being lost in all of this. Nobody is talking about the human side of these issues in these books. Nobody is taking the time to have compassion or empathy or put themselves in somebody else's shoes. Because the things about these books that are being targeted is that they offer different perspectives than the quote unquote um, majority. Mm -hmm. They offer a different perspective. These books are challenging the perspective. And because they challenge perspectives that makes people uncomfortable. Now, as somebody who is a believer, I'm a firm believer in the idea that I believe God wants us to put ourselves in other people's shoes at some point or another. I believe he wants us to understand what somebody else is going through, the mm -hmm. hardships of others. And books are a great way to do that. So not only are we taking mirrors away from kids in Georgetown who need them, we're taking windows and sliding glass doors from kids in Madison who also need them. Wow. Because that's what this is about. It's about making sure that kids have mirrors, windows, sliding glass doors. Those kids in Georgetown going to Madison, those mirrors to see themselves. But those kids in Madison that go to St. Joe, St. Andrews, they need those windows and sliding glass doors to see lives beyond their own, to see people unlike them, to live experiences unlike theirs so they can have some compassion, some empathy. This is not about indoctrinating any kid. This is about making sure kids have empathy to make sure they're decent human beings who understand that there's more to the world than that their own experiences, that there are more people beyond those who look like them, who think like them, who believe like them. There are other people and it's okay to love those people. Yeah. It's okay to have compassion for those people. For people who claim to be Christians and believers, there is a lack of love and compassion in having mm. these conversations about books. Mm. Because if you don't even wanna take the time to understand somebody's hardships and you wanna write them off, how in the world are you gonna reflect Christ? So, you know, I can get into that if Girl. we wanna get into that. But, so, that's, that's what's being targeted right now. They're targeting the mirrors, the windows, and the sliding glass doors. Mm. But my job is to continue to create those mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors. And all I'm asking for as a creative is that other people, like those of you in that room, make sure that those mirrors are being hung. Make sure that those mm. windows stay up. Make sure that those sliding glass doors are still accessible. I'm doing my work. That's all I can do as an author. It's going to take y'all going to school board meetings and speaking up. It's going to take y'all making yourselves just as loud as the detractors because that's the only way we're going to have a fighting chance at making sure these kids get mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors. Y'all can clap again. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, the, or the church can just say amen. Amen. <laughs> The greatest commandment is love. The greatest of Absolutely. all these is love. And so I, I appreciate you framing it that way, that this is, not only, uh, this is not only something that we can cloak in the realm of education. This is an education that young people need, but this is a way of living that is supposed to save all of us. It's supposed to Absolutely. save all of us. It's our access to salvation. I, I have the distinct privilege of teaching what you write. And when I say teaching, I mean having conversation, introducing it to the young people, and some of them not so young, that I, that I encounter, and we get to have conversations about what you've created. And so I want to, for, for anyone here who may not be familiar, for anyone who's streaming, just go through some of the themes that have come up in my courses and in these conversations and discussions that people find just in this book, uh, right, well, and, and in some of the other books, but there, is, uh, there are themes of family and trauma, love, addiction, mother-daughter relationships, generational curses and blessings, coming of age, justice, fatherhood, naming, forgiveness, reclamation of untold and mistold stories, humanity, friendship, black culture. All of that 
wrapped up in these very enjoyable pages, right, where we get to know the characters. And so I wanted to lay that down as a foundation of if, if all you're looking for is what you find to be anti-police, which, by the way, Uncle <laughs> Unc is a Uncle police Carlos. officer. <laughs> Uncle Carlos <laughs> is a police officer that's coming to some understanding of in his, in his role uh, in that occupation. But those are some other things that you will find in these texts. I have a graduate student right now, and I just want you to know this, writing her master's thesis on motherhood and addiction uh, and on the come up. And she was inspired wow. uh, by, by Jay's uh, character there. So I want you to know the impact wow. that you're having in these sort of unlikely places. But I also you know, want to point to how when you don't read for those issues that you're told are in the book, then you miss out on the opportunity to access everything, all the other possibilities uh, that are there. And so you've talked a little bit about how it dehumanizes those of us who are walking around who don't have a choice but to have the conversation, that talk with mm -hmm. our young people. Uh, and so for you to provide this sort of textbook, right? A model of how to have that talk before they're having it about somebody very real who has lost their lives on, on television or see it flash on the news or on TikTok or on Twitter. You're giving the opportunity for these families to have these conversations in the context of a fictional world. And you can still save, you can still love, you can still provide the opportunity. So I wanna thank you for that. You join a long list of our, our foremothers specifically and some of the contemporary sister writers whose books have been banned. I'm wearing some of them today uh, on my cloak here, but Toni Morrison yeah. also banned her book, Beloved, which I read as a senior at Murrah High School right down the street and it changed my life and it is why I study literature. Uh, your, your sweet writing sister friend, Tiffany Jackson, grown, mm -hmm. also banned. Mm -hmm. Sulwe by Lupita Nyong'o a book that mm -hmm. have, has helped my daughters to come to terms with colorism and, and the value uh, of all of the different shades of people like us banned and taking off, taken off of library bookshelves. Alice Walker, Maya Angelou, Zora Neale Hurston, you, you with the band, right? Yeah. The, yeah. The, this sisterhood. So how does it motivate you to know that these women specifically who have laid the foundation, that, those are the people that I was reading in the Eudora Welty Library. Those are the women that you were reading in the Mega Evers Library. So to be part of that vanguard, is it, is it a double-edged sword to feel motivated and proud of being part of their lineage, but also is there some sort of feeling of sadness to know that this is still where we are? And I don't mean as a state, oh, yeah. I mean as a collective society. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. To be even mentioned in this breath is an honor in any way. Um, but it, I'm sure too that if they, they would all just, they, they would be disappointed, but probably not surprised that my generation of authors, are we're now dealing with this, like Tiffany and I, or Nick Stone and I, um, yeah, all three Nick. of us, you know, all young adult authors, black women, and we're being targeted regularly. Um, it's frustrating, but also I look at the strength that those women had. I look at how they still kept writing despite the pushback. You know, um, we're still because they kept going, they kept writing, they kept telling the stories. And I say, I want to have the audacity of Toni Morrison. Mm. <laughs> if mm. I could just have a bit no, of we are. audacity, you know, um, if I can have the audacity of Zora Neale Hurston. Mm. If I can have that audacity to tell these stories that make people uncomfortable, then I'm going to keep doing it. Um, because my hope is that eventually that audacity will lead to someone saying later on, I can't believe they even wanted to ban this book. That's my, I think that's my biggest hope for the hate you get. Um, is that one day the book is irrelevant in the sense that it no longer applies to what's going on that we're not having conversations about police. Wouldn't that be something? Anymore. That would be amazing. Mm -hmm. And I want people to say, wait a minute, they tried to ban that? They banned that? What in the world? You know, we look back now, there are certain books now, we're like, they banned that? What? Mm -hmm. You know, I want that one day, but I'm not going to let these people silence me. I'm, I'm not going to let it distract me. 
Um, I, I know what my calling is and when you know what it is, you stand in that and you keep going. So that's what I'm doing. I'm keeping going just like my literary heroes did. So um, it, it's an honor to be mentioned in the same breath as them. And I hope that one day I can have even a fraction of the impact that they've had. Mm. You already have an impact, sis. <laughs> it's more than a fraction. I, and I, I have to mention this as a mother. Um, when George Floyd was murdered, my daughter asked me what was going on. She's the same mm -hmm. age as George Floyd's daughter. And so while I didn't have the tools to walk her through that very real experience, I then had the tools, I had the visual tools of the Hate You Give, the movie, mm -hmm. to guide her into an understanding of what was happening in real life. And then when Tyree Nichols was just murdered, I had to bring out that tool again that you've created to explain to my younger daughter who, wasn't, who didn't understand in 2020 now what she has the capacity to see and understand now. And it's a matter of walking through the kitchen and seeing the news on and saying, mommy, what happened to that man? Mommy, why did they do that to that man that looks very much like her uncles, her nephews, her father, her cousins, right? Mm -hmm. So I bring that up because I do wanna talk just briefly before we open to the audience about this, these film adaptations and the tools that they create for us. And I wonder if you see that as a response. Um, it's deeply saddening as an educator and a lover of books to see books pulled from the library shelf because, you know, keeping it 100, I teach Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, never pulled from the shelves, very violent, very oppressive, very offensive. But my students deserve to know what was written about people that looked like them. And so, but I wonder, if we are not able to counter the books being pulled from the library and the school shelves, what work these film adaptations, producer Thomas, <laughs> that you've been so instrumental in, you've broken into this world where we can just pull up a streaming app and see on the come up. We can just pull up a streaming app and I can use that and be a parent and guide my then seven year old in watching this movie with me and understanding this is what happening? This is what's happening here. This is how you can understand it. And she saw Star and Amanda Stenberg just happens to look a whole lot like my old, oldest daughter. Yes. <laughs> and so you wouldn't imagine how that impacted her understanding in a way that she told me today when I left the house, y'all. She said, Mama, go testify to those folks <laughs> about that book. And she calls Angie, she calls you, my friend, because she's seen you. She's so, they, they, they did that to your friend's book, Mommy, Why? But she had an understanding, and it was because of the film. So talk a little bit to us about how the films open a different opportunity for us to provide access in those sliding glass doors and those windows to young people who may have them pulled from their school, their library, their home shelves, but mm -hmm. they have some access in other ways. Oh yeah. Um, first off, please tell baby girl, she's my friend too. I'm <laughs> your she friend, I'm you. her friend too. And I got this for her because even in this one, um, even in this book, I talk about some of these things. I talk about Emmett Till in this book. I talk about yeah. lynching in this book yeah. in a way that people understand. Um, but the movies are play a huge role in getting the story to young people, regardless of what happens with the book bands. I've had so many kids who told me they read the movie first, or they only watched the movie first, or they only watched the movie. And I'm okay mm -hmm. with that. Yeah. Um, I, my own cousin was like, yo, cuz, I can't read that book, it's too long, but that movie was dope. And I'm like, Honesty. You know what? It's, it's okay, it's okay. But they, they do a great way, they, they're a great tool for that. Um, and, and I'm thankful that both of my adaptations have been true to the heart of the stories that, you know, the same message, the same story is told. Um, and, and the heart of it is still there. Um, one of the reasons I, I'm in Atlanta, y'all, but one of the I'm home here in Atlanta now is because I said, okay, Lord, I want more of my books to be made into films. And both, all, both of my movies were made into films here. So I've got a house here out of faith that every single thing that I write will be made into a film. That's my faith move. I'm declaring it publicly. All right, Lord, come through. Thank you. <laughs> still bad on faith. <laughs> But, you know, but that's the thing, because I recognize, too, not everybody wants to sit down and read a book. And I'm OK with that. Sometimes I like watching the movie. Um, the books are always better, but they're still a great tool. And they've allowed so many young people access 
to that story. I've had kids whose parents wouldn't approve of them reading the book, tell me they snuck and watched the movie. And I'm o- I'm okay with that, you know? So film is just another another avenue to tell these same stories. And I think it's, I'm, I know I'm blessed to have had two of them made so far to still be able to tell these stories, to still foster empathy and compassion in people and understanding. Um, and I'm very grateful for that. So hopefully more to come. More to come, more to come. My last question, and then we'll open it up, um, is about what banning books in 2023, as you've mentioned, right? And we did this in the 80s and the 90s. Parents said, don't do something. What did we do? What did y'all do? did it anyway. Lots of angels in the audience here. I did it anyways. I found a way to do it. And now our, our young people have so much more access than we can get a handle on. Mm-hmm. And so it does seem that in 2023 to ban a book is quite perfunctory or symbolic. And so I want to talk to folks who feel like they're doing the right thing by banning Mm -hmm. these books, who feel like they are protecting uh, their children or their communities from unsavory and um, violent and, uh, you know, just unwanted social realities. Folks that feel like they are doing the work to be protectors and to, uh, to uphold righteousness and love. I want, I want you to talk to those folks, whether they will listen mm-hmm. or not, about mm-hmm. how symbolic the action is in the erasure of those that we're walking around in flesh and blood and you're stripping our representation from shelves and performing this violence that you purport to, to, to want to protect your young people against? Um, I would say, first off, I am not your enemy. <laughs> I am not here to indoctrinate your children. I am here to tell stories about act- young people and things actual young people are dealing with. And we are doing those young people no good by ignoring those things. Um, A lot of times the people who are bad in these books call themselves believers. As believers, I think we are called to put ourselves in the shoes of others, to humanize other people. Because that's what love is. Love is humanizing others. You're looking at these books as being about issues or about political stuff. I never think about politics when I'm writing. I don't like politics at all. I don't think about politics. When I wrote The Hate You Give, I was thinking about the real Khalils out there, those young men who have been the victims of police brutality. I was thinking about the real stars out there who are living in two different worlds, trying to figure out who they are here, who they are there, who are dealing with trauma. I was thinking about the real Carter families who are living in communities that are falling apart around them, but they're staying there because they want to do something to change it. When I wrote On the Come Up, I was thinking about the real Breeze out there who just want to make themselves heard and want to express themselves, want to make it even as a rapper or something, because that's the only way they see out. That's the only way they see to make themselves heard. I wrote about the real Jays out there who are dealing with, you know, recovery and have gone through recovery and have had addiction. And now they're trying to be a new person and and navigate this world that throws them all kinds of obstacles. When I wrote Concrete Rose, I wrote about the real Mavericks, those young men who are in the gangs, who are selling drugs, who may have a baby or two on the way and don't know their way and just need somebody to love and support them. I write about things real people are dealing with. Can we please stop ignoring the real things that people are dealing with? The fact that I wrote about racism is not the problem. Racism is the problem. The fact that I wrote about police brutality is not the problem. Police brutality is the problem. Can we address these actual issues and stop focusing on the books that are talking about them? In the words of Pac, I didn't create thug life. And honestly, I didn't diagnose it. I'm just showing you that it exists. So can we please stop ignoring that these things actually exist and stop acting like your kids don't know that they exist? Because that child that you want to protect in Madison has the privilege of being protected in Madison. But that kid in Georgetown does not. And can you as a Christian and as a believer actually care about that kid in Georgetown and making sure that they have something that shows them that there's a different way that shows them and leads them and guides them and gives them a mirror? Can you start caring about them too? Because it doesn't seem like you do. But that would be actual love, not banning, not silencing. (laughs) 
And see, I'm being nice. If my mama was in here, she'd be going off. <laughs> but that's so, <laughs> I, I, there's a little mama in there. We are very, a little bit. we're very little grateful, little very grateful, <laughs> and could not have said it better. I'm gonna open uh, the floor to questions from the audience. I think we can take uh, roughly two to three questions from the folks who are here in the room. Um, not really a question, but to piggyback off what you just said, instead of targeting these books. Let's find solutions to some of the problems that are in these books. Let's figure out a way to turn gun violence around. Let's figure out how to bring people out of poverty. Let's look at those solutions instead of trying to stop me from reading what I want to read. I grew up with a mother who took me to college campus library every Saturday. Getting a library card was like the thing. It was so exciting when I got it. And when I took my kids to get theirs, they were excited that they had this card with their name on it where they can go and get any book they want. So why are we trying to stop people from, from reading what they choose to pick up and read? If you don't like it, don't read it. Period. It's your loss. It's your loss. There's so much love in this book. So much more. Yes, ma'am. Can you hear that, Angie? Can you hear the audience? I hear. I hear. Okay, great. I hear. Also, I still have my um, library card. <laughs> Thank you. From the one the I Jackson got. Jackson Hines the Library Card. Library. <laughs> I still have it. I still have the original. I might have a library book or two. Um, <laughs> Nobody here. Y'all keep that between us. Y yes, ma'am. I'm <laughs> Mississippi Delta, and the version of the library of band books there, I went in, and I, I was in grammar school, I don't know how old I was, and I checked out, I was checking out the group by Mary McCarthy, and the librarian looked at me and she said, does your mother know that this is a red line book and you're checking it out? I had no idea what the hell she was talking about. I said, yes, she does. <laughs> and then I told my mother when I got home, and we laughed about it. <laughs> I love it, because when that happens... As a young person, you're like, oh, what's in here? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I got to get to it with a flashlight mm -hmm. under the covers overnight. Yes, ma'am. Awesome. I just have a, not really a question, but... The lady before when she said why you know why do we not find solutions I think our biggest problem that we're facing now is just a war on truth mm -hmm. a war on facts and it's not that they uh, they're not trying to find a solution what they're doing is they're um, protecting the uh, white supremacist ideology uh, through our children because as the demographics grow and we're less of more of a white country, we're diverse. You hardly ever see uh, a child that comes from two white, completely white parents. And as that demographic grows, it threatens that it threatens them. They think that you know their their white supremacist ideology. They've got to somehow keep that in the forefront. So, what's the best way to do that? Is through the schools, as the shaping the minds of our children, you know, so they're not aware of, because if it was all about protecting kids, why did they let them watch violent games, play violent games that are literally horrible? I mean, yep, yep. I have grandchildren, and my daughter has to, like, watch everything he, he, I mean, the games are absolutely so violent in the language. Why don't they, I mean, if it was all about protecting children, it wouldn't be about books with words on it. It would be about a lot of other things. If it, if it was about the kids, it would actually be about guns. <laughs> if it was about <laughs> You know, um, it, it's, it's amazing to me that you have all this legislature being passed about books and stuff now. You know, because of book bannings and things like that. And nobody's talking about the fact we have an entire generation of kids who have to learn 
um, shooter safety drills. I did not have to learn that when I was in school. What was the drill? We tornado. Drills. You get in the yeah. hall. <laughs> that was it. I go to school visits now and these kids are telling me, you know, well, here's what we have to do if an active shooter comes into school, you know, and parents are having to buy bulletproof backpacks. That's what we need to be thinking about. Protect if it was about protecting kids, it would be about that. But no, it's about a fear of change. Ultimately, it's about a fear of change. And a lot of these books, yeah. they want to say, oh, they're going to is to be this, this, and this, but no, all they're doing is open their net, opening their eyes to lives beyond their own. What's mm. the problem with that? Mm. Party for the um, gun violence in the world when they're the ones that are making the laws to make it easier to get guns, you know, mm -hmm. and voting against the laws that actually make sense and and put gun law safety, you know, rules in, in place. So. I applaud you. I think you're awesome. I think your book was great. Can't say enough good things. Thank okay, you. I have a, let's see. The, in the queue, the queue. The young woman in the middle. Oh, I don't see the queue. Oh, I think you're right here in the beautiful turquoise dress. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Where the information that the ooh -ooh was allowed us ooh -ooh -ooh was uh, limited. And, and, and um, I went out of state uh, to college. And in, in college, it, it's, it's where you're, you're not going to have uh, the, the, these restrictions. And there were um, so many students who had information that um, Mississippi had censored that, that did not get down to us. And, and so I was at a disadvantage not having access to that information. Oh man! And did you get that? To I, did, I, did, I did. I did. Yeah, no, I did. Um, and and the thing is, too, now there are attempts in certain states to, you know, ban books at colleges and keep certain courses. They're trying to, you know, take away African American history courses from colleges in Florida. And it's like, what are you afraid of at this point? What is the fear? Why, why is there so much fear of our experience being taught or learned, our history being taught and learned? What is it about us that people want to silence what we go through, what we've been through, who we are? What is it? So it's, fear is sad. <laughs> it, it's a sad thing and, and I'm, I'm thankful that, you know, young people can, as of now, still get books in colleges and stuff, but they're going to come for that next. Absolutely. And that's terrifying. Um, and I think all of us need to be aware that, okay, if they're starting with my books, who, who knows what they're going to come after next? You know, so it, it's something we all need to think about in a bigger picture, because this is just the beginning of something. I appreciate that comment too, because there's this ironic attack that's happening on education. And as someone who was grown here and then went to college in another state, there is a disadvantage when you don't have the access to resources that your peers from other states had access to in the secondary education. And so if education is the key to our future, we're dismantling that by taking away resources. Stuart. Absolutely. There will be a question here, but I just have to say, <laughs> Um, um, Angie, your messaging on this issue is so powerful and important. Um, I'm the director of the Mississippi Humanities Council. I'm in conversations with my colleagues at other state humanities councils who are dealing with just this issue. And when you gave your impassioned presentation at the book festival, there was like a bootleg video of it, and I sent it out to my colleagues because the ideas you were expressing and the language that you used we're so compelled. So here's the question. Do you and your colleagues, folks like Nick Stone, do you have a sense that we really have a role to play in this national conversation about the about the about the damage that occurs 
when these books are locked away from people. Because I think you have a, an important platform and you're a wonderful messenger. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, we, we do have conversations about it. And I, I will be honest too. Um, my, like, I'm, I'm so thankful that my messaging um, and, and what I say impacts people and stuff. But I, I get so many requests to talk about book bans that I, I had to kind of create some boundaries and say, you know what, I'm more than that. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a big supporter of the organizations that are doing work. In fact, I just got an email um, Friday about a big thing that's about to happen in Florida. And I was asked to participate, be a part of this. I can't go into the specifics right now, but you'll know eventually. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to be a part of that, happy to speak about that and stuff. But I also, I had to, as a creative and then as a, as a black woman too, I had to tell myself, you know what though, but this isn't my burden to carry. All I could do is write the books. Um, I can say what I'm saying and everything, but I, my hope is that I plant nuggets in you all, everybody that's in there. So that you all can carry the torch, so that you all can make the changes. Because the unfortunate thing is, if I go before legislature, if I go to school board meetings, forget legislature, if I go to school board meetings, they're not going to listen to me because, oh, you're the author. You came in here with a, you know, you, if the books are in the book, that helps you. You know, why would you, why would we listen to you? You know, blah, 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 blah. I can't, I can't do nearly as much as I wish I could. You know, so um, you y'all are more than welcome to take what I say and run with it. <laughs> it's just I I had to tell myself, you know what? If I'm so focused on talking about the book bans, if I'm so focused on fighting against the book bans, when do I have time to write the next book? You know, and and that's what my my calling is to write the books. It's kind of like you have to know your lane, know your ministry. Uh, mine is writing the books, and I will speak up for them, advocate for them myself, but my voice does not have nearly as much power as the voices that are in that room right now, as, as the voices of the people I'm looking at right now, because I'm looking at a room that is super diverse. And it gives me so much hope that in a place like Mississippi that gets such a bad rep, that people who do not look like me from different backgrounds than me are sitting in that room at a banned book festival and listening to someone like me it gives me so much hope, and I hope y'all know the power you have to walk into those buildings. The things that I'm talking about, you can say yourself. You can walk into those school board meetings, and you would have a bigger impact than I ever could. So, yeah, I, 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 I'm thankful that the conversation is happening nationally, but I need people to recognize that, for me, there's only so much I can say and do. The real impact comes from you all. That was a perfect charge, and I hope there's another bootleg video coming out of just <laughs> that little blurb, because we needed to hear it. One last question, comment, and then I'm going to bring the queen back. Hey, Joe Harris from Natchez, Mississippi. I'm a history instructor at Copile Lincoln Community College and the director of the Natchez Literary and Cinema Celebration. On campus last month, we used your book, On the Come Up, as our campus read. And the year before, we used Stamped. Um, we had some really nice dialogue, but my question around that is, as a history teacher and as someone who promotes books, where does the state of Mississippi stand now with critical race theory? Because I keep expecting to get a, you know, a message like from my main campus in, near Brookhaven saying, what do you do? Uh, the other campuses didn't participate, it was just matches. Um, where does Mississippi stand? What are our laws? That term has been used so much, critical race theory, and then when you ask a lot of people what it is, they don't know. Um, and, the, and the term, too, that, that phrase, critical race theory, kids aren't being taught critical race theory. That's something at college level. In fact, it's for law students. Um, what they want to say, what a lot of people want to say is critical race theory is just learning about people of different races. What's so wrong? with that you know um i i don't know where the state stands somebody else would have to answer that um but i do know that that's just a blanket term that's being thrown around and it's being unfairly thrown around and used to describe things 
that are just books to describe books that are just talking about human experiences. Um, and so I, I'd rather, I wish that people would combat CRT with human experience theory. Can we have more books about the human experience theory? Y'all are worried about critical race theory. Well, what about books about the human experience theory? Can we do that? You know, <laughs> um, because that's what these books are. They're about the human experience. So um, it's, it, it, you know, you 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 may be hearing something sooner than later about those books you've been teaching. It's unfortunate to say because that's the time we're in. But I want people, more people to challenge people who use that phrase CRT. And when somebody brings it up to you, ask them, do you actually know what that means? And then inform yourself of what it really means and come back at them with it. Because we're living in an age of misinformation where people are using terms, taking terms and using them in their own way, like woke. Woke is not what people want to say it is. Woke was a term that Black folks created to talk about being aware of in, uh, systemic injustice. That's all it is, is awareness. And now it's being weaponized against us. So CRT and woke, I would encourage you all to look those terms up, look up the real meaning of them. And when those conversations happen, because a lot of change happens just in conversations with folks, it doesn't always take place in school board meetings. It doesn't always take place in, in um you know, any big fancy way. Sometimes it's when you're sitting there having a coffee with somebody and y'all are having a conversation and you come back at them with, you know what, that's actually not what that means. That's not what that is referring to. Here's the, those kind of conversations make real change. That's true. And they're just important. That's true. And it's always interesting to point out that any opposition or misdefinition of CRT actually proves the theory <laughs> to be true. <laughs> Give yourselves a hand. Give my sister Angie a hand. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for popping thank up you. virtually in your home today. We love you, we miss you, but we're thankful for you. Cannot wait to read Nick Blake with my babies. They're looking forward to it. I got you, I got you some copies already. Don't thank you, thank you, thank you, thank <laughs> you. That was an ask. <laughs> Rena's coming up, so don't log on. Okay. I just want to tell you how much the Evers family loves you and adores you and how you bring it real, okay? That's the important piece that's, that's she speaks in the words that she writes it touches me, it touched me from the hate you give, from the time that I read it, because it reflects me. It reflects my pain, it reflects it at that age, and it brings it out to the world. And so, if you can't be empathetic, if you can't be compassionate, are you telling the truth about who you are? Right. Are you walking in the steps of people who've tried to change the world? Reflect, rethink, go through these mirrors. Open up the windows that you talked about and broadly and bravely go through those sliding glass doors. you and your whole family and we can't wait to see you soon along with the little little bitty one come back and see us let's do the conversations let's understand the real meaning of the words that are thrown out there because CRT I won't even go back over what these two wonderful ladies said it is about what Angie said. It's about understanding human race experiences. Yes. Talking about it. Trying, if you can't even put a foot in the shoe, 
put a toe in it. And let's move forward instead of moving backwards. Thank you so much. Me crying on a Saturday. I'm gone. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Besides you look great pink, I want the audience to know that right outside these doors. There is this one. Oh, I'm sorry. Right outside these doors, <laughs> we have a gift for you. The gift of you can purchase Angie's book that's signed. Yes. Okay? And we want you to not only go and see that one book, two books, but the future book at Lemuria. Yes. yes. And Angie, when are we seeing you? April. April. Okay. April. It's April. I think it's April. April. Well, first of all, that's a good picture of April. <laughs> As she is still in that beautiful pose, we're going to also ask you to get your tickets out real quick. We're going to draw one more time, but we're going to draw from Angie's book. All right? And Angie, no matter when you come up frozen, <laughs> you can join us. We love you.
do now is um, do another door prize. So get those tickets out. Everybody have your ticket ready? Okay, didn't bring my glasses. 825-659-625-659. No takers. 825-659, the magic three times. Okay, one more. Eight two five six one one. Bingo. Okay. <laughs> the book? No, no, no. No, I gotta give this to you. Okay. So at this time we're gonna get your information. So so Jerry Mitchell's gonna let you know what you get as a prize. Yeah, these are signed Angie books, so Angie Thomas books. So anyway, we'll get your information. We'll send it on. We, Lemuria, unfortunately, had departed before we realized they had departed. So uh, we'll get those to you. Um, you know, we uh, this is another subject that's near and dear to my heart, uh, where this panel is about erasing history. And, um, you know, George Orwell, one of my favorite books, I remember the first book I ever read that just kind of really rocked my world was 1984. I don't know about anybody else felt that way, but I read that book, I think it was in eighth grade or something like that, and it just blew my mind. And, um, and to see so much of what happened in that book now seemingly come true has been is really scary. But uh, Orwell said in the book that those who control the, the present control the past. And those who control the past control the future. And so uh, there's such a battle right now over history. And I think this is, and what a terrific panel we have here today. It's going to be led in discussion by my old buddy, uh, author Alan Huffman. And uh, if you've not read his book, uh, Mississippi in Africa, it's a, it's a terrific book. And um, so, so tickled to have Alan to lead us through this conversation. Thanks, Alan. Thanks, Jerry. Um, everybody here okay? Not, no feedback or anything? Thanks, everybody, for coming um, to uh, rum ruminate about the potential perversion of history instead of wearing funny hats and drinking green beer. The, um, <laughs> you know, banning books has always been about a threat to power, and people often play on public fears in order to, to limit the understanding of what is, has happened and what is happening. And so in that sense, our panel, which is about erasing history, is about both what has happened and what is happening. And that is the current push to ban the teaching of history that some people find uncomfortable. And I'm a writer, I'm not a historian, but many of my books have historical backdrop. And one thing that I've learned is history is uncomfortable. And you need look no further than the current historical moment to see that. And so our panel is acutely aware of the importance of this and how it happens. They've, everybody is coming from different perspectives, but they're, I think, all very much aware that a lot of what's happening in this country right now is disquietingly familiar in the South, where we have a long history of jettisoning uncomfortable truths. And so I'm going to introduce them to you, starting at my immediate left, and then I'm going to ask a few questions then we're going to have a general discussion, and we don't want it to be overly formatted because everybody has brings something different to the table. Two are historians, one is a journalist, and one is the keeper of a history that was once suppressed. Following the discussion, we'll have a about 15-minute Q&A 
So if you could hold your questions until, until that time. And as always, if you don't agree with everything you hear, please be civil. And this would be a really good time to think about silencing your phone. Um, all right. I would also like to take this moment just to acknowledge the terrible losses that a lot of people experienced last night in Rolling Fork and other communities. All right, we're going to start with Co Bragg. Co is a graduate of Spelman College and Columbia Journalism School, who's taught creative writing to teenagers sentenced to adult prisons, and is currently an editor at The Markup in New Orleans. One of her articles in The Atlantic is about black tour guides, including her stepdad, shining a light on the Freedom Summer, summer murders of, of Goodman, Cheney, and Schwerner in Neshoba County. Daphne Chamberlain is a historian and faculty member at Tougaloo College. She has a master's and a PhD in history from Ole Miss and is founding director of Jackson State's Civil Rights Education Center. She grew up the daughter of an English professor who incorporated many banned books into her courses and had her children read broadly to expand their worldview through literature. Stephanie Roth is the author of Resisting Equality, the Citizens' Council, 1954 to 1989, which focuses on Mississippi segregationists who were attempting to control public thought. The book was awarded the 2019 Macklemore Prize from the Mississippi Historical Society. She earned her master's and PhD in history at Mississippi State and is an associate professor of history here at Millsaps. Her work has appeared in The Right Side of the 60s, Reexamining Conservatism's Decade of Transformation, and in the Journal of Southern History. She's currently working on a project about the rise of the radical right in Southern California during the 60s and 70s. Jay Wesley is a member of the Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians and director of Choctaw, Choctaw Emmy? Is it Emmy? That's it. Okay. Emmy. I should have asked before, the Museum of Choctaw Culture in Philadelphia, Mississippi. His focus is, uh, is on the erasure of indigenous people, in particularly the Mississippi Band of Choctaws, from the history of glossing over perceived facts about native tribes in Mississippi, the treaty process, which changed their landscape and lifeways, the lack of identity and overgeneralization of Indian culture through school textbooks. I was recently visiting a friend and fellow writer, Margaret McMullen, who I'm sure some of you are familiar with, who wrote an excellent piece about book bands for The Bulwark. Margaret's parents, James and Madeline McMullen, two wonderful, bright, open-minded people whose names grace this hall, were very instrumental in her understanding of the importance of telling the truth in nonfiction. Her mother's family fled the Nazis in Austria. And as we all know, one of the ways the Nazis stoked ignorance and fear was by banning books. When I was visiting, Margaret showed me her father's Mississippi history textbook from when he was in school in Newton, Mississippi in the 1950s. Even knowing what I know about that era, the book was shocking in its blatant propaganda, its twisting of reality, its distortions and omissions. If it were simply a nonfiction book, the author would have every right to his opinion, but it represented the official line. It was for every public school student in Mississippi at the time, the summation of the state's history, and it was full of lies. This is what you get when you limit, censor, or ban access to the truth. To start things off, and in that vein, I have a question for Daphne. And I'd be glad to hear from anyone else who, who wants to chime in on this. You mentioned to me that Tulu is currently focused on the work of the late Professor James Lowen, who co-edited with Dr. Salas from Millsaps, a 1974 Mississippi history textbook, Conflict and Change, which is very different from the one I just mentioned and sparked controversy at the time, was rejected by the state for course curriculum. You've also researched the involvement of, of Jackson children in the Civil Rights Movement. Regarding that other Mississippi history textbook, the one Margaret McMullen's father studied under, I'm wondering how black students responded to being taught that sort of history, how they overcame being denied access to official truth 
if in fact they did? So I guess that's really two questions. You can start with either one of them. Well, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Jerry Mitchell and Rena Evers Everett for the opportunity to be a part of this panel. This is an extremely important topic. And of course, um, I've spoken broadly about historical amnesia and, and how erasure is something that is significantly impacting our educational system, which is why it's so important for people like Ebony and I who have small children, what we do at home with our kids where they may not necessarily be getting this information in the schools that they attend. But um, Dr. Rosman, Steve Rosman is up top of Form a retired uh, professor emeritus from Tougaloo College who was a colleague of James Lowen. And of course, when Dr. Lowen uh, started contacting me to think about ways in which Tougaloo College could uh, continue to deeply entrench itself in broadening the history and being truthful in the history that is being taught, we started thinking about what was going on in Mississippi's classrooms. And some of that even uh, evolved into conversations about the organization Teaching for Change and what they're doing with the Zen Project and getting K-12 teachers to think broadly about teaching all of this information about Reconstruction history, about the black freedom struggle, and how all of these things uh, provide the historical context for some of the things that we are seeing, not just here in the city of Jackson or the state of Mississippi, but all across the country. But um, so that, that work has been extremely important, and we're, we're looking at rolling out workshops to provide K-12 teachers with those resources to go into the classroom and tackle these, these uh, challenging issues with, uh, with the children that they are teaching. But with my research focused in on children during the Civil Rights Movement and the role in which they played um, on the ground here in the city of Jackson and also across the state of Mississippi, education was central to that narrative. And um, everybody in here, if you know the historical narrative, you already know that education was extremely important. The 1954 Brown decision, that was an, a mo monumental moment in the movement in which we are talking about the desegregation of public schools uh, in the South. And we're still grappling with that even in 2023. But young people were really looking at the landscape in which they were learning and how they were receiving a second-class education. They were receiving a second-class education through these second-hand textbooks. And of course, that was one of the avenues in which they wanted to tackle to be able to address all of these other issues that were happening all across the American South. So with the question that you're asking, Alan, about what was their response, or really what was the community's response when we think about Freedom Summer, the Freedom Schools, that existed right here in Jackson, but also in 40 other cities or um, towns across the state of Mississippi provided black history lessons for children. Freedom schools provided cultural opportunities for children. Freedom schools provided this opportunity for children to think creatively, but also expand their intellectual capacity beyond what they were learning in the classrooms based on the resources that those black teachers had in the schools across the state. So I think that this is a good starting point for us in looking at you know, what banning certain aspects of education or um, especially when we talk about history. And a lot of the history starts at home. Ms. Rena just got finished talking about that. So a lot of the history starts at home, but of course, there must be more done in, in which we preserve that history, but also be truthful in how we express and articulate that history to young people, because the way in which we write history can be written for good or for bad. That's interesting, and it, it, it brings to mind something else I was thinking about, as far as essentially those kids who are receiving second-hand versions of the textbooks like I described, they were already experiencing the erasure of history through not technically a book ban, but in a sense, it was, because the book that would have told the truth would not have been allowed. So this leads me to a question that, that I have for Stephanie, which is the Citizens Council, the segregationist organization, was aggressively involved in distorting and, and censoring the truth, and they did a lot of damage, but ultimately they failed, and history has not been kind to them. And so I'm wondering, given that some students today are forming banned book clubs, 
and information is much more pervasive, what are the chances that the, the current efforts to ban the teaching of uncomfortable history will ultimately backfire? Well, I think that I think the fact that we're here today says that the response is going to happen. Um, but I do, Alan, want to push back a little bit because uh, you know one of the things that I talk about probably the most when I'm talking about the Citizens Council is that I'm not sure they failed. And so, you know, we, I think when I first got into the project, my question definitely was, what happened to these guys after they lost? Um, and as I really got into the research, I realized they, they don't, I mean, they were incredibly resilient. And I think the resistance to the civil rights movement itself was only one piece of it. Um, that they were always kind of angling for national impact. And one of the things that I talk about in the book um, that I bring up all the time, so for those of you who have heard this before, I apologize, but I, I just love it so much. Um, the founder of the Citizens Council was a guy named Robert Patterson. Um, and he's from the Delta, you know, Indianola, went to Mississippi State, was a football player, was a paratrooper, um, kind of an all-American guy. and. You know, he kind of fades from the leadership of the council over, you know, as they kind of move into their national campaign. But when the council shuts its brick and mortar operations in Jackson, um, this is around 1987, he's interviewed by a reporter who asks him, gosh, you know, I'm paraphrasing a little here, what was it all for? Like, you put up nearly 40 years of your life and career into this work. And now you're just shutting it all down. And this is the, this probably is the most profound thing that I read in my research. And I think about it all the time because I'm a graduate of a segregation academy. Um, he said, we didn't fail. I mean, look at white flights. Look at the popularity of segregation academies. We just aren't needed anymore. And... You know, so that organization became moot when people readopted a new approach to white supremacy that educated folks like me. Thank God for a place like Millsaps. I mean, really, because it was, it was my lifeline. Um, and I was talking to my students about this just yesterday because we were kind of looking at the Constitution in 1890, and it's a history of Mississippi class. And Ms. Millsaps was founded in 1890, and so like it's founded in the midst of kind of a resurgence of organized and legal white supremacy. And so just trying to locate our founders in that story is really important. Um, and you know, we're just kind of like trying to figure out education and trying to kind of figure out like segregation during this period of time. And one of the things we talked about and, and that I told them was, you know, the battles over education are practical because education, when it's doing its job, is revolutionary. It's supposed to be. So these battles that we have over books and history textbooks, we can suppress it for a moment, but I feel confident in the fact that we have enough passionate, committed folks, many of whom are in this room and surrounding me right now, that the resurgence will come and that revolution will come back, but we cannot let up. We cannot coast when we get one thing accomplished. It has to be relentless. And so, you know, when we're in our classrooms, when we're talking to our relatives, God help us, you know, this is my big battle myself. When we're talking to people who don't agree with us, please stay in that room. Please talk to them. Have the conversation. Do not alienate them. We can't do that with our students. We have to keep them in that space. We have to walk them through that. And so as long as we're doing that work, they will come behind us and they will pick up the banner and they will keep doing it. But we have to be consistent. And when we're frustrated, let's find each other and complain to each other, um, but always stay active for them because 
there will always be groups like the Citizens Council. And when they disappear, it means that they have done enough work that they don't have to be active anymore. And we have to be better than that. That's a very interesting observation. Thank you. Next question is for you, Jay. Tribal history was distorted or overlooked by the U.S. government from the outset. It was part of the process of forced assimilation, and it was also a way to justify conquest. I'm wondering how have the Choctaws addressed that, having been marginalized, their, their history having been marginalized by mainstream culture? And as a keeper of the Choctaw story, what do you have to say to people who are concerned that certain history books might make some students uncomfortable? Okay. Good morning. Uh, the place that we are now, uh, my ancestors used to walk, used to roam. The lands of, uh, even before Mississippi became a state. Uh, so these things are just information that uh, for myself, I was like uh, looking at uh, leaving the state of Mississippi, you know, joining join the Marine Corps and, you know, checking out different cultures and uh, throughout the world and coming back and, and trying to figure out who am I. So, you know, starting to do research and that's where looking at textbooks, okay, I was, you know, force-fed information as, as a kid, I had no choice uh, but to accept what was told by, by authority of teachers and educators. But as an adult, I started questioning, um, really, where's information about my people uh, or indigenous people that used to be here in Mississippi? And what was here before Mississippi? So it, it was just a journey for myself to find information, and it wasn't there. Um, banned books and, you know, the omission of uh, information uh, or perspectives of, you know, the people that are actually uh, writing these books uh, have, doesn't take an account from our perspective, from our stories, and uh, what we think about these things, and uh, throughout the whole process, uh, we see uh, in the state of Mississippi is, you know, just driving around, you can, uh, there's a lot of uh, remnants of uh, town names, of uh, words of uh, rivers and places, and a lady over here said uh, some Copaya, I mean, that's a Choctaw word, and, and uh, you know, the city of Jackson's named after, uh, uh, you know, one guy that took a lot of our lands. <laughs> Uh, that's what it is, but we don't teach that in, in our uh, in school, and the treaty process and um, and of trying to change that narrative with, uh, um, you know, uh, as as I get opportunities like this uh, book festival as a band book festival, it is an opportunity to get that information out. Uh, people don't know there's a native tribe in Mississippi, uh, one federally recognized tribe in Mississippi, which is the Mississippi and Choctaw Indians. Uh, but before that, we had a lot of native tribes. I mean, Yazoo, Biloxi, Tunica, all these names people understand our cities are actually named after Indian nations. Pascagoula. So, so all that information is that, I guess for myself, it's the omission of that information available to me that kind of uh, drove me to learn because I have uh, my kids. They're going to be asking these questions and um, it's for me to identify, um, we have our traditions, we have our art forms, we have our life ways. And as I learned, as I researched, and you know, uh, during uh, one of the conferences I was in, it's like a social studies group is redoing a uh, curriculum for middle school, and I asked them, uh, what was the first capital of Mississippi? I think I maybe I had a couple hands that went up, that was, you know, Natchez. That's after a treaty of Fort Adams, when we lost about two, over two million acres. Then, when it, uh, after a while, came down to miss, uh, lost more lands. Were that's why the reason of maybe uh, you know this area was considered Lafleur's Bluff, uh, tra a trading post, and Lafleur was the father of uh, you know a renowned Choctaw leader. But before then, uh, yeah, he had a, a trading post over here, and we lost another two million acres in Treaty of Dog Stand. 
And so they moved the capital to Jackson and named it after Andrew Jackson. Hines County, named after Colonel Hines, were one of one, the people that actually were in the treaty process. And for us to understand, uh, like for myself, is uh, what is a treaty process? It's a compromise, you can come to an agreement with two nations, and uh, we never <laughs> understood the treaty process. Our history, our, the way we uh, passed on traditional knowledge was through our oral history, our family uh, tradition of storytelling, of, uh, of having taken that responsibility of providing information and insight in uh, the way of life for us. And, you know, during the treaty process, we just, uh, you know, we got had. <laughs> uh, you know, we, we got the short end of the stick. And over a uh, time of nine different treaties, we lost uh, you know, most of Mississippi. Uh, but we never considered Mississippi to be owned by one group. We never knew uh, the written, pro uh, written agreements considered as uh, contracts and treaties. So, uh, now I've got, I want to change that. I want to change the textbooks. I'm a, you know, it starts somewhere, the res, um, resurgence of information. It's just uh, withholding information. And uh, so it's, uh, it's been a journey of mine and uh, with uh, my tribe to actually uh, change the narrative. And let's go ahead and affect change by putting that information because that's the textbook. textbooks required by my, my kids to be in that school and required by the state of Mississippi, uh, or also even my wife was a teacher, and said, how do I teach this? It doesn't really mean what it says in this textbook. We know it differently what the actual uh, events that took place there. How do I teach it? She's asking me. I said, well, she's required to teach that little piece, but then I said, well, you come supplement that information with, uh, you know, uh, probably research and teach the kids to, um, a challenge that information. I mean, like today's uh, landscape of uh, the internet, instant access of information, um, or, you know, it's just, uh, as long as they can start asking the questions why, then there is hope for us. That's very interesting. I would like to read your History of Mississippi textbook. I think you should, you should consider doing that. It would be, a, I think, a really welcome contribution to all of our understanding. Co, I have a question for you as a journalist. History is, of course, directly informed by news reporting. And if books can be banned because they make certain people uncomfortable, would it naturally follow that certain news outlets could find themselves on the outside? I mean, we're already seeing attacks on the media. And you mentioned in one of your articles this sort of feedback loop that the media is prone to as they were in the case of looting during, in New Orleans during Katrina, that because these stories get hits, people tend to follow the same familiar pathways. So I'm curious to know how far you think, given the current environment, we're all reacting to it in one way or another. We're either re reacting against it or people are falling prey to it. But I'm wondering if you see the potential for reporters to adapt in ways that might counterintuitively accommodate this effort by courting supportive readers or trying to satisfy publishers or other elected officials who make decisions that might limit their ability to report. Sure. Um... So I'll say this with, I know there's some journalists in this room, so I'm not necessarily talking about y'all um, or myself, <laughs> but I find the media landscape in this state particularly depressing. Um, Jackson has a lot of outlets and a lot of resources in that regard, but my family lives in Neshoba County. There's one newspaper, the Neshoba Democrat, which is billed as a community newspaper, but what it really is is um, the weekly arrest log, the white cook of the week, um, and whatever the police are giving directly to, at one point it was, it, it's like, you can't make this stuff up. It was the police chief, uh, his mother was the managing editor of the paper. So he's literally just running her whatever to put on the front page. And 
it's like funny in a way and also deeply unfunny when it, the human toll is when children are arrested at 13 and charged as adults, that's the front page. And that's what a lot of people's understanding of their neighbors are, right? And that's how those narratives begin. And so I think like there's, we don't have, like a lot of places in Mississippi, and it's not only here, it's throughout the country and the world where you can run a school board meeting, school board meeting or a supervisor meeting or a town hall meeting or any sort of public uh, accountability meeting and have zero press there. The courts function with zero journalists sitting in, in, in there. There are no accountability levers. So I think that's a huge part of what I think about when I think about the place that I call home is that there is a culture of people being able to do whatever they want, people being able to run for things unopposed, people being able to say what they want and do what they want without any regard for anyone else because that's the way the press operates there. And what that also means is that the kids in my community don't really understand what I do and they don't understand the opportunities that are there in terms of like, you can tell your own stories and that this is a way to make a living and also make the place that you live better. And so I think we are, there's like two things at work. There's obviously the legacy of the press where that has always erased stories about my ancestors. I write a lot about my stepdad's family who, my stepdad's from Neshoba County, born and raised. Um, but my mother's side of the family, my mom's here, is also has roots in Mississippi. We're from Edwards. and. I always think about the fact that I was not raised in Mississippi because my family had to leave because of the violence that happened in my family and to my family. And I think that part of that, part of the only reason we know a story about my great great uncle who was lynched in Edwards, Mississippi is because there was a white wire that ran a story about a lynching party. And that's all we have. We have this story about how he didn't yield the sidewalk um, on his way to church this white couple and apparently he returned and opened fire after church and killed a doctor amid the bystanders which let's be serious wouldn't he be killed immediately after that like there's just so many open holes there but that's all we have and that's a lot more than a lot of black americans can say about what they know about how far back their roots go and yet and still what we have is this what we know is a racially biased piece of paper um and i wish we had the paper right we have this like Thing through Ancestry.com where we found it because of Newspapers.com and their partnership. So we have the legacy of the press that has always failed, period, in that regard. And then we have where we are today, which is that we still don't show up. And that's the lion's share of our job, is to be places and to listen and be in community with people. And I think that that is missing in so many aspects. Um, and so it's hard to, it's hard to think about what it would look like for things to get banned that aren't happening because we're at a place where there's so much erasure by the fact of like not capturing um, the joy in our communities, the achievements that kids have should be in the local paper. Um, when, yeah, so I, I think about that a lot because there is just so, mu so many things that make it hard to then go back as a historian to document because a lot of us do go back and look at newspaper records, but if the first draft of history is not there, then what are we doing? Well, that's really interesting, you know, and, and what I'm hearing is, you know, the, the limitations that are attempted to be, be placed on historical information obviously are not new. I mean, these are all these communities that we're talking about have been living with this for a long, long time. We're just seeing a resurgence now. And given the fact that most Americans are not very educated when it comes to history, it's just unfortunate, but true. And there are not that many students who are majoring in history anymore. And so you wonder, with, with the kinds of discrepancies and, and overt attempts to suppress history that we're talking about over a long period of time, how do you respond to what's happening now, to this resurgence where there's actually a, you know, a concerted effort to limit any history that makes someone uncomfortable. I mean, I, so I'd, I'd be interested to know from each of you what, what your approach is to that. What, what do you, if you were talking to 
your peers or your children, how would you explain to them what is the workaround when you live in a country where there is, in many cases, successful effort to limit the teaching of historical facts? What, what's the solution to this? How do you, how do you overcome that? Let's we'll start with you. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I think I was a history major, undergrad. I went to Spelman College um, in Atlanta. And history, before I got to Spelman, like, you think about what kids go through in a, so, in a regular social studies course, and it's boring, um, in part because a lot of people are not seeing themselves or making the connections to today. And that is a disservice because it, it presents a topic that is so pivotal um, as dry. And that's just not true. And it wasn't until, Spelman was the first place that I actually learned about Freedom Summer and the murders that happened in Neshoba County. And I went to Spelman right after we had moved to Mississippi from New Jersey. And so it was this moment where I had never had a black professor really um, throughout my, I transferred to Spelman. So I, I came in second semester, sophomore year. I hadn't had a black professor. Um, I went to boarding school before that. I had no black teachers. And so to have a black woman who chose textbooks, right, um, for us to read that would literally reflect, were reflecting a history that I was learning. My parents got married at Mount Zion United Methodist Church, which is the church that the Klan burned um, that set off, um, you know, that set the trap for the Freedom Summer murders of Cheney Goodman and Schwerner. And so it was, it was unreal to be in a textbook and then going home and being able to live that history. And so I think about ways all the time that we can like engage children in that way and younger people in that way where they can see themselves and live the history and understand these, these, a lot of this history is not even that old. And I'll end by saying the piece that I wrote in The Atlantic, which is about the effort that my stepdad and some other older black um, locals to Neshoba County are doing to, you know, it's, it's, it's an incredible effort and it shouldn't be that hard to do a, a civil rights tour through Neshoba County, but it's incredibly hard to access unless you know who to ask. I know who to ask because my stepdad does the tours. But if you go to the tourism bureau, it depends on which white lady you get at the front, who's gonna, get, who's gonna give you the number to call, to maybe you can call my stepdad, maybe you can call the mayor's friend, and maybe they'll be available and maybe they won't, and maybe you wasted your time. And at the end of the day, I think about what Toni Morrison said about racism, which is that it functions as a distraction. And all of this stuff is distracting from the people who are interested in engaging with this history. And what the end result is, the man who, one of the men, white men who runs the tourism office is that he didn't learn the history when he went through Neshoba County Schools. He still doesn't know the history. And he stands in the way of other people getting to the history because the conversation that I had with him is one where it's like, well, it's not our responsibility. It's Mount Zion's responsibility. And we would help them if, but we don't want to get in the way. And yet you are. And so I think about that a lot, is that a lot of it is intentionally inaccessible and also can be extremely interesting. We get so much great feedback from people who come and are able to get, get the tours and engage with the history in that way. But I think we have to think a lot about why you can go to Neshoba County and people act like they're, people know Neshoba County because of the Neshoba County Fair, and that's not true. People know Philadelphia, Mississippi because of what happened there in 1964. And so you should not be able to come to Philadelphia, Mississippi without feeling like when you're in a city like Montgomery that is going through their project of, with, the EJ, with EJI where you walk through that city now and there's markers on every corner about what happened here and what happened here. You shouldn't be able to drive by the old Neshoba County Jail and the marker is so far off the road and now it's an apartment and it's on a skinny street and so you can't even really see what happened. And it's, it's unacceptable, but it's a, an opportunity also to evaluate who is in the way in your, in your areas, in your families, in your schools that are, there are a lot of gatekeepers who pretend that they're not and that's part of this whole like gaslighting effort because it, everyone is acting like they don't have a role in it and there are a lot of people with a lot of power who do. Oh, I have family in Edwards too, so we have to talk. Have to talk. <laughs> But um, as a historian, and, and just to answer your question, Alan, um, I think Stuart, you know, a couple of years ago through the American Historical Association, there was a panel in New Orleans that I didn't get to participate in. However, one of the things that we're talking about the erasure of uh, certain narratives in history, 
But the other thing that historians are up against even right now in 2023 is that there are conversations around history being a dying discipline. And I think it was mentioned that the way in which history is presented, young people often don't see themselves in that history. They see it as being boring and, and not as engaging. But some of that also can be um, combated when we start at home because my first history lesson started at home. And I, I think that that is extremely important. Um, the beauty of working at a place like Historic Tougaloo College is that I have academic freedom mm -hmm. and that I'm able to go into the classroom and teach history in such a way that students are engaged with it. They see themselves in that history. They embrace that history. They're proud of that history. But they're also getting a balanced narrative in which they're learning about themselves, learning about Tougaloo's history, but they're also learning about the Citizens Council. Uh, they're, they're learning ways not, when they're teaching them how to think, what to think, but how to think. And, and also making sure that when these young people see oppression, they call their oppressors out. That, that, that's really important. So, um, I'm sorry about that. But I, I think that, that that's what has been most rewarding for me. But I think there's also hope in, in some of what I have seen when we, we've had tour groups to come to Tougaloo's campus to learn more about the history of the civil rights movement, to learn more about the institutions founding on the soil that was once a former slave plantation. Um, and I just recently gave a tour for some high school students, middle school students. And these middle schoolers were reading Ann Moody's Coming of Age in Mississippi. Have that on me. I didn't read that book until I was a junior in college at Tougaloo College. So that, that's where the optimism and the hope lies for me, is that there are people who are pushing a bat against, um, against the bands that are in place, and they're making sure that a complete and uh, holistic offering of this history is uh, given to young people to expand their intellectual capacity uh, so they can think critically about the world in which they live and also think about ways in which they can, tr can contribute to positive change in those communities that they're coming from. Thank you for that. That's interesting. You know, what I'm hearing from both of y'all is that we're actually, there's actually a template for overcoming these sorts of bans that certain communities in the state who have seen their history be suppressed have found workarounds historically that actually could inform how we can adapt to the environment we find ourselves in now. Do you have any observations about the, the you want me to repeat the question? Oh, I have observations. <laughs> um, I mean, I think what Co and Daphne are pointing out are, you know, I mean, I, I'm on fire about it. Um, you know, it is great that we have institutions like Tougaloo and Millsaps and, and places where we're not regulated by the state. And we don't have folks reaching into our classrooms. But I can't let, I have a, I have a 15 year old who's, a, who's in the audience today. Um, and, and so, yeah, I, you know, I scope through her history materials. And I like want to hear, like, what did they teach you about this? Um, and sometimes I'm really relieved and sometimes I'm, you know, kind of devastated. But, um, you know, it really is important for us to embed this in public education. Um, as great as private institutions are, we, we just aren't big enough. You know, Daphne and I were talking earlier about the exhaustion of, you know, being focused on enrollment all the time, keeping our lights on, you know, just making sure that we're operational every day so that we can do this work. You know, one of the things that strikes me, Alan, when you ask this question is that, one, I mean, because I'm a Southern historian, I do, you know, run into folks all the time who are um, interested in history as kind of a curiosity, it's like a hobby. And unfortunately, I think what's happened is that because social studies in general is not raised to the same level as STEM education in our public schools is, that it becomes a hobby. And so, you know, when we talk about history as power, all of a sudden this comes out of nowhere. Like, we actually might be able to move the needle on some things if we better understood our history. That's the whole point of it is for us to better understand ourselves and how we got here. And then actually this moment that we're in right now, we've been here before. And a lot of people had died because of moments like this and because of resistance that's been leveled against it. 
And gosh, if we could avoid that, that would be amazing. But I'm having trouble understanding how we get there unless it's embedded into our K through 12 curriculum. So that we, I mean, the amount of time that we have to spend in our college classrooms catching our students up when they're like, wait a minute, who is this Medgar Evers? Who is the Citizens Council? What do you mean about public education being contested or the fact that the place that I graduated from was founded as a segregation academy? It's the first time these students have ever, I mean, that was my experience as well, Daphne. I mean, I, I read Ann Moody at Millsaps. Um, not a surprise because I went to a segregation academy. Um, but, you know, like, if, unless we embed this into our public education, people will dismiss history as something that's more of a curiosity and, and kind of ignore the fact that it's kind of the whole thing. And unless we do that and we talk about how important it is, we're not gonna have students who want to major in history or philosophy or religious studies or English literature or any of those things because they're seen as a curiosity or something that we do in our spare time. And it's really like the intelligence of our culture and where we come from and who we are. And so, you know, I, I want us to keep doing our work, um, but I mean, it's really important. But gosh, we could do so much more if our students were better prepared when they got here. I mean, think how many professional humanities folks would be out there doing advocacy work, doing scholarship, working for nonprofits, working in the archives. I mean, I, I worry that in 15 years, nobody's gonna be in those fields and we're gonna have a bunch of STEM folks. So we're gonna have great technology, but we will have lost our humanity in the process. Very interesting observation too. You know, when you mentioned the, including this in the curricula of, of K through 12, you know, all I can think about is, you know, these governors who are signing executive orders to ban the teaching of any history with an inherently divisive concept or that sort of thing. It was a big challenge for doing just what you described. As someone who's, inherently divisive concepts have been sort of important to their culture. How, how, how do the Choctaws, how, 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 from your perspective, having gone through this, this cultural experience as a people, you know, what can you tell us about how to respond to this current moment of trying to limit understanding of history? Uh, I guess throughout the day, uh, what well, different uh, panels we had, I was like, where are our investigative journalists kind of bringing truth uh, to life for us? And that's something that we have to instill in our young to actually uh, kind of um, get, get into these fields where they can help us as a people. Uh, for us, for me, it's like uh, we do uh, different programs. Uh, of uh, class one is, who am I? I am Choctaw, that's class one. And we start a journey from our ancestors to today and uh, try to get involved with uh, uh, oral histories, our traditions, our life ways, and, and a lot of these uh, are new concepts to our own um, Choctaw children. And it's really about who they are and then trying to understand to have an open mind to uh, find this information or question uh, the information that's just uh, force fed. So um, kind of work with uh, different uh, groups to bring to light uh, a lot of this information as uh, like today, the Band Folk Book Festival, or, and I see uh, Stuart over there, we kind of talked about a few things and working with it, uh, different schools here, even uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, we'll, have, we'll, we'll be doing some at the Mississippi College, you know, home of the Choctaws, so Choctaws are involved now. So, <laughs> or just, uh, just going around, uh, like with uh, the Mississippi State Fair, you know, uh, like it has, uh, portrays uh, different aspects of Mississippi and we were never a part of that. Um, so how can we be a part of that where it's, uh, information is out there? Even our own children identifies with non-Choctaw traditions and non-Choctaw everything, and then uh, it's because they've never been introduced 
Um, we we uh, have a school system that we are managing on our own. However, uh, a lot of our own traditions are not being taught. A lot of our history is not being taught. So now, uh, for myself, I've kind of understood that a lot of our older uh, the generation has been conditioned to push that back. Uh, they grew up in a society of where, you know, not being able to speak their our own language, do our own traditions, or even question uh, the status quo. So now, with the younger generation, uh, there's a lot of, oh, why do we do this? How come we don't do that? And there's a lot of questions, and that's great. And I try to challenge our, our kids to say, okay, question that. I'm mean, asking, just, just for your information, find that out. Uh, just, just, just don't take the information that's handed to you. Uh, take a look at it, question it, and then ask other, get different perspectives. Um, one big thing with our tribe has been we've been kind of invisible for a long time. Uh, and, you know, I think it's more recently we opened our doors and invited other, you know, our neighbors to even come and check us out through different fairs and different, uh, you know, uh, festivals. Um, and a lot of those things were kind of on our own that we can change the narrative and say, okay, let's, let's kind of... Um, teach people about ourselves, our, the history. We, we predate uh, the Mississippi State history. Well, so we predate United States history. And so a lot of this information is, is it's out there. It's just now we're finally getting to a point where let's, take, let's, let's utilize uh, today's technologies, the internet, uh, you know, uh, virtual learning, because we can't you know, uh, access different parts of the state and you know, uh, go to different schools. Uh, you got the schools named after uh, uh, Choctaw tribes or native tribes. Uh, we have a lot of stories that we need to share. And that's just where, uh, as a storyteller, as a tradition bearer, that's, whole, that's where I am starting with my kids, but I'm, I've kind of been branching out with uh, you know, the Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians, and it's B-A-N-D, uh, but you know, looking at our past, it's B-A-N-N-E-D of Choctaw Indians because there's not a lot of information. That's, that's uh, I guess, uh, it's changing the narrative for me. That's good. I think we're to the Q&A point right now. If it, uh, all right, yes, ma'am. Oh, uh, just curious to know uh, how the appointment of Deb Holland as Interior Secretary has helped Native American people, your people, to bring your story out. This is this opportunistic for us to have uh, someone that understands uh, sovereign nations, uh, sovereign um, responsibilities. You know, uh, we expect a lot of ourselves uh, to bring to light uh, our, the issues that we face sometimes, and that's something that's why uh, we've been kind of invisible. We've been kind of quiet for a long time. Uh, so as a sovereign nation, as a, uh, native tribes, but at now uh, we've kind of have understanding. You know, when ears are closed, you know, you know, people not taking that in. But now we have a lot of people that have. have I mean, look, this group here uh, can, are listening, are open-minded, and you know, we want to share different perspectives. So uh, it's a great opportunity for all native tribes. Yes. Dr. Chamberlain made reference to Tugaloo College as a bastion of freedom, openness, and I can say, after having served at Tugaloo College from 1972 to 2021, and uh, I'm still connected through a grant uh, dealing with uh, modern-day slavery and human trafficking, I can say that it certainly has been open. I was always free to teach what I wanted to teach. But what's very interesting, and I'm going to follow it up very quickly with a question, is that uh, when I was a colleague of Jim Lowen's, I was in political science, Jim in sociology, Jim mentioned that he did some research in the Delta, and he was talking to a superintendent of schools up there, a white man, and the superintendent said, oh, we hired students from a lot of the African-American colleges and universities, there's no problem there. And Jim said, what about Tougaloo College? He said, no, they come with too many ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Which is very interesting. I wonder if history is <coughs> reversing itself a little bit. We're coming back, uh, we're losing some ground, unfortunately, in some of these red states. And in the 1960s, 
Jackson State faculty and students were very much restricted in their freedom as far as getting involved in the civil rights struggle and open communication because of the State Sovereignty Commission and because of the Mississippi Legislature, the, the, the Institution of Higher Learning. I wonder what's going to happen with Jackson State now if they're feeling pressure uh, under the circumstances where we're starting to get this education against so-called critical police theory, Tougaloo and private schools, Tougaloo, Millsaps, other private schools in red states may be free to play the role that Tougaloo played in the 1960s. Because it, even though it was vulnerable, the state legislature tried to provoke us on a charter. But I wonder if Jackson State, as Tougaloo is free to move forward and to and to teach history openly, I wonder if Jackson State's going to run into problems and it's already feeling some sort of pressure. But I can say that my colleagues and I, through our faculty senate, established uh, a resolution a couple years ago to, uh, to make it very clear that we would not be deterred, that we would not be controlled, that we would not be bullied against teaching honest, correct, equitable history, especially as it relates to uh, black histories, Afro histories, people of color, and, and substantiated truth. And so they can try to stop us, but <laughs> we're doing it every single day. So. You have a question? I do have a question. So um, my wife is a high school history teacher who can't get a job teaching high school history because she's not a coach. So, um, yeah. so what role do you think um, employees and coaches as history teachers plays in sort of um, maintaining that status quo um, in the teaching industry in K-12? Do you have ob observations about that? I mean, I think it. I think it underscores what I mentioned earlier. Is that I mean, I you know I know some great coaches who I, and my kids have had coaches who have been incredible teachers. So it's not necessarily an A to B you know sort of equation. But um, you know, there. I, I mean, I think part of it. You know, like as great. I was on a. Um, I'm on the standards review committee for the Department of Education in Mississippi, and we were looking at a particular period of time. And one of the things that, um, one of the things that was clear to me, it was, it was, a, it was um, a room full of women, and those teachers are radical. Like, they were making suggestions to the standards that I, as a college professor, did not feel liberated to do. Um, and so, like, I, I think that, you know, I, I do want to caution all of us not to, and I, I'm saying this to myself because my daughter's in the room and she'll hold me accountable later, maybe in front of all of y'all. Um, I don't want to be too critical of teachers, whether they're coaches or not, because they are so handcuffed. I want them to do X, Y, and Z all the time, and I want them to do it twice as hard and twice as better. But the system doesn't give them that kind of liberation. Um, and so, like, just being in that space and reviewing the standards, and there weren't any coaches in there that I knew of, but, you know, their will is there. Not all of them, and I can't speak for all of them, but for, the, for these women who are on the standards review committee, the will is there, but the time is limited. Um, and we're pushing students so quickly, as early as like seventh and eighth grade, to pick a career path, you know? And, and so like, there's just, the system is aligning in a way that we could have the best teacher coaches in the whole world. We don't. And we still would only be able to get to a certain point. So, I mean, I do think it is a question of resources though. So in the case of your wife, I think that is a question of resources, trying to double up on people's responsibilities because just teaching isn't enough. I mean, you know, in college, in, in the college world, we feel this too. It's not enough for us to just be teachers. We have to be administrators. We have to be budget officers. We have to do all, we have to be recruiters. You know, so like, I think this is a reflection on our culture's investment or lack of investment in education. Um, I just want to add real quick. Um, one of the things that stuck with me in the way that 
I was raised was a lot of the things that you're going to learn that are important are going to happen at home. So there's an understanding in a lot of black households that what you get at school is never going to be enough. And that's layered in many ways. And I say that also thinking about a lot of the things that we've, um, like obviously I, I went to college, I went to grad school, and also that's not the reality or a necessity for everybody in this state. And I think that saying all that to say that there have to be more community-led opportunities to engage with children outside of schools, because we know that there's always going to be a limitation um, and a bias towards certain children. Um, and um, yeah, I think about that as someone who's not interested in having children, but cares a lot about the future and the opportunities for children in this state in particular, and what that looks like after school. Um, because so many kids, my, my mom's a pediatrician, um, and she runs a kids program um, outside of Mount Zion. Um, she does amazing things and opens the kids' world to all types of things. And so I think about opportunities like that where, you know, we, you know, have children in our village that we can uh, interact with and help and bring along in that way, especially when we know that our schools are not doing enough. Thank you all. We got time for a couple of more. All right. Yeah. Okay. So first of all, I want to thank you guys for having the courage to do this. Uh, you said you've done your roots. I've done mine as well. My great, great aunt married Robert E. Lee's son. Making, yeah, making them aunts and uncles. I know this till two years ago. And I can tell you, I support CRT all the way, critical race theory. They are not teaching that crap correctly because roughly four million slaves in the 1860, and you're gonna tell me it was over cotton? No, it was over African people, African human traffic. That's what the Civil War was about. They don't want to admit to it, I don't know why. And thank God that statue of Robert E. Lee is gone because it's a white supremacist statue that should have never been there to begin with. Sir, I'm sorry if you're indigenous people because my ancestors are the reason you don't know your history and many other people don't. They were colonizers, white supremacists. We like Pocahontas a lot in our culture, but we don't want to talk about why she was kidnapped. We don't want to dispel the truth. So I'm sorry you don't get to know your culture because my white culture destroyed it from you. I'm sorry for that. Now, my, comment, my question to you guys was, I was a former educator and I taught history a little bit in the Mississippi Delta. And I taught during COVID, which was the worst thing on earth. I gotta tell you, I'm all for teaching kids CRT and stuff, but what I saw in the classroom was a lot of those kids hate coming to school, one. Two, I gotta tell you, for a teenager, I'm pretty sure they'd rather choose to watch TikTok videos than read a book and research real history, which I'm all for researching, but if I went in there going, hey, let's research history, it's like, no, I wanna watch this person jump into a wall four times on TikTok who's a millionaire in real life because they think about getting famous and stuff. So. What do you think is the best approach to that? Because I don't know. Any ideas? I taught English uh, at Hattiesburg High School uh, for the past seven years, so you used the TikTok video. Yeah, absolutely. Right? So I was thinking what, what Stephanie was talking about, when you're talking about standards, you're not really as handcuffed as you think you are. Right. Right? You can literally bring those cell phones into the classroom. And so that's what I would do. I mean, if they allow them in the classroom. Well, I mean, you gotta have those conversations. I think, so So again, to, to Stephanie's point, right? I think it's more about why you are a teacher and not necessarily about like getting handcuffed by those standards. So if you're having those conversations, those PLC meetings and those standard meetings, et cetera, et cetera, and if, if teaching that is more important to you in general, right? Because I didn't care what they said outside of my classroom. When I closed that door, I taught how I wanted to teach. And so I think I think there, there just needs to be more of us in those conversations. You know, because I you are absolutely right, those kids would much rather see a TikTok video. So then create with the standard a TikTok video lesson that is supplemented with the text, and then you allow them to have their own. I mean, that sounds like a perfect paradise, but the administrators will give you hell if they see those TikTok videos or social media, and if they hear you mention slavery, you're gone out the door. You don't even get a chance, because they're scared of their own reputation, school bureaucracy, BS. You're absolutely right, but those administrators are also handcuffed because there's not a lot of line up to be a teacher, right? And so I think, I think we are just, we provide our own handcuffs a lot of times. We, they've said this all day, we are the people that have the power. Angie Thomas said that just literally in the last one. And so I think we have to have those conversations. There's this 
Like, I wanted to ask a question about like this disconnect between scholarship and those everyday folks, because you also have to almost teach the community as well. Yeah, if we good. know that a lot of that takes place inside of the homes before they even get to the school, you have to also educate that community, right? So there's a lot of work that kind of goes into it, and I think a lot of times we shirk at doing that work. Not you, right? I'm just saying no, yeah, yeah. people in general, we no, shirk, yeah. administrators, the teachers, etc. And it just sounds good to say, you know, that there's a lot of pushback, but a lot of times when I gave that pushback, I didn't receive what I was afraid of. It just really didn't exist. No, I way. agree with you. The community thing, the only problem yeah, yeah. is <laughs> This is really interesting. It really is. And I feel like, I feel like there's a lot of opportunity for further discussion here, and unfortunately, not much more time. So, uh, yeah, we'll take one more question. And I think probably that's all we got time for. Go ahead. Um, so, this is, uh, so, um, I'm about to ask my question. Um, I'm not going to talk for long because I know that we're, we have like limited amount of time. I just wanted to, I'll, I'm my mother's child, so I wanted to elaborate on what my mom said a little bit. Um, also, what you said a little bit, there's still kids my age that whenever I mention Pocahontas as like a real person, they're like, she's not real, she's just a Disney princess. Like there are kids my age and older that still say that. And I have to look it up and prove to them that she is real. And I mean, the whole, I mean, so I am in AP World History this year. I'm a freshman and I have learned a lot this year. And I think that my current teacher who my mom actually taught, um, he went here, uh, Tyler Hargrave. He, he is a great teacher. I think he's really good. But one of the things, I mean, not something he did wrong, but one of the things that I've noticed is like right now, we're talking about World War I and War, World War II. Throughout the entire year, if he would ask us a question, nobody would answer because nobody knew the answer. But now, when he asks a question, if it's about the Holocaust or about Hitler or something, they know the answer. They just automatically know, but they don't know about civil rights stuff. They don't know about like, the Russian Revolution, the American Revolution, the British Revolution, or the, not the British, the French Revolution. They don't know about any of that. And I just, this, I mean, I'm not saying that this is Mr. Hargrave's fault at all, because he's teaching, teaching us that. But we focus so much on the stuff that we want to focus on, like the interesting history, when really we should be focusing on all of the history, because it, it matters to all of us. Even if, like, the French Revolution didn't involve us, we still need to know about it because we inspired the French Revolution. And, um, anyways, I, I'll, I'll stop talking. Um, my question was um, just so, as you know, as a white girl, I struggle sometimes. To, it's a question for Miss um, Co and Dr. Daphne. Sorry. Um, I just, I was just wondering if there's anything that I, as a 15 year old, can do to help what you guys are trying to do. Like, even if it's just something small, what, like, is there anything that kids my age can do? I think we just articulated it extremely well. <laughs> I've known your mom since we were. I don't know, we met like in 2007 as students and, and we have had a relationship that has spanned all of those years and I see a lot of her in you. So I, I think you articulated it extremely well that um, if we're going to teach history, we need to teach all of it. And um, just in listening to the conversation between Dr. Lumumba and Angie Thomas um, prior to this particular session, uh, Angie talked about fear. And I think that, that that's a really important aspect because even when we talk about um, fiction that is based on, or so, that serves as social commentary for the times in which we live, fear is also one of the reasons why we aren't getting all of this history that is missing from the textbooks in which students are reading even today. So um, it's not about what you can do because you're already doing it. And I think that um, young people have the opportunity to influence other young people. And it's, it's already obvious in the, the path that you're going to go. So, hey, come to Tougaloo because Tougaloo and Millsaps had that relationship. To, 
to see what else can be done, but you're already doing it. You have anything to add? Um, not much. I'm wondering if we can, if like we don't have time to answer questions, if we could just hear them. And no, then... I'll, I'm not in charge. So as long as they'll let us have the room, I'm, I'm just, totally. I, I'm enjoying this discussion. Are, book, Go ahead. Like uh, okay. Did you see someone? His hand, hand, hand. Yeah. One more question, okay. Um, <laughs> she's had her hand up. This is yeah. Alan. Alan. Okay. Alan. 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 She's had her hand up this entire time. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm a graduate student at Texas State. Um, I'm major in the history department. And the section that really interested me is about the decreasing, like the amount of historians in the field. And I honestly think, well, I want you guys to address my hand. Um, I do feel like being and working in the field is a luxury. Because as like the price of living is increasing, so like I mean, I mean, like I'm in the entry level, so I often look at jobs and I wonder like how can they expect someone to live off this? And I, being a historian is such a burden, but this is heavy work, work that people do every day. So I feel as if like I'm really interested, interested like because I really love the work that I'm doing now with the Mark Walker Center. But I often think to myself, how can I sustain myself in this field and not burn out in this in this career field? Yeah. Does anybody have any advice? I remember you from the historical society panel. So um, my my response is too long. I know how I've dealt with it. So you can come talk with me. But yeah, um, that's that's a great question. It is a good question, and I'm sorry that we have to curtail the discussion because it's a fascinating discussion. And think a lot. I thank you all for offering what your insights into this. I know we're at time, but there's a young person in the back with a question. I would love to end up there. Where? Which one? Um, um, as a Native American youth, I kind of want to provide my um, perspective. Present yourself. There you go. Public speaking. Yeah. Kind of like what she said. Well, um, as you know, youth, I look into what history book, and I don't see you know representation for myself. Because uh, generalized, sometimes if there is something about me, it's just Native Americans, not individual tribes, and that's and that's what I really want to learn about. And. I just want kind of my questions, kind of like uh, advice about what me as youth or just youth in general can do to help bring the history that they're trying to raise back. Insight into that. All right. Well, go ahead. Not to say this all day. Um, as an old white woman. I feel helpless a lot of times. When I was 20, I knew what I thought needed to be done, and I'm not too old to carry the sign, and we'll be glad to do that, but it's not enough. Money and power um, seem to control the pathways to where we go. So my advice would be vote. who just stood up is 15 and so that's not a possibility for at least it for, but for right now for the question on the table I feel like you are in a position that I wish I was in at 15 which is looking at the literature around me the history around me and immediately understanding that I'm not in it and also that I want to see more and do more it took me until I was in my 20s to realize that I had a lot of unlearning to do and so you are in an incredible position to seek out that information um, and to do some of your own archiving work and looking at what's also not there is so important. Um, and so, yeah, I would love to talk to you after, but I think I just want to at least say that you're in an incredible position of asking the questions and thinking about how to think about things rather than waiting for people to provide you with um, the thoughts. Amen. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you all. I think we have to go now. I, I'm sorry because it feels like the discussion is just getting going. Okay, and thank I, you. I mean, I'm bothered by this like way back.
think you were saying the exact I would like to thank the organizers of the first band book festival in Mississippi, uh, especially Sheena Evers, uh, Jerry Mitchell, Dr. Michael Pickard, and all the others. I would like to thank I would like to thank the organizers of the first band book festival in Mississippi, uh, especially Sheena Evers, uh, Jerry Mitchell. I would like to thank the organizers of the first band book festival in Mississippi, uh, especially Sheena Evers, uh, Jerry Mitchell, Dr. Michael Pickard, and all the others, too numerous to name, and I'm honored to be among you today. On September 20. 6, 2022, I found out that Native Son had been banned again. Far from being angry or even feeling bittersweet, my first reaction was sheer delight. Here
Ladies and gentlemen, if I could get your attention, we are about to start our next session. So if you can find your seats, quiet your cell phones, Once again, a couple of house, not house cleaning, but uh, a couple of announcements. Is the mic on? Okay. So y'all can hear me, right? All right. Should I be like my mother, say one, two, three, Oh, you're good. No spankings now. <laughs> we, are, we are in a room full of energy, full of movement, full of change. And we're going to continue that feeling with a video first of none other than Richard Wright's daughter, Julia Wright. And I see hands going up like this, but let's just give her an applause, okay? <laughs> Native son. Okay, I can go on, but I'm not going to because I know we're out of time. But if we can go ahead and start the video, and then we will continue this session. I would like to thank the organizers of the first band book festival in Mississippi, uh, especially Sheena Evers, uh, Jerry Mitchell, Dr. Michael Pickard, and all the others, too numerous to name, and I'm honored to be among you today. On September 26, 2022, I found out that Native Son had been banned again. Far from being angry or even feeling bittersweet, my first reaction was sheer delight. Here are the last lines of the poem I wrote called Bigger Unchained. My father's native son was just censored, leaving Bigger Unchained, free to haunt and roam the land, free to share the wisdom of his insight into their darkness. Richard Wright, our common ancestor, is laughing his special kind of laughter because he sees a wealth of unintended consequences at the bottom of the Pandora's box, their madness cannot close. My father always treated Bigger as an unruly and unrepentant alter ego, there by the grace of creative writing go I. So, the paradoxical fact that censorship could breathe new posthumous life into a literary creation of his, who died on the electric chair, would have appeared poetic justice to him. There are those who claim Richard Wright did not mind being censored as long as he made his way into white-sponsored print. But there are those who claim he minded a lot. As his daughter, and as a witness of his angst, I am of the opinion that, yes, he minded deeply, but that he trusted enough 
in his own art and in the future of black power, that eventually what was taken out would find its way back in. Time, as the publication of his rejected haiku, remember his haiku were commercially going to be a flop because they were too boring. Uh, and the uncensored manuscript of the man who lived underground last year. Time has proved him right. We know that the first 50 pages of the original manuscript of the man who lived underground were the graphic description of a forced police confession as grainy and bloody as withheld body cam. Those pages were severed because they would make white readership feel uncomfortable, quote unquote. We know about the censorship of part two of Black Boy to appease white Northern East Coast racism. We remember that ultra-racist Senator Bilbo condemned even the first part of Black Boy on the floor of the U.S. Senate, saying that my father's autobiography was, quote, a damnable lie from beginning to the end. It is the dirtiest, lousiest, filthiest, most obscene piece of writing that I have ever seen in print, unquote. So why the book banning today? Is it anything new? To the extent that the black man was never allowed a voice from the plantation forward, one would say banning is a symptom and the echoes of slavery in today's world are the disease. I remember Dr. C. Lee McInnes mentioning to me the case of a black man lynched because he had asked a question. That is, he used his tongue, he probed the outside world, he pursued knowledge, and he was doomed. A few weeks ago, I was on the BBC in England being interviewed about the coming release of the UK edition of the uncut version of The Man Who Lived Underground. And the word that came to me was dismemberment, the censorship of black writing as dismemberment. The word sounded so violent in my mouth but I had already pronounced it and I couldn't take it back. However, looking at the history of beheadings, one of the oldest forms of feudalistic capital punishment from the Latin caput head, this is also the torture unto death our American justice system is founded on tacitly endorsing dismemberment, but with the so-called technological improvement of electricity, gas, drugs, and bullets. The word dismemberment is powerfully plantation connected. The policy was to dismember families before the auction block. Today, dismember families before the prison. Going further, the severing of the head, later the washing of the brain, means the sectioning of the memory of the past, a loss of narrative as we go headless, rudderless. I would like to quote the black philosopher, Dr. George Yancey here, who speaks about the healing process of remembering, making it a hyphenated word. Dr. Yancey has just written to me 
and I would like to quote, he says, the root meaning of the concept has the sense of taking away. This is exactly what Europeans did to black people. They took us away from Africa. Indeed, it is what anti-black racial capitalism is doing, taking away our loved ones through carceral power, taking away our health through environmental racism, taking away our sanity through the use of anti-black ideology, taking away our food through food deserts, taking away our children through brutal policing, taking away our literature through banning, taking away our black ontology through all types of dehumanization. Dismemberment is the vicious site of castration and beating and flaying of black flesh. And yet, we have done the impossible. We remembered. We held ourselves together. We affirmed our humanity, our beauty, our psychic integrity, the family, the community." Unquote. And my abolitionist colleague, Sister Janine Jones reminds us that the concern for the physical integrity of our prisoners enshrines habeas corpus, produce the body, which is written in international law and is linked to the very threats of systemic and historic racial dismemberment. A few days after the BBC interview, I read in the press about Rashim Carter's beheading, his disappearance, and the comments in that press that, quote, that, quote, Mississippi is stuck in the Jim Crow 50s, unquote. Today's Mississippi is the Mississippi, the very Mississippi my father wrote of in The Long Dream, published in 1958, and for which he was so editorially frowned upon back then. Because in the words of his editors, Look here, Dick, we no longer have lynchings in the States. Your pages about lynchings will have to be rewritten because the situation has changed for the better, see? My father did not see and kept the lynchings in. So I will end with a word about the other side of the coin of white censorship and that is Black Silence. In chapter two of Black Boy, after the unforgettable pages on Silas Hoskins lynching, nine-year-old Richard asks his mother, why had we not fought back? And the fear that was in my mother slapped me into silence black silence. Richard and his brother, as children, experienced that silence as a censorship of meaning, born of black love and black fear. But there comes a time when black silence is our complicit reflection in a knowledge banning mirror. As we keep on writing, our banned words, like strong seeds, lie in waiting. Thank you. Thank you, Julia Wright. 
Thank you for understanding. Thank you for positioning us to reflect on dismemberment and reflect on your father, Richard Wright. Today has been an incredible day. You know, it's the, it's the season of awareness. And that season really never ends. And it's just been fueled by what we've seen and experienced today. As you look down your schedule, you see something that's consistent besides banned books. It's the erasement, erasing of so many things. You know, one of my favorite banned books, one of many, have already been talked about. Toni Morrison, I mean, we can go on and on. But one also hit me, and uh, Jerry and I agree with this, Fahrenheit 451 hit. And it talks about a crazy world, right? That we didn't think at the time that I was reading it would ever happen. Where books is a crime and people only watch the TV. Or the, in this case, the internet, right? In this world, the job of the fireman is not to disting, extinguish fires, but to start them. We heard that in our latest panel. Using books only as kindling. And when they entered one house, they discovered a huge stash of books. And what did they do? They soaked it in what? Kerosene. What the firemen found amazing is that the woman, not them, was the one to strike the match. End quote. You weren't there, you didn't see, the main character later says. There must be something in books, things we can't imagine, to make a woman stay in a burning house. There's something in books. It's knowledge. And knowledge is power. And what we've seen here is our resurgence of power within each other. At this time, I am so pleased to bring you the last segment. Not that it's because it's the last segment, because this is the beginning of many segments. But it talks about erasing memory. And we've talked about erasing stories. So this memory and this discussion is going to be led by the brilliant W. Ralph Eubanks. If you can join us. <laughs> Who will interview another one of my favorite homies. Yes. <laughs> There's two, actually. But Kiese Lehman, yeah. he's in the house. And Ms. Jasmine Ward, who is going to be joining us virtually. So let's start this party right here. I think it's I think it's on. We've, we're live. We're real close to each other. <laughs> I, I like that. I, I, I appreciate that. Well, I don't think I've ever been this close to you talking. We have, we're usually across the room. Mm -hmm. We're gonna see how this works. <laughs> right. It's gonna work out okay. It's gonna be great. Oh. oh.
I'm so glad to, to be here with two of my favorite writers, Justin Ward and Casey Lehman. Um, I think they really need no introduction, uh, and they're both brilliant writers, and interestingly enough, you've both had banned books. So this is a panel about kind of the erasure of memory, but I want to kind of go back, you to both go into your memories, personal memories for a moment, to tell me how do you remember how you felt when you heard that your book had been banned? You want me to go first, Kazo? Please. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> um, can I just say I just finished Let Us Descend? I just started it last night. <laughs> um, so yeah. Uh, I mean, my first thought was, I mean, if we're going to get it in today, we're going to get it in. Like, my first thought was I beat Millsaps when I found out my book was banned, because my book was banned with Toni Morrison. Mm -hmm. But that's what I felt. I was like, oh, I definitely won. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Good. Good. And how about you, Jessman? So is there, how did you, how do you remember that moment when you heard that? Um, I mean, I, I, I definitely felt like I was in good company, but I do remember just feeling that first, like, a, like that first sort of electric feeling of shock. Um, I don't know. I, I, I had already, I had always known that books were banned, right? And remember, you know, sort of like searching out banned books when I was younger, when I was in school, but I don't know. I, I guess I, that it, that the problem of banned books before my book was banned is as terrible to say, but I, I guess I, I felt sort of removed from it um, because it was something that I, you know, that I knew about from my childhood and my, and my adolescence, but none of my work had, I don't know, had been banned. And it seemed like, like classics were all, were always banned. Um, so yeah, so I guess I felt removed from it and, and then it happened to me and then um, suddenly it was a very sort of present and real, um, and real problem. And I think, especially in the last couple of years where the, unfortunately that push to sort of, to ban books and, you know, to, silence voices like ours, like how that's sort of really ramped up in the past couple of years. I think that that especially has has made the issue um, and the reality of it just feel very present. Um, yeah, so. Theme is erasing memory. And what very often I'm, I'm asking, you know, how do you really define memory? And what I always tell my students about the idea of memory is that it is the ways that we, as a society, recall, lay claim to, understand, and represent the past. And by untying our link to the past, by banning books that depict that past accurately, we are also reshaping our present. And why do each of you think in this moment that there's so many people who feel this need to reshape the past and to erase memory? Is it just to reshape the present? Or is it, as someone said earlier, is it also to reshape the future? I mean, I think both. <laughs> That's a great question. I, I, I mean, I, I think, I mean, I know that both, right? I, I don't think you can, um, I don't think, for example, you can, if, if we ground this in a human being, if we ground this in a child who's like 12, I think if you tell that 12 year old child that you don't want them to read Toni Morrison, think about what you're doing to that child's conception of their own memory and past, because she is the best chronicler of memory, um, I think other than Jasmine, that's ever walked the earth. So 
where I'm at with my book banning experience is that like you asked me what my first thought was. My first thought was that I won and then I started to feel a bit of shame. But, but, I, but I was under no illusion that it was about the book. I don't think the people that banned my book, that banned Jasmine's book, that banned any Morrison's book ever read the book. And so like, I think when you go deeper, it, 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 it's really like, uh, like drenched and like this almost hatred, not just for us as black folk, as indigenous folk, as disabled folk, as queer folk, but like white Christian nationalists have a deep disdain for their own children. And I just feel like that's fine, but don't use my book to bash your own kids and definitely don't use Morrison or Jasmine. And I just think that's what people are doing. Jasmine? I definitely think it's both, you know, like it's a case for, for both, right? That they're trying to, you know, reshape the present and also reshape the future. And I think that part of it is fueled by, although I don't think that they will ever say this, but I think that part of, part of it is fueled by shame, right? Because, um, you know, one, th one thing that our books do is our books sort of, you know, reckon with, uh, you know, brutal sort of ugly aspects of our, of our past and our present. And, and, and I think that, you know, that they, that those are truths that they don't necessarily want to face and they don't necessarily want to reckon with. And so, um, you know, and so I think that they want to sort of, that they in part like ban books so that they're, so that they're able to sort of align uh, so that they don't have to feel that shame. And then so they kind of like align, you know, their ideas about what this country is and, and who they are and what they're capable of and what, <laughs> you know, like what their forefathers were capable of. Like they, they want to align that you know, with this sort of vision that they have in their head, um, and and they want to usher that into the into the future. So, I I definitely think it, that it's that it's both. That also kind of the panel before us was on kind of erasing history. Yeah. And I always say that history and memory inform each other and really are what lead us toward truth. Mm -hmm. um, my historian friends would always say, no, it's really history, but I'd say, well, you know, history and memory really kind of lead us to those two things. And truth really comes about in our society, I think by virtue of mutual forms of constraint and balance. So why in this particular moment is, do you think our society is so invested in what I would call negative constraint? Why are we, I think that, that idea of constraint is important, but it is this negative constraint. And what is the source of all of that negative constraint that is leading to this erasure of both history and memory, which is also going to keep us from engaging with truth? Yeah, Jasmine, you wanna go first? <laughs> That's <laughs> a difficult answer. Uh, yeah, I don't, do you have a... Oh, okay, uh, yeah. Ready? Yeah, <laughs> I have some ready. Um, I, I, I think that's a really hard question. Um, yeah, I think it's a really hard question. I don't want to get too heady and shit in here, but, 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 I, but I do think it has, I think constraint often has to be talked about with consent. And I think that when you're dealing with often a white nationalist political body, Christian political body, who has never granted, among other people, black folks, like consent, 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 not just respect, but consent. You could do anything to our bodies historically. My grandmother could have anything done to her body historically by a white man. She didn't, you know, she, 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 didn't, she could not consent. So, so I think that these constrictions that you're talking about are just part and parcel of a history that too many of us know well, but, but the thing that, that, that I think makes me terrified more than anything in the world um, is that I'm making a lot of money off of that constraint. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like I'm one of those people who made a lot of money after their book got banned. And so 
I think if we're really gonna talk about the messiness of like constraint and consent, we also have to talk about titillation. And I think titillation is one of the reasons that I've made so much money off of my books and the fact that I know I can write my ass off. But a lot of motherfuckers can write their ass off. A lot of people can write their ass off. A lot of people can write their ass off. But so, so, so what I'm saying is I, I think that in a nation that like, like, you know, sort of doesn't really understand like the relationship between constraint and consent, I think what happens is sometimes these art objects become electric. And so I know I sold a ton of books because my book was banned in Missouri and other states, you know, under the guise of like constraint and constriction. But what, 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 what sort of irritates me, but not irritates my family's ability to pay for shit is like, oh, I actually like monetized that. And I think that's something to really talk about. Like I monetized the banned book shit. Like I sell more, I sell, I sell more books because my, my book was banned. And I, and, I, and I think what's important is that there are a lot of people whose books are banned for whom that is not true. Do you know what I'm saying? So, so I, I just think like the consent and the constraints that are tied, but also what I think when they collide, sometimes some art objects become electric. And I think some art objects, which is the sad part, become completely like erased. But I don't want to sit up here and talk like my shit got erased. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, like, yeah I, I, just th I just think like that's important to say. Yeah. Jasmine, I mean, I, I know this is a really, I mean, this idea of constraint is a really tough idea. It's one that I really wrestle with. And I have to say, it's the thing that angers me right. the most. Because people always say, well, Ralph, you're not really angry. It's like, I'm angry every day. Uh, and it's just how I kind of deal with that anger. But that, I, that idea of, con I don't let it consume me. But how does, Jasmine, how do you feel about that idea of negative constraint? What is it that, you know, thinking about that a little bit, and why, why is it so, so why, is it, why is it powerful and why is it so powerful now? I think, I mean, I think that, I don't particularly know why it's, why it is so powerful now. Um, I think that, at least in, in my own experience, that I have, I think that since I began writing that I've been aware of it and that my work in some respects, my early work was like motivated by my desire to push back against that negative constraint, right? Because I think that I just had consistently, you know, like when I was growing up, just felt silenced all the time because of who I was and because of where I came from. And so, I think, you know, like this is, the, the book banning seems to be, um, you know, a sort of po political version of what I experienced all the time, you know, when I was growing up, I, I, I feel like. So um, again, like, I don't know, I don't exactly know why it is so powerful now, but I, um, you know, but I've, I feel like, my only response to or one of my responses to it can be to continue to do the work right and i feel like that 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 motivates you know kiese too and all you know the other sort of great right black american writers who are who are working now right like we're constantly sort of pushing back against it um and continuing to you know to do the work and um you know and and I don't know, like attempting to sort of not escape it, but I don't know, sort of creatively mm, push past it, right? Or, you know, amplify, um, I don't know, like amp amplify our voices so that, so that we, so that we can sort of burst out of it, I think, if that makes any sense. And I think it's one of the reasons why I've chosen to do what I do is because when I was in high school in Mount Olive, Mississippi, I had a copy of Herman Hesse's Steppenwolf and the cover looked very provocative. And a teacher said to me, I don't think you should be reading that. I might have to take that from you. Mm. And I was reading that at school and then I stopped reading it at school. Wow because because of that and i i've always felt that constraint and i've always pushed against that because mm -hmm. it just it brings out something very visceral right 
in me. So when you know Jerry called me about this, is like I'm in. Yeah. Because I remember having people wanting to constrain what I what right. I read, but I also remember that before integration, I didn't because I went to the library and I asked the librarian for a copy of Portnoy's complaint. Yeah. And she gave it to me. She said, does your mom know you're reading it? I said, yeah. And it's like, it was like, oh, this is a whole nother world. Right. But I think is that, that idea, that constraint, I believe, is for, so that you don't open up into these other worlds. So right. that you're trying to keep your ideas confined to a very narrow point of view. Absolutely. And can I just say one? I think I think that the 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 thing about the con constraint that I think from a from a, a writerly point of view that um, it, it's paradoxical is that uh, as Jasmine said, sometimes like the constraint, particularly when you're from Mississippi, is is so so generationally layered that you can make the mistake of writing to the constrainer. Like yeah, I, I, my, like we are talk. My last book that I that I'm working on right now, the first draft was so fucked up because I was writing that shit to tape. I was writing it. I literally was writing it to tape. Literally, like like one of my classmates here before I got kicked out of school. I wrote. I was writing a book to tape, and and then and then and then one of my one of my people who loved me had to be like kindly like can't say. No. <laughs> you know? No. Like you know, and, 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 and no because I literally wrote about writing the tape in my previous book. You know what I'm saying? I, I've written about the perils of writing to the worst of white folk over and over again, but I think when the constraints seem to get higher and higher, you often want to come back and try to convince that person who is unconvincible, as opposed to writing about something as lush and politically active as your grandmama's garden, which is also connected to Tate, but Tate ain't really up in that shit, if you really, really think about it, though the vestiges of Tate are all up in there. So I just, I think the constraint shit can, can really get us and it can gaslight us. It can gaslight us, and it is lucrative to write to Tate. I guarantee you, if I wrote a letter to Tate, Please, like, <laughs> like they gonna buy that shit. They, they gonna buy it. But 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 the, but but to, the question to me is like, what am I not writing to and through and about, and what am I not wondering about? Which is what they don't want black folk to do. We not supposed to wander. We not supposed to fucking experiment. I got kicked out of this school for experimentation, bruh. Not with drugs, alcohol, and none of that shit, but words. So I just think the constraint can 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 fuck up the imagination if you let it. And I think some of us at different times let it. Yeah, and, that, and I think that's, in this environment, that's the trick, is not to allow that to happen. That's right. Now, I mean, we all know it's no accident that most of the books that have been banned have been by black writers. I think most famously, as we talked about, Toni Morrison, beloved, The Bluest Eye. What do you see as the connection between the forces of anti-blackness and that erasure of memory. And what aspects of black cultural memory do you think that these banners are truly seeking to erase? Or do they not know what they're trying to erase? Mm -hmm. They're just trying to erase everything. I mean, I think, you know, maybe they are just trying to erase everything. I don't, I don't, I don't give them that much credit. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't really believe that they know exactly what they want to erase. I just think that, you know, that, 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 that there's that sort of, that they're having this like, you know, terrible, like knee jerk reaction to, um, to so much art that is like truly authentic to our experience. Right. And that lives outside the boundaries of, of what they think about our experience, right? Um, I yeah, so I don't. I mean, I don't really think. I don't really think that they. Yeah, I don't really think that they that they know. I mean, the, like when I think about the bluest eye, when I think about beloved, right? I mean, these masterful, you know, sort of classics <laughs> that that Morrison wrote, and the fact that they've been banned. Um, you know, like I think I think about like the quality of the work, and one of the things that that work is really doing for me is that it's, I mean, just thinking about the bluest eye and how that book makes us like crowds us into this, 
you know, I can't remember the main, main character's name right now, but it like crowds us into her experience and really makes us sit with her and feel it. And, and, you know, and it's not, and, and that experience is not, is not one dimensional. It's not two dimensional. It's like it's multidimensional and it's rich. Um, and it's, you know, it's heartbreaking and it's beautiful and it's sad and it's like all of the above. Um, and, and that's, and that happens throughout Morrison's work. And I think there's something about like the fullness and the richness of that experience, you know, in, in, in her work that they, they, they can't sit with it. They don't want to sit with it. Right. They don't want to engage in it, in its fullness and it's, and it, and it's, and, 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 and its complication. Um, so I, I, that but that's just that's just what i see when i when i look at their response specifically to to her work to that work i, I, you, you agree? I just agree with that yeah okay. <laughs> all right all right I just agree. Yeah. yeah i mean so i teach a class on southern rights and activism at the center for the study of southern culture and the first day of class what i tell my students that this is a class about power and power structures mm. and how um, and I make sure that everybody knows everybody has power but it's that some people exert that power in ways that are are negative and that that power is not a bad thing mm -hmm. but I believe questions of power and knowledge are really essential an essential element of book banning and of this erasure of cultural memory. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is really a very classic power knowledge dichotomy that's going on here. So if memory is really being suppressed or erased through this use of power in our society, this, what I would say is a negative use mm -hmm. of power, uh, how can we use that power to restore that memory or to keep that memory from being erased what is i mean i know that mm. we've had some discussion about that today that people going to school board meetings and standing up for these books but i guess maybe what is it that you think that writers at this moment should be doing to use that power the power that they have that is going to keep that memory from being erased. I mean, it's that we all have to do to do the work. Right. And it's that as I always tell people that it's, you know, it's not about the awards, it's not about the royalties, it's about the work. Right. It's like how how do we really kind of get to that point where we're we're using our power in a way that's that's pushing against these negative forces of power. I mean, I think, I think two things. I think we have to acknowledge that, um, specific, specifically if you're talking about black folk in Mississippi, I think we have to acknowledge that there's no door that we walk through alone. There's no white space that we walk through alone. I think we bring our people the best and the worst of our people with us. And I think as writers, especially writers who, who you know, have a little heft, we have to actively bring people with us through those doors. But the thing about the constraints and what you and Jasmine are talking about is like we haven't talked really much about like the trauma that it can create and like and the grief that it can create. So sometimes you know when you get into these spaces and publishing is one of those spaces, sometimes you're so shell shocked you do not do the work to actually reckon with how you got there. So you don't advocate, you know, you become a gatekeeper instead of like a wonderful like come with me type person or let me or let me follow. And I think the second thing we can do as writers, and I'm just realizing this in the last 10 years, is that there are incredible people on the ground wherever we are doing phenomenal work. I think the first thing we have to do as writers is has we same thing we have to do when we you know approach a character on a page. How can I be of service to you? And I think asking that question as a writer, particularly as a writer with some heft, is going to take you away from your quote unquote literary work. But I think it can fortify like that spiritual soulful work um, that really got us here. Do you see what I'm saying? So I just think on one hand, you have, to, you have to bring folk with you literally, and you also have to be willing to be led, but you can't be led unless you ask people on the ground what they need, what you need, what, what do they need from you? Like, how can I be of help? And I just think, I mean, there are lots of ways, but I think those are two ways that just come to mind. Right, I mean, your thoughts about that, Jessamyn, I mean, I think it's something that Angie talked about earlier that she wants to do that work, but she says, I also have to set boundaries right. Right. for how I, I do that. 
how I do that so that I'm not taking away from actually creating. Yeah. And I mean, I, well, think, I think I mean, the ways to use that power where you can, you're not really soaking up everything out of yourself. Right. right. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's important, um, you know, to, <laughs> it's important to sort of like assess your energy, right? And to maintain that balance because you have to continue to do the work even at the same time, you know, that you are, you have to keep doing the literary work, right? At the same time that you are, you know, advocating, that you are, you know, bringing others with you, that you are sort of like fighting the good fight. And I just wanted to say really quickly that, um, you know, Kese is really good at, at that, right? Like that's one of the things that he's really good at. And um, he's really good at bringing people with him. He's really good at sort of like advocating for others, right? Um, and for opening doors, right? Um, and, 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 and I feel like that that's something in my own, I guess, writerly life that I struggle with. Um, uh, just because it's, it's difficult for me to juggle the work and then also like the real world like demands um, around the work. Um, I have been successful at, at, at juggling it and at sort of being an advocate in real life a couple times. One time, um, you know, a, a school board was attempting to, or they were, you know, fielding demands from parents and they were, um, you know, d deciding whether or not to ban one of my books in the classroom, right? And the teacher sort of got in contact with my publishers. And so then I um, made a video where I was basically sort of talking about the book that they were attempting to ban and um, and trying to sort of, um, trying to talk about it in a way that um, that emphasized the fact that one of the things that I was trying to do in telling the story that I told was I was trying to, to get people to empathize with this person that I was writing about, right? Um, and to feel with this, feel with this person, right? Um, and that that is what good art does, regardless of who's at the heart, the character, who's at the heart of it, right? And what they look like and where they come from. Um, and so I think that that, I think that, you know, that that, I think that sometimes, you know, that, that that's what we have, that's, it can be useful to do that, right? Um, you know, it can be useful to, I don't know, like when you're sort of pushing back against, you know, this banning to come back to one of like the central purposes of fiction, right? Which is to, elicit empathy right and to um you know through the <laughs> you know through th through the work through the storytelling um and so i think that you know that that's something useful um that we can do as well can i sort of say one thing yes back to judgment i mean I, you know i believe everything you say <laughs> um but i also just want to say that there are a lot of ways that one can advocate. And, and like, I'm, I'm literally talking to you in, at Millsaps because of Jasmine, um, because of the work, which we all know feels sometimes like not of this earth, but also literally because Jasmine reps Mississippi. And a lot of Mississippi writers who make it do not rep Mississippi. And Jasmine's rep in Mississippi made it so when Jasmine went to Agate, okay, then I could go to Agate. I like Jasmine's work at um, Bloomsbury. So like, then I'm gonna go follow Jasmine to Bloomsbury. Oh, Jasmine, you finna go to Scribner? Shit, I'm finna go to Scribner too. <laughs> you know, Harvard might want you to do something you don't wanna do, KSA. Okay, so I'm saying like, <laughs> you've made a way for so many of us, but you also like selfishly made a way f with me, for me. And it's also because of your commitment to the page but also your relentless commitment to calling yourself a Mississippi writer and writing through Mississippi contours. Like that is activism to me as a writer. And I just wanna say, I just don't think writers need to not, I don't think we need to diminish that. Like I'm here in this room because of Jasmine Ward, in addition to my mom and my grandma and all of them, you know? Yeah. yeah. Well, I have one more question that I want us to kind of go to Q and A with the audience. When, in my house, the, the rule was, you can't watch anything, but you could read anything. 
anything that was on the shelf. You know, we had you know, a huge library at my house, as you can imagine. Uh, and yet, I understand, you know, today there's so, many, there's so much discussion about what we're doing with banning is we are protecting children. Mm. And I guess, I mean, I, my question about that is, is this, is this guys really protecting children just a misguided way of returning to like a 1950s leave it to beaver kind of past, which never really existed? Right. Uh, or is it something that's more malicious? I mean, I have to say, you know, I have to weigh in here. I think it's much more malicious than that. I think this is really, um, it's a smokescreen for saying that we're protecting children because I know that, you know, my kids picked all kinds of books off the shelf and if they didn't quite follow it, they put it away. Right. Um, but I also know that I started reading the Reavers when I was, I was 12. And I didn't know what a prostitute was when I started that book, but I sure did when I finished it. Right. And that wasn't such a bad thing. Right, that's right, <laughs> so, that's right. So what, is there something really more malicious or is it just, or do people actually believe that this, is, that this type of censorship is protecting people? I mean, I kind of don't even think it matters if they believe it or not. I think what yeah. matters is that it's malicious. That it's malicious. Yeah, yeah. I mean, fam, like, if, if, if in the height of COVID, you want your children to go to school without mask, it really ain't about books. It's about using your children to win some game. But that game doesn't have, like, the fortification and, like, integrity of your ch child at the heart. You can't want your child not to breathe fresh air and then say you give a fuck about your child's what books they read. You know what I'm saying? The same people who don't want people to read Jasmine's book don't want them to have clean air. Or clean water. Or clean, like, or, what they actually do want, they, I think they do want the clean water. They don't want us to have the clean water. Us, but, but the air, but the air, right they okay with the air. <laughs> they okay with the air. So, so I mean, I, I mean, that's the thing about these conversations, man. I come in here and I, I want to get deep and I can get deep, but the shit is so surface. It is so it is, it is so surface, and, 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 I, and I, think, I think we've all gotten to places where we will sacrifice parts of ourselves that we value to win a war that is not actually winnable. And I don't think these people can win this war, because I actually do believe in, in spirit. I'm not trying to get all religious and shit, but I don't think you can win a war when you're willing to sacrifice yourself and your children to win it. And that's what they are doing. That's what this banned book shit is about. That's what the mass shit was about. That's what the air, that's what the water is about. But again, don't leave us out of it as black folk. Leave black poor people out of it if you want to. But when you will sacrifice your own child to punish poor black people who can't fucking drink shit but lead, I want to talk about why you hate your child so much. I want to I wanna most have to put on some shit about why white folks hate their children so much. We ain't going to do that. So we're going to talk around it at a band book festival, which I'm appreciative <laughs> of. But I just think like it is malicious and whether they believe it or not, fuck it. Like it's malicious, it's evil. And if we don't organize and fight back, we get caught up in the shit and we do get caught up in it. But I don't think we need to be like, do they believe it? Do they not? Like it's evil and, and they feed off of our suffering, but they also feed off of their children's suffering. And I just think that is like the world is like catastrophically in trouble because of that. Jasmine? I agree, I agree with all of that. Um, you know, I also, I agree with KSA. I definitely think it's malicious. Um, and, I, and I think, and, and I, it, it makes me think about the fact that, like, not only are, you know, books by people of color overwhelmingly being banned, right? Black, black American writers, right, being banned, but also books by LGBTQ plus, you know, writers also, right, being banned. And, and it just, <laughs> it, it makes me think about how, like, how cruel that is, especially to to again, like as Kiese was saying, like to their children, right? <laughs> because they definitely have LGBTQ plus children, right? Who um, 
who are experiencing that as well, right? Who like the underlying message, you know, in the banning of that kind of artwork too is is that, you know, you don't des like you don't deserve to exist. You don't deserve to have a voice. You should not even like you should not exist. I mean, and that's 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 like that's insanely cruel. It's evil. It's evil. <laughs> it's evil. Yeah. Well, I want to open it up to audience questions. So at the very back there, just so. Yes, if you could just go ahead and write that letter to Tate, I'll buy the <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, I want to make sure I'm looking around the room. So yes, right here in the back. Oh. I, don't, I, see, I wanted to touch on a few things y'all brought up a lot. Um, so I, I am, a, I think I'm a product of, I, so I am from Mississippi, grew up, born in Jackson, raised in Meridian, um, went to my, my high school, 60% black, had a great black history teacher. He was very constrained, I look back on it now, he was very constrained, of course. So we didn't, like, my black peers knew way more about our history than I did, right? And. Um, and it wasn't until I left Mississippi and started reading books like, you know, James Baldwin, Toni Morrison, and then later y'all's work that I, like, I don't know, like, it filled my soul in a way. And I think it's, it's about memory, it's about empathy, it's about erasure, but it's like, it's also just about, like, what you're saying about not caring about white kids, right? It's like, being able to be fully human with the people that they live and for generations have lived with, right? And understanding their own family history and where we are now. Like, we can't talk about any of that stuff. And and so, and then later with like, and this is all stuff I had to learn on my own, you know, and I'm, and I'm still coming out of Mississippi public schools and going out in the world and everybody's got ideas about Mississippi, so you're dealing with all that. But, and then later with like Isabel Wilkerson's work where you can place it in a context and we have all this great scholarship, with black and indigenous scholarship is coming out and we can place our histories and understand. And it's just, it's, it's tragic because we actually can be much more fully human with this. And I, so, so I guess what I, what I want to say is <laughs> your, your, um, you know, your friend that was like, you know, don't write states because Tate doesn't care. Like he, he doesn't have like Justin, I think you're right, it's about like shame. Like people don't want their kids to be they, my my parents and grandparents didn't want me to know this stuff, so I don't feel shame about them and I am somehow against them. Yeah, but that's not how it is. It's like I've been able to have conversations with my family for decades now. They've come along. They're they're not all great, they're not perfect, but they've come along. And there's not a division there. There are people that are growing, yeah. Um, so, but I think that the, what people like Tater do is they're weaponizing that shame and the fear of what could happen in dividing and the division of families, right? And the same thing for people, also as a queer person, you know, it's like that they don't want their children to be out because then it's a whole division in the family, you know, and I just. So it, you're right, like you're right about the not not them not caring, but I don't think that it's some barrier we have to get past of the shame and like how do we talk about it? Like how you know, I always think about how can I share and maybe I just need to start being a writer, um, but share that process of like it's it's a, it's a soul healing thing because it is a spiritual thing. We have, we have been in this together for like I've done my genealogy hundreds of years. And we've been segregated, we've been in apartheid. We have, we, you know, and like people in power have been manipulating my ancestors and the narrative forever. And it's not, you know, anyway. <laughs> I just think, I think the shame bit, but I but also think that the, 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 the evil bit, like I think, you know, like I have friends that went to, that went to Millsaps with, with Tate. Like they saw him get groomed by Trump. They saw him get groomed by Trump. They saw him Somebody in their generation has to deal with the truth. And the people that are weaponizing that shame to, you know, I think that there's a difference. 
I guess is how do, how do we kind of break that cycle of, of shame that, that keeps us from really actively engaging. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the very back here. <laughs> An academy to register her black child. She received a letter to come to the you know, can go to go to come to the academy. So I'm sure she probably took her child as well. But when she got there, you mentioned religion as well. When she got there, there was a group in the gymnasium, and the principal had bullhorn, and he yelled to her, "You stole our inheritance." So. I was in a meeting with the pastor that truly bothered me. What, what did she mean? And what did he mean? You stole our inheritance. So I asked this minister, he may have been Baptist, but I'm Methodist. He said, during that period of time of slavery and after slavery, the second Baptist faith was, the congregation was taught that God gave black people to them to take care of them. So then I understand clearly why things are the way they are. It's been great, and Grandpa may be on his dying bed, but he's still teaching the same thing. They stole our inheritance by helping win the Civil War. So we got to get them. You know, we can't let them go free. They're ours. I mean that's just wild. That's that's yeah. That's <laughs> it's wild because it's true. I don't mean that's. I, I don't, I don't, yeah. yeah, yeah, no, but it's that's a that's a tough one there. Other questions from the audience? What up? Wait, oh, it's yeah, just making sure I look around. So I guess really, um, I want to go. I see three people right there. Kind of like I'm going to start with you, Chiola. Yes. And then I'll go to Dennis. I guess you mentioned trauma earlier. I love looking at the way trauma interacts with memory. And I feel as the work that you all are doing, you guys are reliving trauma. I feel like with every talk you all do, it's traumatic. Being black in America is traumatic. And I want to know how do you all deal with that as like I'm, I'm stepping into the historian field and I feel like the work I look at is traumatic every day. So I just want to know like how do you all deal with this trauma? I mean, I, I don't have a lot of good cope. I don't have, <laughs> about to be honest, too honest up in here. Um, I don't have too many good coping skills other than making art. Um, but making art is, is, is a really great coping skill for me. It, it is not, sometimes people put therapy against art making, which is weird to me. I mean, I think art making has helped me be less abusive of the power I do have. I also think art making has helped me um, wander through memory. And also I think when you, like I got kicked out of this school, I, I was trying to talk to somebody like 94 I think, maybe 95, and I kept trying to write about that shit like the day after I got kicked out. And I didn't put anything out in the world about getting kicked out of this school until 2012. Not because, well because nothing I wrote, nothing I wrote was honest. And, and because at that point in my life, I couldn't touch the honesty. And that honesty was shrouded in a different kind of shame, the shame of like that I felt, that my grandmama felt, that my mama felt when I got kicked out of the school, supposedly for stealing a book. So I kept trying to write during that whole time, but I think if I would've gone to therapy, somebody would've been like, yes, hey, take a step back from that and turn to something else. I, that's what I'm saying, like I think I took years off of my life trying to write about this particular trauma. Um, and when I finally put it out, I think I did it okay, but I, I think I should have not been focusing every single time I wrote on my experience at Millsaps, which was, you know, catastrophic in a lot of ways, but also foundational. Do you see what I'm saying? So for me, it's just art making. I would love to hear what Jasmine has to say about that, though. I mean, I think that, um, that you know, especially like when I think, think about like what the process of writing m m my memoir specifically was like that I needed distance from it in the same way that you're saying that you needed distance from you know from 
from that event, right, from being kicked out of Millsaps, that you need a, a certain amount of time, a certain amount of distance from it in order to be able to sort of look at it squarely and, and uh, you know, and, and, and in a clear-eyed manner, right? Um, and, you know, and sort of like write about that traumatic event in a fruitful way, I guess, and not avert your gaze from it. Um, and so the same was true for me um, when I was working on my memoir. Like, I, the, the process of of sort of circling that circling, you know, like my grief about my brother and my cousin and my friends, right, for like ten years before I actually like sat down and started writing it. I think that, um, you know, that I needed to sort of, I needed to circle. I needed to just think about everything that had happened and then just let some time pass so that I could get some distance from it so that I could then, I could get enough distance so that when I decided to actually write towards that trauma and write towards that pain, I could do it in a way, you know, I could be clear eyed about it. I could, um, I could sort of look at, you know, my motivations and the motivations of the people around me and and look at the, you know, like the effects that that trauma had on us in an honest way. Whereas I think that if I had attempted to do that earlier, I don't think that I would have been able to, I, w I wouldn't have been able to write about it in the same um, way. But I, de but I agree with you, Kiese. I, I definitely think that art making is a way for me to, um, for me to sort of process trauma, you know, look at it squarely, um, you know, not self-medicate in like destructive <laughs> ways because I have done that in the in the past. Um, and then I also like to, you know, answer, to further answer the question, like I do, I go to therapy, that's really helpful. I journal, that's helpful. Um, sometimes I cope in not destructive ways, but, you know, sometimes you just, sometimes, you know, like I read easy, you know, fluffy books, right? Like sometimes I just need to turn my brain off and like read some sci-fi or read, you know, read something where I don't have to work, where it's just a fun experience um, in order to, you know, so that, <laughs> so that I can so that I can turn my brain off, I can turn my feeling off, I can live in someone else's experience. And then when I need to, I can return to the work and I can in, I can engage um, again. I think there were two more questions right there. Yes. Um, so I fit a lot of those categories that you guys were talking about, about like people's book being banned, but I'm also a writer at Millsaps College now. And I was wondering, how do you both like use your writing to tell your stories, but also keep that authentic? How do we use it to keep to tell our story, but keep it authentic? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Uh, what year are you? Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, I love that question. Um, I love that you're writing here at Millsaps too. I, I think revision for me is the only way that I can keep my work, you know, I, I don't know if you want to use the word authentic or fresh or innovative, but like, you know, yeah, I, I always talk about how like I grew up in Jackson with a lot of people who wanted to rap and a lot of them became rappers, but like some of the most thoughtful rappers in the world and when it was time to freestyle, just coming off the dome, like their shit would be so like misogynist, so anti-human, so anti-everything. Like the worst shit in the world would come out of their mouth because that was the first thing that they thought people wanted to hear. I don't think that's very different from like our first drafts as writers. You know what I'm saying? I, I, actually, I think it, it, it is like the same thing. I think we, we, we sometimes write the things we think people want to read. I think we, we create cliches and I think we pat ourselves on the back for getting anything down on the page because that shit is hard. I think you go back and you revise and you layer. That's one thing I learned from Jasmine. It's like you have to layer and layer and layer. And I think once you layer to a point where you see something or feel or hear something you've never heard, felt or seen before, I, I don't know, there's something very incredible electric about that. And I think that is as close to quote unquote authentic as we can get, but I don't know, for me personally, I can't get there without the layering, which is the revisitation of the piece, like going back and layering and going back and layering. Yeah. Jasmine? Um, I 
I definitely agree with Kiese. Um, you know, like I've once I learned like <laughs> what revision was um, and began to try to like apply it in my own work, I quickly began to understand like how essential it was to, um, you know, to <laughs> to good story to good storytelling, right? And to expressing, um, you know, like whatever it is you're trying to express authentically and in a in a sort of in a in a fresh and I guess real um, way. Uh, I don't know, and I think too, like part part of a really important part of or component of revision for me is always um, showing my work to people that I trust and people who I know will hold me accountable. Um, and will, you know, who, people who hold me accountable. And I think that leads to authenticity too, right? Because if you're, um, you know, if you're averting your gaze, if you're, um, you know, not being honest on the page, like, you, you know, a good, um, you know, a good editor, right? Can, a good editor will call you on that, right? Um, and so, yeah, so I think that that, that that le can that that leads to authenticity too, you know, just like finding the people that you trust, who you know are going to hold you accountable um, in your work. That's that's very important. Well, I get if there are no further questions, I really like to. Is there one more question? Yes. Um, Two. Yes. Yes. You. Uh, yes. So when we were talking earlier about her, the that shame is this motivating factor right behind the band and all the stuff. I'm wondering sort of what you guys feel if that's, is that like really about shame or is that like a deflection of power, right? Is that like a way to defend power rather than just like, oh, I have these terrible feelings and I'm embarrassed. But right when we start doing that, right, then we're feeling about like, oh, you're embarrassed, like you got to take care of you, whatever, and we're not really looking at the power that those folks hold. Shame is a vector of power. That's what I think it really is. Well, you need to break that down for us right quick. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, that sounds incredible. <laughs> it's, it's really using that shame as a wedge. It's actually, it's why we are all here today, is because they're using that shame as a wedge, also in some ways, I think, to, to divide us. Right. I mean, I think that you know, people would say, well, we're gonna ban Kiese's book. There'd be, there would also be people who'd say, well, maybe it should be banned because politics of black respectability sometimes mm -hmm. come into play in all this. So it's, it's almost as if that shame is being used as a means of, of, of power. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's creating this, this opening of, of power. Mm -hmm. So this, this force can get through. And it's, shame is very powerful. I mean, it's, as someone who spent some time on the couch myself, I know how powerful shame is. Right. And that's something that we, we all have to confront. And I think that's, we don't deal with shame very well in our, in our society. It's kind of part of our, I think our whole puritanical origins as a nation. Right. And I think using that shame as a vector of power is one way to do that. And we don't deal with it, and I think extension of not dealing with it is we do, do not demand an exploration of it from our leaders, which I think is the worst part of it all. Like, we, you know, imagine a, a mayoral candidate, a city council candidate, a, a governor, a president sitting and talking about shame unprovoked, yeah. talking of, or, and or imagine one of those people talking about just saying these words. I apologize not for what you feel, but for what I did. We don't even demand that. And I think that's so tied into our, our personal relationships with shame. But I also just think, because as we were writers and rhetoricians, I think we have to talk about like what kind of like word assemblages we demand and what we, we don't demand from the so-called leaders. I can't remember the last time I heard a leader talk honestly about anything, much less about shame at the abuse of power that they elected to do. So that's sort of on us. But I wish that we could do something to make at least at least that speech act with 
them which, which become commoditized. I don't give a fuck, but can we just get there? I would love to hear some of our presidential candidates or, or political candidates talk about their honest relationships to shame, failure, um, and betrayal. Mm. Never hear that. And that says everything I think about where we are as people in this country. Yeah. Well, I think it's, it's a oh, was, was there, was, oh, there's one more question? So, yes. Yeah. Um, so I've been at LSAT since 2017, and you know, I've read all of your books, and it's, it's, there are a lot of feelings seeing you speak here, knowing what you went through here, and the experiences that you had, in particular with the Millsaps College president. And I don't know if you know, but uh, we need a new president here. Every day. I know you're talking to me. For you the job, but I am, I am curious, given your you know, history with this place, what this place could become, like what kind of quality should a person have to, to make this place a better place, to be the new president of Bill <laughs> <laughs> Love, love myself now too much to even try to answer that question. But I really do appreciate you asking that. But, and I actually do, I'm not lying when I say Ralph, like, I think Ralph would be an incredible president of any institution. <laughs> like, but this one especially. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, thank you all for, for coming today. And no, I am not going to be the president of Nelson. <laughs> I have a book to write. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jasmine. Oh, thank you. We just want to thank everybody for uh, first all our panelists, uh, Casey and Jasmine and, and Ralph and all the others before you. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. And Casey, I think I found your library book, so I just want to let you know. <laughs> I'm I, yeah, I got it. Anyway, I'm just kidding. Um, no, but uh, for those who are panelists, we'll let you know we have T-shirts for you. And uh, unfortunately, I only have large and extra large left. But anyway, I'm sorry about that. But, um, but also, we're going to make it available for everyone here. We were counting on Lemuria to sell all these shirts, but, but obviously they, they, they left on us. So uh, they're 25 apiece if you've got cash or check or whatever. So you're welcome to that. And we have a bunch of buttons left. Go ahead, Alyssa, hold, hold it up there. There you go. There we go. Rena's got one on. Mississippi Band Book Festival and a couple other related buttons. And want to thank our sponsors again. Um, Millsaps College, Megrin Murley Evers Institute, uh, Mississippi Center for Investigative Reporting, Mississippi ACLU, uh, Mississippi Humanities Council, visitjackson.com, and the Millsaps Truth, Racial Healing, and Transformation Campus Center. Go ahead, your go. <laughs> um, Ms. Jasmine, I don't know if you saw that, but I was blowing you a kiss. This is Rena Evers Everett. And um, really to everyone here, this has been an incredible day, incredible. Not just thought-provoking, exciting, exhilarating, but moving in the point of the conversations that we've had, the time that we didn't really want to finish because there were so many more conversations that have to happen. So all the wonderful things that this man has come out and said, Ms. Jasmine has come out and said, Mr. Eubanks has come out and said, all of our panelists have come out, but all of you who've asked the questions, made the hard statements, they're not hard, they're heartfelt. Their action statements. So the theme that I've gotten from all of this 
is that we can sit, but as Ms. Wright said, are we going to be silent? Are we going to move? Are we going to continue this conversation and continue the movement? And so I say to all of you, erasing anything that's, that's knowledgeable to our life and our generation's life is unacceptable. And so let's accept the action and the call and let's move forward. And I just have to say thank you, Jerry Mitchell. Thanks. You're my best bud. <laughs> You know, there's so many people, yeah, ton of people. that really Maybe have worked Millsaps, one of Millsaps, right? um, with this project. And ACLU, they've done a ton of work. Okay, I think you heard him. <laughs> but I just want, we just want to thank you all for this because this, and Jerry, I'm putting it out, this is the first, but it's not the last. Yeah. All right? I'm getting my marching orders here. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's two things I want to mention to you before you get up, but not totally get out of the mindset. One is we've asked you to fill out the survey on the back of the schedule. Would you please, please just even Take a few minutes, fill it out, and drop it in the box on this side before you leave. It's critical to us understanding what you understand and to make it more important to you the next go round. The other thing I'm going to take a little personal privilege here is this year marks a lot of anniversaries, a lot of 60th anniversaries. One is extremely personal to me, and that is the assassination of my father, Medgar Evers. So we're going to celebrate his life and celebrate my mother's life here in Jackson, Mississippi. Good. All right? June, June 6th through 12th, there's activities. For more information, the website is mmei60.org. And there'll be more information coming out. But we're inviting everybody that's here, that can see us, hear us. We're inviting Ms. Jasmine. You didn't know that, but we are. <laughs> <laughs> We're inviting Kiese. We're inviting you all. Please come join us in celebrating our history and understanding our stories. So our knowledge is not lost, but is full with power. Thank you. If I can, I don't know if the, yeah, it's still on. If I can get all the panelists and all the participants.